Hello and uh, welcome to Woodland Patterns 29th Annual Poetry Marathon and Benefit. Uh, so glad that you're joining us here and out there where you are. Uh, my name is Mike Went. I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern here in Milwaukee where I am now recording. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that we at Woodland Pattern acknowledge that in Milwaukee we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin, Sovereign, Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and who do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, Many thanks to all of our sponsors for your amazing support of Woodland Pattern. Um, each hour has its own unique sponsor um, who you'll meet throughout the weekend. And this is in addition to our presenting sponsor, Wisconsin's Own Library, a unique collection of Wisconsin authors and illustrators owned by the General Federation of Women's Clubs, Wisconsin, with funding provided by the Gwendolyn M. Schultz Charitable Fund. Our premier sponsor, DeWitt LLP, and supporting sponsors, Juno Park Friends, Next Act Theater, and Carl Gartung and Anne Kingsbury, um, of course, without whom Anne and Carl Woodland Pattern would not be. So um, thanks also for that huge thing, um, Anne and Carl. Uh, many thanks to all who have sponsored. Um, your generosity makes everything that we do possible. So thank you so, so much. Um, Thanks as well to our fabulous board. Uh, you all are amazing, um, and and we so appreciate all that you do to make Woodland Pattern what it is, which is a lot. Um, and of course to my colleagues and friends, um, Jenny Gropp and Laura Solomon, for orchestrating this whole party and doing so much to make it happen. Uh, Marla Sandvik and Antonio Vargas Nieto, for working on the back end, seamlessly editing all of your submissions for broadcast, uh, Molly Hassler, Peter Brzezinski, and Alexa Nutili for captioning, 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 um, and that is along with Jenny and Laura and others too, uh, many hands to caption all these videos. Um, and that is in addition to things I'm not mentioning, and also all the while somehow keeping the bookstore open and imagining a 2023 calendar beyond this weekend. So. Um, you all the, are the best, and I absolutely love doing uh, this work with you, so thank you. Um, and with much gratitude and love from all of us at Woodland Pattern, thank you so much um, for tuning in, chatting along with us, and creating this virtual community over the next couple of days. I hope that you enjoy this year's marathon. Take good care, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks. Hello, and thank you for being here for another virtual poetry marathon. I'm Jenny Gropp. And I'm Laura Solomon. We are the executive directors of Woodland Pattern, and it's an honor to share this space with you as we celebrate the work of 261 poets, as well as that of dozens of other artists from Milwaukee and the Midwest and from all over the world over the course of the next two days. We're excited to feature segments once again this year, organized by several wonderful small presses and publications, including several based here in Milwaukee, um, Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, Pity Milk Press, Genre Urban Arts, Moody the Zine, and from further afield, City Lights, Noemi Press, Neon Editions, City Point Press, Black Ocean, Rescue Press, as well as a segment featuring poets from the Pathetic Literature Anthology edited by Eileen Miles, which is amazing, and you should definitely check that book out. Yes, absolutely. And we're also thrilled once again to welcome so many longstanding partners, Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission, Lotus Legal's Untold Stories in Bright on Door County, as well as old friends like Brenda Cardenas and Roberta Harrison, who've curated another fantastic gathering of Latinx poets, another friend of Woodland Pattern, Bob Hansen, who has curated an hour featuring members of the group Veterans for Peace, 
amazing poet and woodland pattern volunteer, Ahi Lee, who you may know from her A Little Moment micro-interview series on Instagram. And finally, the newest member of our staff, Antonio Vargas Nieto, who has been working with us since September as a Poetry Coalition Fellow and has curated a special marathon edition of his palm reading series. This weekend, you'll also see several short films <laughs> that have been featured in various the cinema screenings throughout 2022. Thank you to series curators, um, Janelle Vanderkellen and Taka Suzuki. You are brilliant people. We're so glad to work with you, um, who also have works of their own that will screen this weekend. We'll also be screening the premiere of the latest episode of Milwaukee Kitchen entitled Stir Fried. Many thanks to Paul Druka as well as two extraordinary pieces, one by Portia Cobb and one by Douglas Ewart that were featured in our, most, in our recent um, art retrospective at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And finally, you'll see footage from some of the many memorable performances that happened at Woodland Pattern in 2022 or through us. Yes. Well. And so before we get going, we want to encourage you, if you can, to try to find the stamina to stay with us for the duration of this experience. It is like nothing else. And um, we don't know what's going to happen next year, but we are hoping to at least to partly return to an in-person marathon. So this could be our last virtual production. So please stick with us and experience all of it. Um, what else? Yeah, and if you would like some oh, yeah. company, yeah, there's company. We have our cat here, Tomas, and um, <laughs> but tomorrow and today and today, and today we have actually, watch parties. We have watch parties, Milwaukee people. Today, uh, January twenty eighth, from twelve to six p.m. You can join us at Black Husky Brewing, and tomorrow Sunday there are two watch parties scheduled here. One at Woodland Pattern from four to seven p.m. There's a potluck. Yes. We will have chicken and dumplings. We will have Vegan vegetarian chili. chili. And there will be another watch party at Five Points Art Gallery and Studios from 7 to 10 p.m. Thank you, Fatima. Yes, thank you. And if you are in or near Sheboygan on Sunday, there will also be a marathon screening at Paradigm Coffee and Music from 12 to 3. Check our website for addresses for each of these wonderful locations. And it may be that there are additional watch parties that we're not yet aware of. So if you're organizing a watch party and you want to let people know, please feel free to throw the details in the chat. Um, and yeah. Yes. Um, so like Mike before us, we want to thank everyone on our consistently amazing staff. This marathon would not be taking place without your talent, your dedication, perseverance, and most importantly, your love for Willem Pattern for one another and for this community. Some of you worked while you were sick. Those of you who are not sick this January took and most on, of you were. And a lot of you were. You <laughs> took on extra labor to help one another out. And you worked with such a compassionate, working with such a compassionate, extraordinary group of people is such an honor. Thank you, Mike, for organizing and corresponding with so many poets and curators. And, and Marla, you've been working ceaselessly once again to edit video overlay captions and create this year's production and Alexa, Peter and Molly, thank you for all your captioning work and thank you Antonio too for wearing all the hats for helping curate caption and edit video. You all astonish us with your various talents. We are so grateful for you. Um, and while it's true that our staff did a lot of the heavy lifting, it's important to understand that what you're about to witness represents the contributions of literally hundreds of people, too many to count. So thank you once again to all the poets and artists. Thank you to the curators and to all of our sponsors. To all those who have sponsored a poet. To our board members. To everyone who has been out there helping us raise funds. And to everyone who's making donations today. Without you, there would not only be no marathon, there really would not be a woodland pattern. You're the reason we're here, and we are so, so grateful. Finally, thank you to everyone tuning in and sharing this time with us. Happy, Happy marathon! marathon! Let's get some poems! Good morning. This is the kickoff youth hour for the Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon. 29th year, and if we're mistaken, please excuse us, and the third 
year of a virtual poetry marathon. Thank you for your time and attention. One, two, three. Red, I'm strong. Red, I'm strong. Orange, I'm joyful. Orange, I'm joyful. Yellow, I know I can. Yellow, I know I can. Green, I'm caring. Blue, I tell the truth. Blue, I tell the truth. Indigo, I'm smart. Indigo, I'm smart. Violet, I'm safe and loved. Violet, I'm safe and loved. I am a rainbow. I am a rainbow. My name is Bo. I'm skin clouds. Dark. Gunshots, no accidents, no scares. God is royalty. My name is Forever Klon. God is loyalty and he is royalty. He is the best. He won't leave the rest. He behaves and he will save. He is nice without a price. He is smart. He plays a part. And I play a part too. My name is Jaden. And I'm reading a poem by Bill Wiggins at this moment. At this moment, I want to go home. At this moment, I am bored. At this moment, I want to play basketball. At this moment, I want to go to the gym and ride scooters on the veil with this. I'm with my, hey, my name is Armand. Uh, I'm reading about royalty and it made by Demetria Davis. Okay, the poem, I'm reading a poem about the queen. Okay, the queen 
is black. She speak different and she sit on a red seat. Hello, my name is Forever Klein. Hello, my name is Jaden. And I'm reading a poem. We're reading a poem that is written by Ramaya Wiggins. The title is At This Moment. I'm at school. It is bad. At this moment. I love Wisconsin. At this moment. I love my mom and miss her. Even though I still see her every day. And we're going to be reading about this poem, and it's from Tristan Martin. Omariana. Good day. Blue. Blue slime. Three brothers. Four sisters. Asthma. Eight siblings. Family I love. Skateboard. Oh, skateboard. We're reading a poem written by Love Martin. And the title of it is called Lisp Poem. Mariana. Red Slime. Siblings. 32. Brother. Brothers. Yeah, brothers. Sisters. Good. I'm reading a poem written by Jaden McKnight, who is sitting right next to me. I'm not at CLC. I'm not good at CLC. Not being funny. I'm trying. I'm going to try to be happy. I'm going to try to have fun days at CLC. I will not be mad at CLC. And have a good day. I'm mad. My TT is having a boy. Why are you mad about that? Because I already got a little cousin. It's a boy too. Don't you, don't you live with your mom? Yes. Why are you mad? When come over. <clears throat> Can't you hide in your room under your bed? No. <laughs> Hi, my name is Henry and I'm going to be reading a list of poems. Hair, eyes, apple video, ears, knife. It looks like fruit. It tastes like fruit. It sounds like music. It smells like ice. It feels kind of hard. I have white fur. I live in a bird. I hop. I can hide. I can move fast. Can you guess what am I? A bunny. Hi, my name is Daniel. Today I'm going to be to, reading a list of poems by me. Jump, order, look, nice, layer, and more. Equality, love, pumpkin, elevator, red, top, snakes. It looks like the ocean, tasty, like cats. Probably it sounds like cats too. It smells like trash and, I, and it feels like ashes. Today we're going to be reading a list of poems by, by Asia Solier. So I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Let me do this. List of poems. List of poems. Apples. Shiny guy. Ice cream. Acting. I have big eyes. I live in a tree. I sleep in the dark. I can see at night. I can find things in the dark. Okay, so I my name is Mariah and I'm going to do a list of poem. List poem. Moves a lot. Apple, rain, ice cream, always glowing, have all forgotten. Auntie the penguin. I have a black belt. I live in the I live in the in in the Antarctica. I catch fish in the water. I swim everywhere. I give others fish when they are hungry. And this 
This one is called Soapy Bear. Object. Object poem. It looks like a bear. It tastes like edible chapstick. It sounds like the wind. It smells like soap. It feels like rubber. That's all I'm going to do with this is my picture. Down. So, I am going to do somebody's poems, and it's by Christiana Velez. Chrissy like cat. Chrissy likes hot stuff. Chrissy likes race cars. I like ice cream. Chrissy is smart. Chrissy is talented. Why, why not? This poem is called Snapdragon. It looks like a dragon. It tastes like poison. It sounds like the wind. It sounds like the wind. It smells like a gift. It feels rough. And another one that I am going to read, another poem that I'm going to read is called Mom the Monkey. I am hairy. I live in the wild. I always jump through trees. I am special because I am very cute. I help others by listening to them. And this is her. At my pizza party, everybody has a slice, their own unique slice. Everyone inputs their part of the order, being heard before the order is placed. Everyone delicately crafting their own slice, different flavors, sizes, shapes. Every slice has an identity. Our box is as, as diverse as we let it be. Yet not every box is as giving. One shouldn't be scared of a few different slices. No slice is left cold, nor is any slice fiercely hot. No slice is better than the, any adjoining pieces. This pie remains in unity. It's time to fill out your piece of the order. The, the crust serves as a base to hold your slice together as one. The sauce, cheese, toppings, these are all up to you. Maybe your choice is a family favorite, possibly adding a bit of your personal taste. Maybe you're trying something completely different. Maybe you just want it to reflect you. Come on. Every slice has a struggle, a weakness. Some slices are having a bad day since the oven in which this pizza will bake does not heat as evenly, as givingly. The temperature of mentality sliding the toppings outwards, making the crust unstable, eroding the corners, falling apart, yet still trying their very best to stay together, both internally and throughout the pie. Every slice remains imperfect. No slice is totally pure, yet putting the pieces together shows our strength as a whole. Together, we help every slice stand strong, Missing a slice weakens the very foundation we stand on. Having more slices, more to share, showing the individual, culture one represents. One is beyond the box, hidden internally, beyond the oven that constantly changes with a blink of an eye. Everyone deserves their own curated slice of the pie. Equity leading to justice, and this party does not serve justice until everyone's slice is included. My poem's called a retrospect. Walking through the museum was like a time lapse of black history. History, though not my family's history, it's what could have been. Ben, my ancestors were lucky enough to not have been through the horrid. Horrid, the horrid threats that were made and the things black people in America experienced. Experienced. They experienced lynching, death threats on themselves and their family, segregation, slavery. These are only some, some, not some, but most American white people enjoyed these events. Events. In the event this would occur again, millions, no, billions of lives would be lost. Lost. We've already lost. They've already lost so much. Much. Think of how much time has been taken. Taken. Stolen, rather, from the moment they built slave castles in. In stored people, human beings, and ships to be held captive. Captive, held captive under circumstances that pushed them not to stay and see what awaited them, but they would rather jump off and give in to the current. 
current. We are currently fighting for not just equality, but for equity. Equity. Tending to there, our needs is equity, to finally get the necessities. Necessity. Freedom is a necessity. That's why we protest. Protest. Black lives protest happened. Sorry, are happening for a reason. Reason. Everything happens for a reason. This is happening for A. A. A sign. This is a sign coming from history. History. And we're right back where we started. History is history. It refuses to be erased. Refuse to be erased. Hi, my name is Shay. This is called I Am Home. The social recognition. We admire it, cherish it, follow it, anticipate it. Yet I am left to wonder. My head holds rocks. Each moment, the weight increases. Your broken promises infecting my brain, whilst your words melt in the fire. Hoping for you, trusting you, expecting you, expecting something different than what I've always known. When you finally impress me, ecstasy goes wild. My head is empty, the rocks disintegrate. While thinking of your words, finally, I am home. I'm not going to just be reading one. I made a couple of them, so I'm going to be reading all the ones that I wrote in the book. So, um, the first one is called Silence. Silence filled her body, but then the sound came back. She felt certain she would lose her sense of hearing. Cassie could tell gravity was her friend again. I thought you were going to pass out. I was. And then I'm gonna go to the next one. Oh. I forgot to tell him the name of this one, but this one is called My World. So, my world is filled with a lot of positive and negative encounters, but I'm still here. A new start. We were oppressed, we were cannibalized, we were beat, we barely had anything. We wore rags, we were killed, and we get murdered. This is the life of a black person in the United States of America. But we still found our way. We still became basketball and football players. We still invented music. We still created some of the most popular food in the world. We still became famous. We still made money. We still ended slavery. We still create friendships with white folk, even though their ancestors treat us horribly but we still have biracial corpus. This is how we grow, this is how we learn. This is the America we want and need. So just like Josiah, I wrote like five poems. I'm reading three of them today. <laughs> this is called A Walk in the Forest. Take a walk in the forest to clear your mind. Swat away and smash bugs. Step on twigs, branches, flowers, and grass. Be mindful of your surroundings. Stay safe. Sit next to a tree and look to the sky. The clouds show shapes, show many shapes. Take a walk in the forest. Take a deep breath of the citrusy air. Smash and swat away bugs. Step mindlessly everywhere. You look to your left, they are taking down trees. You look to your right, there's construction. You look down, you're ankle deep in a burrow. And behind you is trash in the river. You've destroyed someone's home. Take a walk in the forest. Be careful next time. Yeah. <laughs> My next one is called mezclado. This is the only word I will be translating, and this means mixed up. Mis colores son mi vida. Mi amor y mi enojo es mi rojo. Mi felicidad y emoción es mi amarillo. Mi lealtad es mi morado. Mi bondad y simpatía es mi rosita. Mi, atlet mi atletismo es mi anaranjado. Mi crecimiento y renovación es mi verde. Mi libertad y sensibilidad es mi azul. 
Mi vida es un arco iris mezclado. <laughs> My last poem I got um, from <laughs> the Black Holocaust Museum. This is my inspiration from it. And this is my most powerful one. And I wanted to share this one, especially today. <laughs> it's called, This is Racism. Black people of this country are treated unfairly. Ever since we got here, there's been racial brutality. Only the fake ones think it's over. We can't walk behind them without them looking over their shoulder. They walk faster, girls clutch their purses, but behind closed doors, they remember all our verses. All these years and we still live apart. This is a calling for a new start. After death, fire, and cold-blooded murders, we should put all this racial segregation in the corner. Our lives haven't been lived. Our plans to continue have been archived. Our homes and communities are not a luxury. Our culture and history is now a new discovery. When will we learn the truth without battles? New angers and murders continue to rattle. We don't want to continue this war. Yeah, this is America, my country for sure. Okay, so, um, this was kind of a last minute plan, but Sam actually decided that she wanted to sing before everybody left. So, um, if you want to, you can, you can leave, but Sam, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, you don't gotta be forced to say it, but Sam, um, it took her a lot of courage to ask if she could sing, because she was actually saying, I don't know if I should sing, should I? And I'm like, yeah, go sing, Sam. So come on, Sam, come up here. <laughs> um, I guess I'm singing this acapella, so, okay. <laughs> it would be better with music, but um, I'm gonna pull up the lyrics real quick. <laughs> I'm singing uh, Stand Up by Cynthia Erivo from the movie Harriet, because some people don't know what that song is, but they've seen the movie, so. <laughs> okay. <sighs> it's it's gonna be weird with acapella. I ain't singing an acapella before. <clears throat> I've been walking with my face turned to the side. Weight on my shoulders, a bullet in my gun. Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head <laughs> Just in case I have to run come on, now. Come on, now. I do what I can when I can while I can for my people While the clouds roll back and the stars fill the night That's when I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together we are going to a brand new home Far across the river <laughs> I hear freedom calling Calling me to answer Gonna keep on keeping on I can feel it in my bones This poem is called What's the Change? And it was based off of a prompt that we got. We could look at one another and see another human, perfectly imperfect, fighting their own battles. Maybe we're all just trying our best instead of sneering in disgust only because someone looks different, thinks different, or lives different. We could all hold space for each other in our hearts, in our homes, instead of hurting each other, boxing out those who are curious, those who want to help, who want to learn. We could share our knowledge, our resources, wisdom, kindness, instead of taking, taking, taking. Okay. I have uh, two poems. The first up is a series of haikus I wrote called Triple Threat. This is Woman. Never wanted to be a walking target just wanted to walk home. Policeman. I know I tense up when you pass, 
but I received no reason not to. Cry. You say I'm weird, then throw a fit over who a teenage girl likes. And home. America. Oh, you have failed me time and time again. I give you up. Um, hello. Uh, this, uh, this poem that I wrote, it's called Invasive Species. I thought of the idea for it during AP Bio, uh, during the ecology unit. When is it normal to hurt more each day? The curve has to even out sometime. When do I reach maximum capacity, the most my soul can hold? Growth like this, uncontrolled, unknown, is sustainable by no ecosystem. What invasive species crawls in my blood, makes my veins its tunnels, and my bones its trees, my brain its bed, my flesh its sustenance, and my joints its hunting ground, and my heart its resting place? What predatorless intruder digs its claws into me, corners me at a cliff, making me decide between jumping and surrendering? How do you run from something within you? No matter how far my legs carry me, it is around every corner, behind every bone tree, brain bed, flesh sustenance, joint hunting grounds, and heart resting place. It follows me in my shadow. It evades my sight no matter how often I look over my shoulder. It is movement in the mirror when I stand statue still holding my breath. What is this invader and when will it stop spreading? My poem is called Feel in Milwaukee. It looks like an eagle, the way it moves in the wind. The chain represents the artist pulling stuff down. Ever been harassed or flushed before the cops? Mind your eyes and you can't climb up it? Hi, I have three short poems that kind of like run into each other, so I'll just like read them with short pauses in between. This is The Ground Gets Hot Sometimes. My favorite pair of shoes is the ground I walk on, baking in midday sun, blistering warmth, calloused I run through trails, up trees, akin with the leaves soaking in life. Sunbeam. Sunbeam floats by like fresh air, Whispering through the leaves, sunbeam shines, citrus and sweetness, melts me golden molten lava. Sunbeam caresses blossoms, thriving under his light. You are. I am the blooming weed, a pond reflection, peace and ego, synthesis and control. I am a gentle pulsation, I am a heartbeat gone wild. I'm here to talk about my time at Woodland Pattern. I'm going to talk about the art that I not only made, but captured as well. It was a great experience being around other artists who shared the love for poetry and literature. I was able to do a lot of my best work during this internship, and I think because of the artistic minds that I shared a space with. These past two years have not been the kindest to us, but I found a great escape through poetry and writing and art, and this internship really didn't feel like work. It didn't feel like work because I was doing something that I love while learning. Not only did I grow as a writer, but as a person, I was able to learn how to understand my writing better and who I was through my writing. But I didn't do that alone. I got so much help through the instructors and the people who mentored me throughout the this internship. And I learned who I am as a writer through others' poetry as well. I loved this experience because I was not only able to connect with people, but I was able to really understand them through their words. Never have I been in the space where emotions can flow on a paper and look up and see everyone excited to hear it or excited to experience those emotions with the writer. Through this internship, I mostly feared that I wasn't going to be good enough for this position or... I'm not good enough to be a mentor, an artist. But doing this internship made me realize that everyone is still learning. Everyone is finding new ways to express themselves. We'll be learning and experiencing new things forever. So there's no use to being afraid of challenge. Challenge is a part of life. 
And we are not truly living until we have gone through a few challenges and headaches and heartaches in our lives. The only way to know if you can succeed is to try something new. And just like poetry, you have to try new sounds and new words, new rhythms and new forms of saying something that you feel or have already felt. And I can tell you I felt afraid, but I was able to overcome that. So if you yourself are having doubts about whether you're a good artist, good teacher, good boss, good mother, good father, daughter, son, or person, then this is the time to look within yourself and ask, am I living the way that I want to? Am I expressing myself the way that I should? And if the answer is no, well, then this is the time to do it. It's time to get out of your comfort zone, a comfort zone that you may feel happy in at the moment. But until you leave that place and experience new scary things, you'll never be truly happy or comfortable. That being said, for now on, make your life mean something. Make your words poetry. Make your decisions art. Be passionate about who you are and what you want out of life. This was my art. This was my passion. These words that flow out of my mouth are from gratitude. And if asked, will I one day be a writer? The answer is, yeah, yes. Simply yes, because that's who I've always been. So thank you MPS, our internship program, for this opportunity. And thank you Woodland for being amazing mentors, teachers, and friends throughout this process. I hope to work with you all again one day. My name is Dasha Kelly Hamilton. I'm a poet laureate for the state of Wisconsin, for the city of Milwaukee, and a national laureate fellow with the American Academy of Poets. I do words. And throughout my writing career, I've been most excited about creating space and elevating the voices of young writers. As poet laureate, the opportunity is to be an ambassador for poetry and to share stories that are going to inspire and inform your neighbors and your peers. And I'm excited to announce that Milwaukee will have its first Youth Poet Laureate beginning this year. And so I'm inviting you to please find your five favorite poems and work on one CV, which is a resume, and be prepared to submit your work next month so that we can select our first Youth Poet Laureate this April. Go to woodlandpattern.org to find the application and more details on how to apply. Poetry, who to thunk? It's a tool to heal the world. And we need to hear from you next. Wheel kids. Chocolate children race down the cul-de-sac. Tight curls bounce. Jeans, t-shirts rise with air. Clenched fish tape bars, tennis shoe breaks. No breaks, a shout. They cruise out of sight of the window. Bikes, scooters, shake, quake. Skinny kid arms, legs, torsos. Skin flattens. Neighbors, straight arrows. Shooting stars. Flesh flies, bodies grow wings.
after the first snow. Bushes shake, white gifts fleck flex, earth quakes, pine, oak, maple trees dance, lift limbs, bow. Burning bush trembles with each footstep, droplets thunder. Icicles on my birthday sparkle, clear candles, icy breath of pine cones, each branch breathes out clean. Dust off flakes, give thanks to the trunks who let me linger in their froth. A child again, beneath this skin package. Winter's tongue landscapes the morning, silver palette. Sleds come out of storing. Children shriek, flock to the hill. Carve runs all afternoon. Sweaty kids' brows shine. Soundscape. Plain engines whir, leaves clap, footsteps crush, red earth crunch, dry twigs laugh, tiny bird chirps, gecko scramble, water splashes, hand carved rose, corn bathing grows, fan whirs behind, sidewalk voices float, disembodied hello lands near, bees buzz, cackle, wings hover, fly wings trickle, water soaks, red earth drinks, whippoorwill calls, motorcycles buzz, rider cries out, roadrunner scratches, tree leaf quakes, Cool breeze blows, hair joins chorus, wind whistles ears, farmer kneels, knee hits ground, plants leap, crab apples drop, red earth receives, ants march to feed. Hello, Woodland Pattern. I'm so pleased that you continue to have this wonderful marathon. I'm reading today an old poem that I wrote when you had Cecilia Becuña, the Chilean poet, visit you many years ago. It is based on the Spanish proverb, so often the pitcher goes to water and then it breaks. And that was also the title of a great book of poetry by Roy González why the pitcher broke. Maybe she started out weak, had the break baked in, the integral idea to be separate and inopportune. Maybe she came from clay that wanted to be left alone, knew that to be useful, they would make her brittle. Maybe her insides grew curious of the outside. Maybe she decided to feel for herself how air could pass over her surface, how a hand could pass over her formerly invisible self. Maybe she freed herself from the dull duties of containment, of pouring out, of always having her face in the dark. Maybe she grew edges and went looking for blood. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shauna Singh Baldwin. The first poem I'm going to read for you is called, Do You Feel Alone? Our flight attendant announces arrival and Mother's Day wishes to all. She warns baggage can shift in flight. Beside me, a slender woman dandles her baby and coos, A good nap, a big feed, a big poop, and you're all set. She plants a kiss on his forehead. Told him if he cried, I'd return him to Amazon. Behind her, a woman in a polka dot top says, 
The first three months are the worst. Then it gets better. A tiny woman pulling a bulging carry-on from the overhead says, Oh, you think? They never grow up. A woman with cloud gray hair laughs. Yes, they do. They just never grow away. A bead braided, crinkle eyed woman flashes a smile. But then we get grandchildren. Yeah, says a tired voice, and you end up looking after them too. A coffee scented woman says, If men could bear children, you'd see childcare in a shot. The tiny one says, But they'd get women to clean the poop. We're so special. And you? A long-lashed woman asks from across the aisle. How many do you have? None, I say, predicting looks of pity, you selfish woman. But they draw closer. Do you feel alone? A woman with eyeglasses asks. Yes, I say, as you do. Do you worry about old age? Says the cloud-haired one. Yes, I say just as you do. The tarmac shimmers beyond oval panes. The hatch opens, the line stirs. We shuffle forward to our separate lives, to lovers, fathers, husbands, sons, brothers. We tread the bridge, descend to ground reality. The second poem is called Mantras. You did not survive, only to exist. Partner yourself. Parent yourself. Metabolize grief through movement. Give yourself time. Slow it down. Slow it down. Sprint short distances. Rest. Get comfortable with discomfort. Figure out what you don't need, then what you want. Mourn a little each day, not all at once. Your grief is connected to mine. We attempt a new language. The third poem is called A Banana in Berlin. We listen to Richard Russo and Namita Gokhle read from their latest oeuvre and adjourn to a table in a tapas bar near the restored Reichstag. We ordered empanadas, gambas and croquettes with sangria. Solicitous servers attended our mirrored half-moon velveteen sofa booth. Your roommate's nose wrinkled at pickled anchovies. My tour guide declared herself vegetarian because she's anti-cruelty. A new acquaintance at the next table was emphatically against pairing sangria with curried potato quesadillas. I said, my refugee grandparents warned to be prepared for another two-state solution, another Radcliffe line somewhere in the world, and times when no food was too menial. You told us you remembered the first banana you ever ate. You were 20. It was just after crossing into West Berlin. You mimed, peeling it slowly, admiring how it arced like time. You told us you would never forget how it surprised your tongue, its sweet slide and unresistant softness filling a distant place. Someone exclaimed we should order bananas flambéed in Grand Manier or served with gelato, maybe flan. No banana could taste better, you said, as your gaze met mine in the mirrors. Thank you. Okay. This year, I'm going to share two poems about my dog, Max. Um, one was written in 2012, and one was written recently. He's getting to be a very old dog, and so I'm going to read this first poem. It's called Jester. Little Max, I'm so short-ranged. 
so dense. The dog eloquence of your urine is wasted on me. Still, you rise in hind legs in a circus pose, settle at my feet, and I feel clean. Today's early September breeze is fine. The clarity of light helps me perceive and perceive and perceive. The blending of your brown, black, and white hairs, the way your ears respond, creased at times like paper bolts. I see patterns, a tan stripe down the underside of your tail, expanding to a loopy trident at the base. The center tine divides your balls, your unabashed and humorous balls. Humor, Max, humor. Some people persist on faith, but you've got to have humor, and it's obvious you have the knack. You should see yourself asleep on your back, faintly snoring in the plush dog bed. Maurice of all people nudges me, wants me to look without waking you. Your rear legs are splayed and the front ones stick up, bent at the hocks, ebony nails pointing at your belly. You're like a cartoon, Max. You remind me of the carrots. See, last year I got rheumatoid arthritis. The pain from my swollen joints was yellowish, blaring, almost nauseous. Then the meds gave me pneumonia with fevers and anemia. At night that summer I woke almost every hour, pillows soaked with sweat. My mouth was sticky and dry, yet I dreaded sitting up to reach for water. My wrists and elbows were sore, so I had to heave up from the hip. I couldn't press the mattress without gasping. The lurch upright brought on a wild tachycardia, and that thumping, the anarchy in my chest brought on fear. That's something I couldn't get out from under, Max. I was afraid one of those times my heartbeat wouldn't settle, afraid I'd never be well again. One night I gave up on sleep and limped across the hall to the computer. There was mail from my sister, subject obscene carrots. I clicked it open, the screen filled with an orange host of unsellable carrots, shaped like genitals and plump crossed legs. They looked unconcerned, sturdy, sporting root hairs and dirt. Those ridiculous lewd roots almost winked. Max, I laughed and laughed, though laughing uses oxygen because whoever knows what comes next. I wasn't healed. In fact, I ended up in the hospital, but for the first time in weeks, I felt clean. So now it's over 10 years since I wrote Jester, and this poem is called Sweet Autumn. Our dog, Max, is old. In the planters on Capitol Drive, annuals hit their stride in September, and why then? Salvia petals flash brighter at summer's end than they ever did in June. Later yet, autumn clematis blooms on fences, fresh, just as hydrangeas go greeny and hostas are chewed. It has a scent. It's actually called sweet autumn clematis. And I had a vague and plotless dream where you ran, Max, and fixed yourself to the scent in white petals curlicued purple and green stems, and the litter of spent stamens and pistils on the leaves. When I woke up, you were associated with sweet autumn clematis, and that may not change. Max, when you were young and droll, the hair around your bright eyes was brown like chestnuts. All of your hairs laid smooth, shiny like lacquer, and your socks were chestnut too. Those hairs have gone from chestnut to ivory, and the ivory round your eyes is spiky. You're urgent and bossy and look like a raccoon or a vole. Max, I call you. Maximum, my sausage. Sweet autumn clematis. Sweet autumn clematis, the hour is getting late. The hour getting late. Mortality dropped here like a stone, without the flesh of music or a plot. Deep. Then another day, another mood, it fades from profound to maybe, maybe not. It's okay. In the park, you relax. Your kicks backwards towards glistening turds are full of vigor. Grass and little sticks flying, you did that. In the yard, you also have some ease. 
It's time to run in for biscuits, to find the shortest distance between points and gather speed. Ears up, we're old, not dead. You leap over to downspout and take the steps at high speed for many biscuits of joy or whatever comes next. I just want to thank my videographer, my neighbor, Linda Rosland. Thank you. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Hoover. Um, this is my third time participating in the Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon. Um, I'm always honored to be a part of it. I've since moved to St. Louis and I miss you guys. Um, so for the, par uh, for the marathon, I'm going to be reading two poems um, from my debut collection of poetry. The archive is all in present tense, which I'm sure you can order through Woodland Pattern. Um, I put my tabs in the wrong places. The archive is all in present tense. Librarians turn slender shadows in the afternoon light, gathering materials along the ledge. Three men exit a jeep on a hillside, doors slam in unison. Two orphans walk into a dance for soldiers. Wind winters down from the north. Concertina wire unspools like fat loops of cursive. I've always wanted a boyfriend like you. Language making it impossible for her to love me back, though no one could love me now. Preoccupied as I am by war, paging arrest records, letters, diaries, clippings in their acid-free envelopes. I sort through tea lights, radio crackles, paper fortune tellers, predicting the man who will marry you, what house he will buy for you, paper turning to snow in her hands, folding, unfolding. After the librarians bring the snow, I check if they are watching, then touch the jars to feel the cold of silence, of waiting. The men pass concertina wire hand to hand as trucks convey people up the mountain. One orphan creases his hat. The other smooths her pleats, practices American slang. A letter turns over to an empty verso, the blank my want tumbles into. The archive is full of blanks. So many archivists come before dawn to catalog them and are still behind. Librarians bring everything I write on a call slip without judgment or warning. I write en masse. I write war bride. I write amnesty. I write savagery is the natural condition of the human race. I write I can't keep my men from the refugee win women. I page dirt from the camp floor, blankets and hunger, sickness and sorrow. I could page his service records or the stories he told about how his commanders liked him so much they kept me from all that. I could page the women's voices in their velvet bags bound with string. The archive is full of string, full of wire and casings and food stamp books and adoption records and wills and transfer requests. The archive is full of tanks and spears and muskets and porcelains and dollars and steamboats and axes and folly and fall, cataloged so I can page it all. So this book is very much about um, how daunting archival research can be, how much um, material there are in archives. And so it follows a lot of threads, but one of them um, that it follows is the researcher is trying to learn about um, a potential war crime that her grandfather participated in. Um, and so my second poem is going to um, touch on that. We are only shuttling information. The information comes to us as if we are looking at the sky and seeing the flash of white on the underside of a wing. Comes as seven hoof prints left by deer in the mud where the camp once stood. We are only the mud, 
unmarked next to the historical site, where the second year history student dresses as a local woman to show how they did laundry back then. Back then, a funny time when people had had to boil their clothes. Back then, before the Americans built the road all the way up the mountain. We are only imprints speckled along a typewriter platen. There, the general typed, I can't keep my men from the refugee women. He typed, and with the possibilities of getting supplies, we need to choose. We are only three men's memory as they lean against a jeep, choosing in a surprising spring snow. Only a general's memory of women's voices, the voices themselves vanished. We are only the vanishing of snow. Only the fistful of snow the woman crams in her mouth to extinguish her memory. The fistful of snow the woman crams in her mouth to distinguish this day from the other. The snow the woman crams in her mouth to stop her own screaming. We are only the drift of her body in the current, only the memory of eels cradling her body as it sinks and the prayer of eels curled among the bones. Only the comfort of eels sliding through her ribs to remember. We are only water and we could not rise up without rain, rise up and save her. Instead, we offer memory and our memory is only as good as our archive where her name is not written, her death unremarked, her number uncounted. We are only the blanks of women, and we carry these blanks inside us as the sky carries the white beneath the wing. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to the staff at Woodland Pattern. I know this marathon is a monumental effort, um, and I thank you for including me. Um, I'm Martha Kaplan, and I'm very pleased to be reading in the Woodland Pattern Marathon for this year. Um, my first, the first poem I'm going to read is called If and When, and uh, was published this fall in Nix's Mate Review, and I want to thank that, those editors. Um, if and When. If I loved you in blue filament, Stars would thread slowly, slowly in silver air. When silence moves like a great white shark, Mars bends to kiss the earth. If hope became the wind rushing across the plains, coyotes would howl, sea foam. When the red wolf bristles fire, ice cries, steel spears. If you swam naked in a yellow sea, white clouds would drip oil. When the hyena ro roosts in the baobab, leopards stalk the sky. If hatred became a wild crane flying through the trees, stones would sprout legs and run. My next poem is where northern lights shimmer. I left my shoes beside the old canoe and the cabin in the north woods where I imagined you and longed for salt water. Though here, osprey fly with eagles and once a pileated woodpecker knocked at a white pine that loomed over the lake. Loons call as if wolves, small things tremble at a barred owl's whoop. Out on the lake, in a night canoe, bat wings whisper, stay. And my next is Tracks Vein the Earth. Somewhere, a coyote slinks through scablands of the inland west. Might be a trickster. Might wreak havoc. Might be the one who stole fire from the house of pain. Might make changes, shake things up. Might be just a plain coyote who trots down a summer road, looks back at you, 
shrugs you off, leads you to a gravel path in a forest of pines and scrubs where blackberries thrive. There, a raven croaks across a northern lake, just a bird or raven, the trickster, sometimes walks around looking human, sexy. He'll steal your wife. Maybe she'll like him better. He watches, flies over mountains, knows how to dance. Once children marked out paths between houses or through wild places that are no more. Their footprints tamped down the land, kept the paths alive. Sometimes tracing show in uneven tarmac or a break in concrete. The earth remembers more than, than the surface wrecked by machines that tore up the paths. When asphalt bolts, tree roots are speaking. Last night, a shadow as large as a wolf moved like an arrow under the moon down the middle of an icy street. Something haunting, something wild drew me to it. I watched it pass under a streetlight and saw the hump of a huge raccoon. When it was gone, I felt the void. I feel it still. Um, I think I have room for just one more. Um, it's a Kwansaba. Kwansaba for seawater. A whisper of Basho in the midst, hints of days where wood drifts onto beaches to fuel fire circles or stacks up to form quiet saltwater pools to catch sand dollars or stars as tides go out, watched over by a white volcano sleeping in a distant sky. So I wanna thank Woodland Pattern and uh, wish everybody a good read, thanks. Hello, Poetry Marathon listeners. Scott Lowry here coming to you from Milwaukee. And I've got a couple of poems that you can find in books at Woodland Pattern Books. Um, the first one is in the next year's edition, the 2023 edition of the Wisconsin Poets Calendar. It takes its title from the location and birth year for one of my great grandmothers who as a girl came with her family from Minnesota to, from Wisconsin to Minnesota in a covered wagon. Whitewater, Wisconsin, 1858. One yoke of brown oxen, chests like full barrels, steaming at sunrise. Three sharp calls from a crow as it lifts black on black four hickory wheels creaking like pulled oars against greased leather. Under iron rims, green acorns, Indian paintbrush, the insistent grasp of bindweed. Oak frame of the wagon box, like an ark or a coffin leveling the leaf springs. White china jostled in its crate of peanut shells or newsprint or the dried husks of locusts, dreams that crawl into the bedclothes at night, leaving blood on the muslin, liquid eyes of a white-tailed deer as she gives herself away at the edge of the woods. Flies in the yellowed canvas, droning their patient lust for salt. Slung from a peg, a folded map and fountain pen in a beaded pouch, and the loaded musket. Under the bench, a King James Bible. Each page, one plank. Each comma, a clinched nail. My second poem comes from my years of teaching, and it's included in this uh, new anthology with uh, some great poems with an eye and ear towards social justice called Stronger Than Fear. Um, I'm thrilled to be in a, a book with uh, a number of 
stellar poets, including five or six of the most recent U.S. poet laureates. Um, and you can find this book on the shelf at your local bookstore, too. Sean, Hennepin County Home School, 1987. My first and only year there, that heavy clump of keys holstered at my hips, I tried to show them what anyone should know, how to read a tape and cut pine to a squared off line, thinking I suppose that accuracy and luck could buy them different lives. He was tall and caught on fast, able to give me his attention like a small gift as long as they could show me how to pop a car lock. You know, you could build things for money, I'd say, and he'd ask, what's that pay? Then smirk at my inflated guess. None of us were leaving anytime soon, so I'd laugh too. We hung drywall, the dust like flour on their brown hands. We drilled holes, pulled nails, my tradesman tricks blooming like parking lot weeds, there in the classroom's bright optimistic buzz. Maybe he asked, can I try that? Or else just smiled and the next day showed another kid, here, hold it like this. Later, he got his grades and circled back to the near north side, the weeks crossed off and done. I still see him, eye to eye, taking his crew down the corridor toward a lukewarm dinner. All right, Lowry. All right, Sean. That summer, he was waiting in a car for somebody. The bullet ran its small, precise course through his head, fixing his age for my Star Tribune. Next day, no updates or remembrances, just a new day another card in a crooked deck. I kept teaching 20 years, measured in fractions of hope. Every fall, his is a face I look for, lifting itself grudgingly, generously, up toward mine. Thanks for listening. I'm Kelly Hoffer. I'm here to read some poems. Thank you so much to Woodland Pattern uh, for putting on this event. It's really great. It seems really wonderful. Um, I'm going to be reading two poems. The first one is from my first book, which is coming out in the spring from Light Scatter Press. And the book is called Undershore. For this poem, the only thing that you need to know is that it is written in two sections. The first section takes language from technical or scientific names of plants, and the second section uses the common names or the folk names of those same plants. So the second section is almost a folk translation of the first section. Floriography, a translation. Dianthus, myosotis bindweed, myosotis bindweed, viola bind, digitalis weed, chicory, amaranth bind, bellus perennis bind, weed, bellus perennis, bellus perennis. Bindweed, chicory, weed, amaranth bind, chicory, viola tricolor, calinzia weed, sedum. Wild geranium, bind ranunculus, weed, amaranth, viola, canina, bindweed, pedicytes, weed, convolvulus, weed, wild carrot, weed, crocus, versicolor, bind, prunus pagus, plains coreopsis, bind, viola, tricolor. Sweet William, forget me not in the scorpion grass. My heart's ease is dressed in lady's glove, fastened bachelor's button. The prince feather wakes the day's eyes for just the sight of daisy, daisy. And so I'm nursing hurt sickle, become your love lies bleeding in a blue bottle. Love in idleness, my innocence turned to stone crop. A dove's foot prates the le lesser celadine as you, my velvet heath dog, hung with butter burr, proffer me the devil gut, 
in lace, in a cloth of silver, and I cough up the bird cherry, a golden tick seed, and watch my heart cease. This second poem is from my second manuscript, Fire Series, which has not found a home yet, is still looking for one. And this poem is called Pygmalion Iteration. Pygmalion Iteration. If I am a bird, I am a pigeon. If you are a bird, you are a dove. If I am a fountain, I am dyed green for a holiday. If you are a fountain, you are filled with coins. If I am a pigeon, I am molting. If you are a dove, you are pearl white, molten and phoenix boned. I sit on your ledge and pull change from your belly. If I am a woman, I am an animal. If I am not an animal, what am I? If you are an animal, you are the magpie who catches himself in a mirror, a round yellow sticker on your feathered throat. I am a whatnot with a beak. I am hungry with glinting teeth. If I am a voice, I am a body. If you are a voice, you are an echo of an animal. You are an animal if you are an animal crying. If you are a celestial object, you are a sun burning the film of dew off a of summer's lawn. If I am a face, I cry into my hands until my eyes disappear. If you are a face, you are a mouthless cliff. If I am a mollusk, I am the poison muscle, cooked and firmly shut. If you are a mollusk, you are pearlless. If I am a celestial object, I have forgotten. If I am a pearl, I was born of sand. You are not a pearl, and I open my mouth to forget the man of you. I try to climb you without footholds. You shift away from my hands. My face becomes an animal crying. If I am a dune, I am shaped like a slick of ice cream. I taste sweet, I breathe salt. If you are a dune, you are shaped like a cloud. Thanks. Evening Snow. Fighting the gloom Christmas brings, blinded by snow not falling but pelting, I walk beside you in the trackless park, hours past twilight. Eyelashes so full I can only look down, squint. For as long as we move forward, we know nothing but trust and a bigger love than we carried here. You've no need to say what it is. And I arrive anxious, filled with aspects of time I say out loud, Katie is pregnant and Sarah is, Peace is precarious somewhere in the world. Lake Park hasn't looked this gorgeous since fall. Now the wind's at our backs and we can see leafless trees being slowly redefined by snow. We'll drive to the family table soon enough to forget there is no place to go except here, you say, as we stop to admire the dark and awakening ravine. Building Code Sex breeds more than places we've been, more than ourselves going anywhere inside, past having gone, having seen, past having anything to show for our loss except more. Surely we were somewhere, two chairs, two people, a beach spread wide, pearly. There was the ocean, they say it churns, earns its keep by going along with itself, heavy though it is, tired from the sorrow. But we are not bodies of water, just bodies, period, entering and leaving who we are at the drop of a hat, the mention of a name, a word that stings or a note's light touch. One day in Ensenada, my love and I, free and not yet orphaned, watched sandpipers make prints that the waves tenderly erased. Times collide every day, throw us around. That a lonesome resort is decaying in fact, yet building to a sphere lovely in our minds, whirling and departing like the good world is the calling home that now draws me near. A man pans, pounds nails in a structure outdoors. We hear it, hammer hits wood, saws buzz. A history of Lake Anna. 
Children throw bits of bread to the swans, descending in that same fleeting arc on holiday nights, fireworks sizzle into its surface and disappear. A fisherman sits with his bucket of minnows, casting and recasting. When it was, long ago, more swamp than lake, men drove horses and cattle through these waters, believing they could cure disease. An apple orchard thrived at the northwest corner. They fished back then from canoes, and once a man from a traveling carnival swam, got a leg cramp, and drowned. Passing the bathhouse, the stone wall separating the hill's slope from the walkway, the shore, the lake center, I would often move to the cannon from the First War, to the memorial with names from the Second, the Korean, the Vietnam, and sometimes find the serene near Lake Anna, this water named for a daughter, the mystery of sequence, water and peace, the war dead, all the living, the melting of glaciers, birth water, wide-eyed, patient, the fisherman mulls over thoughts running in and out around him all day long and waits for his line that he knows won't move until the water does or the hungry fish. In a week's time, one, shooting pains. Mourners need to do something, so bouquets pile up at the site. We cry at the death of strangers who might have been ourselves, click the remote, begin the hard work of letting it soak in yet again. Two, royal widow. Prince Philip's morning of mourning, black masks, flags with symbols no one knows of what, so many flags, horns, marching, matching uniforms, angelic voices, all that order, merely external to some, to others deeply interior, deeply alone, in shadow, the queen. Three, anniversary waltz. We're body to body, too familiar for words. Yes, two, three, yes, two, three. The years give in secret, so we thrive, not knowing what it is keeps us here, where others once lived, where others once loved. Still here, still counting, still counting the beats. Thank you. A beautiful new day has been offered to me. A beautiful new day has been offered to you. A beautiful new day has been offered to us. This day is meant to be lived fully. This day is meant to be lived fully. This day is meant to be lived fully. I must be here to live it. You must be here to live it. We must be here to live it. May I be here. May you be here. May we be here.
as Dasha Kelly Hamilton says, life can be beautiful. I wrote this song on the Milwaukee River as the salmon swam their last swims and spawned little children who will return here someday when it is their turn. You swam this river through struggle and strife to give a new generation a chance at life. Fare thee well, O oh salmon. Fare thee well. The cool fall water is up to my knees. I can't stay long here, or I'm sure to freeze. Fare thee well, oh salmon. Fare thee well. You've traveled waters, streams up and down, and now your skin turns a muddy brown. Fare thee well, O oh salmon, fare thee well. The glassy river is your burial shroud the sun on the water peeking through the clouds fare thee well O oh salmon fare thee well you've done your job you've done your best and now my friend it's time to rest. Fare thee well, O oh salmon. Fare thee well. Hi. I'm Peter Goldberg from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm going to be reading three poems to you today. The first, written especially for the marathon, an apology for want of convictions. My poetry does hard time, usually penned and locked away as personal time stamps against entropy, but not risking the trials of public opinion. Yet I confess, poet and poem can go stir crazy in solitary, once a year, therefore, I go fugitive from the writer's block. I'm still not out in paper, nor leaving behind any paper trail, though, to be honest, I do hope to leave some sort of impression, if only a ghost-like watermark of meaning should my paperless capers come to light. But then, why must poetry be meaningful? Why shackled to weighty convictions? No piper to be paid, no poetic justice meted out. I won't be juried, I'm not slammer bound. Like in a kid's game of cops and robbers, it's play, word play, when all is said and done. So here goes, over the fourth wall, chancing your judgments, pro or con. A few new, yet-to-be-tried poems just for the fun of it, and Woodland Patterns Fisk. Fifty years ago, I was in the Peace Corps in Senegal in the southern part, the Casamats. I'd love to go back to my village, but there's an insurrection going on, and they kidnap foreigners traveling in the area. This is my recollection of Senegal when it was all one. Chebu Jen, sun season Senegal, bounty of sea, land, and sky, forest, river, and Sahel, awakens at dawn to cocks crow, cattle's low, and the rhythm of the day set 
by women pounding the grain, cadence of mortar and pestle, the rhythm of kokat song, each family compound in syncopation. This is the beating heart of the land. Chebujen, rice with fish for the noonday meal, hot and savory, dark day, deep and full, fermented flavors uniting all. Pots furiously boiling on cookhouse fires, pans crackling with oil, palaver of the day right off. Smoke cured chaff, slit stuffed and slathered with roaf of garlic cloves, chili flakes and bouillon cubes, parsley, onions and scallions cut coarse. Next, turnip, cabbage, carrot, yucca and squash, Eggplant purple and eggplant bitter, tamarind and okra pods into the pot, and the pungent funk sea flavor gauge, edged with black pepper, scotch bonnet, hibiscus tang and tomato paste, a sea garden colored palette spread on the rich rice canvas from the Casamance to the north. Chebujen soulful and complex, the national dish, despite a soupçon of rebellion simmering in the south, may Taranga, the hospitality of the land, forever join all around the communal bowl. In, Octo in October, some college friends and I took a trip to, among other countries, Luang, uh, Laos, Luang Prabang, Laos, where an expatriate friend is finishing his days. This is a moment on that trip. The Viewpoint Cafe, where the Nan Khan joins the Mekong, vertigrous, melding with bronze, last night, during the Festival of Lights, a galaxy of lanterns streamed through the dark, constellations of hopes, dreams, and prayers. And today, by daylight, deep mountain forests continue to channel past to present and beyond. The smartphone reports that in the distant north, they have ennobled three physicists who conjured a universe of spooky entanglements, inexplicable instants impossibly connected. Here, the Buddha, Buddha long ago spoke to realizing human connections in spite of the void. Different perspectives as breakfast is served travelers, starting the day from the prospect of the River Inn's Viewpoint Cafe. Thank you. Thanks to Woodland Pattern for the celebration of poetry. I'll read from my online chapbook titled Bumblebees with artwork by Jeffrey Gatza and published at Blazevox. Bumblebees, try exaltation, noun, a state of rising or expanding in fierce opposition to awe, that silver necklace encrypting dangerous love. We face the truth. We are assaulted with rotated figures, excised from pre-existing works, reference in hiding, unspecified complaint, part human, fable justice, a call to light, averages. We broke the silence. We cry a hitch in their ethics or an itch in their thicket amounts to the same thing. Give away per dose of identity, slip of their cover narrative, say, or speech recognition. If we were born with full ability in mathematics, would our grandparents' sufferance shaped tatters overcome in a later electronic spliced age. We pointed, here's a child who added to after school book club intelligence quotient, but lived in a bird's nest wedged between barbed wire like ordinary mortals. For the justice challenged, we rejected coming home in a sack, cloth of the devil sold as specialty yardage come due, geriatric snake in voltage surge. Be urgency zigzag and brush up against us, brash consideration over payment. We hear you, all of you, in recordings, have purchase on them, not in the wires. But the garden, quote, we, the gardeners, do in our intuitive upkeep, low water design, plan for pollinators and butterflies, plain and fancy, 
equal under the law. Carried away, an account of bumblebees exalted by utter beauty of nature, volume one. We adapted our press, Roy Crofters, a rarity, communal soup refined the style, yet visitors, authors, political radicals of their time, word got out. When superstition fell across science, we got up the nerve. When a little girl went on strike, we got up to shout, threw off chains, made a growl, recovered here. We were an echo chamber for thought. We were profiled, caricatured. We had sing-song cadence, nonsense questions, character. Distribution scale of landscape, we moved through in a show of our comparative anatomy. We clunked against idols. Desire in terms of exploration, we came to over-depend on heat shields, surely a mark of their success. Equipped with piscine visual filters, we thrilled to neon nights at sea. With or without conchology grid, we had murex beauty. We began to study warming, acidifying of their ancestral site, ventriloquism. We didn't need squirrels to learn how to chatter. We followed our conscience. We were just walking. Walking was never transparent. We were named hardly a genealogical wonder, meaning nature's pollinators of field. We are daughters, sons of zesty protoplasm and leftover spunk from our egg-headed galaxy. We failed as penitents. We made excuses, got lost, were late, meant well, forgot, were misled, had to work, took to the road, gave in too easily. Once out of the carrying case are flakes, pet rocks, how they came here, why they have to go, scientific evidence, kings and mushrooms. Look, by sea approach, how pregnant Kairos reclines cyclotic style. That's one version, rising from our old trial, homing in, mineral pigment, flake by time. But the garden, flight paths, sourced sucre, clear water mapped our minds up to now. I'm Margie Bruce from Waukesha, Wisconsin. I will be reading a few pieces from my book, Cascading Sonnets. Filipinos. You think we're yelling, but we're just talking. We may be loud, but we are not screaming. We like to sing, dance, and eat not the least. Our get-togethers are always a feast. We're used to constant camaraderie and we grew up singing karaoke. We may sing out of tune, but that's our hearts. We may dance off beat, do lots of restarts. But that's how we have fun once in a while. Bring our culture alive, keep it in style. It's not about being good at these things, as much as feeling good while them doing. We are passionate people, we love life, no matter the hardships that it's with rife. Made of the Mist Standing at the edge of the mighty falls, I hear the maid of the mist to me calls. Come closer, she says. Come on, have your fill. I walk closer, she says. Come closer still. An invisible hand comes to offer. I take a few steps towards the water. Come on. Over the roar where rocks abound, down where the waterfalls, her voice resounds. Feel my spirit walk out of my body as everything around me turned foggy. I feel like I have walked a thousand miles, yet no closer to that hand caused no riles. I blink and gone are the voice and the hand. Not today you're made, not by my hair strand. Autumn. You see brilliance against the blue heaven. I see a painting, the seas of seven. You see the changing colors of the leaves. I see a tree in full surrender heaves. You see leaves dance as they fall to the ground. I see a king of his glory uncrowned. 
You see bare limbs reaching up to the sky. I see God's servants' silent prayers cry. You see the sure changing of the seasons. I see behind it all many reasons. The preparation for a renewal of strength and energy, a deferral, a witness to the splendor of nature that fills the soul of this lowly creature. The Constant One I am the earth that revolves round the sun. You are the sun, the constant, stable one. I am like a bird that loves to take flight. You are the perch I come home to at night. I'm the wind that blows in no certain norm. You are the center, the eye of the storm. You are the immense and ever blue sky. I am the clouds rolling slowly on by. You're the rock planted firmly on the ground. I am the rolling stone that knows no bounds. You are the placid shore that sits in craves. My caresses and wet kisses the waves. In this changing world, you remain steady, the still in the middle of the eddy. And the last piece is not in this book, and it's untitled. Rise, my dear beloved one. Bloom as much as you possibly can. Take in the sun, the rain, the wind's caress. Let the butterflies your beauty undress. Your time is now, don't let it slip away, for not another chance may come your way. Hi, I'm Brie Legan, and I am Woodland Patterns Milwaukee Emerging Poet Fellow this year. I am honored to be completing a community-centric art and poetry project this year, and also reading some poems for you today. So let's dive in. My first poem is called Stolen. Stolen. To take or appropriate without right and with intent to keep or make use of wrongfully. Stolen. Sweet golden rays drip from the hillside, each blade of grass coated in honey light, our bare feet burrowing into spongy moss as our heads fall back in gentle laughter. Grandmother tree holds us with tired limbs stooped protectively over our soft bodies. She has been here so long, watching, waiting, hoping. Her roots are deep within red soil, these layers of history, of hurt, anchoring her home. This anchor, of course, is also a chain that weighs more than the countless bodies slain on this land, the lives taken like this land, the blood spilled on this land. These unexpected nutrients fertilize the clover and dandelions that pop up so purely. And yes, the sun still kisses each tiny leaf and the tops of our heads indiscriminately. The sun, you see, believes in second chances. The sun, you see, still believes in you. It is your duty as you walk these lands that are not your lands to honor that which once was, what is today, and what beauty may yet unfurl tomorrow. My next poem is called The Witch Who Grew Flowers From Her Hands. Legend tells of a soft and strong witch whose vapid skin gave way to the most surprising of things. Impossibly so, vines sprouted from her scalp, tumbling down shoulders ripe with berries, her belly blanketed by a bed of wispy moss, her legs tough as tree trunks, and between each stubby toe, a tiny beetle nestled. Of course, her arms carried the most, New twigs eager to reach towards the sun, unafraid to break new ground, the pain of new growth and afterthought when compared to the sweet baby mushrooms springing up from tired wrists and gorgeous buds bursting open, the fresh leaves of new flowers spilling from her fingertips. You'll feel her magic as it stops raining, that hair heavy and damp and so precisely perfect, 
Petricor welcoming you as an old friend. Of course, as evening fast approaches, you'll feel her and the delicious golden rays of a truly sublime golden hour, the warmth seeping into the weariest of bones, and somehow she'll carry you home on her back of roses, the witch who grew flowers from her hands. And my last poem today is called The Becoming. Cotton candy days, wispy clouds, and blush skies. This rose-tinted nostalgia coloring the breeze, gently rocking the branch of this old cedar tree. A small cocoon hangs in this fuzzy memory, dancing above my head in the breathy wind, and my eyes are wide in wonder, shock, confusion, as my great-grandma tells me a story about the caterpillar becoming. This creature struggling to leave the hardened cocoon, its wings crumpled and wet, how the soft caterpillar body transforms one night. Magic replacing leg with wing, slender beauty resurrected from the tomb it entered. My small hands reach to help the poor creature escape the prison, and my grandma swats my fingers back. The butterfly, she says, must help itself. The branches hang lower now, my old cedar mourning beside the desolate house, creaking in the sad breeze. There is a new cocoon and an old voice in my head as the delicate casing cracks, spindly legs reaching out, my fingers nearing but lingering in the air. As I remember, the butterfly's strength relies on the struggle. How my soft hands mean death for this creature if I crack open its home before it can free itself. You see, the struggle is hard to watch, but essential for survival. The becoming must be our own doing. And as this butterfly slowly unfurls those wet wings and the golden rays kiss this sublime miracle, I water my sweet primroses, their nectar primed for this new friend. Because even though the only way out is through, the best gift of all is supporting one another as we make our own ways into the blush skies. Thank you so much for listening to my words and being touched by this magic that is poetry. They still write love poems because love ignores the times. The heart can watch the country tear itself apart needlessly, deny reality, and still think all will be well. Then put a gun to its own head and convince itself it will misfire. Just as in the worst of wars, amid siege and starvation, with daily barbaric attacks, babies continue to be born. And yet, out of spite, we blind ourselves to deny others, even if it means the country destroys a piece of itself. An animal in a trap might gnaw its claw off to escape, but never, never, never to deny its brother life. Blind date in a fraught time. How will you know me? I'll be wrapped in the stars and stripes. I'll be scrubbing out the stains and mending the rips. I'll be wearing stardust in my hair. I won't be crammed in a pigeonhole or chained to a stereotype. I won't keep my distance or know my place. I won't follow the rules. I won't knuckle under or care which side my bread is buttered on. I'll be clenching a rose between my teeth and humming a lullaby. I'll be dancing the salsa in the middle of the street. I'll be pulling a pink suitcase. I'll be walking on my hands. I'll be carrying a protest sign. Don't believe everything they say. Nina, Simon, almost 60 years have passed, yet it could be today she sings murder, oppression, protest in the streets, 
school children sitting in jail. Still a country full of lies. Still blacks die. Emmett Till to George Floyd. Still more and more blacks die. Desegregation, do it slow. Look for justice, go slow. Call for equality, go slow. Everybody knows, too slow, too slow. Upset about Alabama, Tennessee, could be any state, California, Wisconsin, and of course, everybody knows Mississippi, god damn. Lake Light Swing. This is a night to slip on dancing shoes and tap, tap, tap your way to the middle. Sidle, sidle back. Slip on dancing shoes. This is the night to slip, to slide in dancing shoes, prancing shoes, to slip, to slither, to glide. This is the night to tap, tap, tap on the glittering lake, out to the middle and up the dark wall of night. Now is the time to kick off your shoes, wiggle your toes, slap bare feet on cool moon blow, on brassy notes, on tin pan notes, on jazzy razzmatazzy notes. Slither into a cool white nighty and sidle, sidle back. Take a running glide, then one slick stride to the tip top of the night. Aphrodite in a nighty, swoop and glide, act slightly flighty, slip and slide, take the ultimate leap, wrap your arms round the neck of the moon, swing over her shoulder and down. This is the night to tiptoe up the path, hip hop up the path, tiptoe up the bright lip path, up the spot lip path, up the hot lipped path to her beaming face to swing, swing, swing from her porcelain neck, glide down her silvery slide, slide down her glittery glide to cool lake water lit up by her one-eyed stare. Pandemic Recess at Escuela View, April 2021. The view from the shadowed basement looks out windows that rise eight feet above my head. I am half buried in the library. Outside, chain link upon chain link, diamond shapes outline the spring. Patterns crosshatch the sunshine on the children's faces. First, the light is so bright, it lights up the basement, spilling almost to the door across the stacks of books. Dust dances in the beams. Later, shadows splay and morph and then flit across my face as the children again run above ground. Funny, I cannot hear words, but it sounds joyous, exuberant, a stream of sound spraying let loose from under the structure of Winter's Cannon. The children move in clusters like starlings, birds that fly in great unisonian flocks, dipping, weaving, ascending in ribbons, murmuration. How do they know which way to go? And yet they go together. Up the slide, down the stairs, swing from the bars and leap landing crouched for a millisecond, and then up again, rejoining the cluster. There is order in the chaos. I have a sense memory, suddenly, of running like that, feeling hysteria in my chest and throat, running, screaming that I could burst from the sheer joy of exertion, movement. My breath catches at the apex. Trip advisor for an agoraphobe. You will love it here. There are wide open yet enclosed places, but the enclosed spaces are cozy, not claustrophobic. 
and the wide open space is freeing, not unhinged. These spaces are safe, yet lively and joyous. No one is paying attention to you, but everyone is glad you're here. There are no germs. All surfaces have been cleaned. Everyone washes their hands. The food is prepared fresh by people wearing masks, gloves, and hairnets, even the ones that go over the chins. There are no buffets. Restaurants have dividers between tables and you can request a plexiglass one on your table for you and your companion, if you have one, but that might be an extra charge. The food is really good though, and the staff smiles behind their masks. You can tell by the lines at the corner of their eyes, the way they crinkle together like a grimace, but they are not grimacing, they are smiling. No one will bring a gun here and shoot the place up. There hasn't been a shooting here yet. No need to panic. Everyone is so nice. The guard at the door makes sure you have a reservation and then you show your ID. Although you do have to briefly pull down your mask to show your whole face, but it is quick enough and you can hold your breath while you do it and not breathe in any germs. The atmosphere is dimly lit, not dimly lit to hide dirt, but dimly lit in order to provide atmosphere. You know, a mood, if you will, a calm yet joyous and expansive mood because everyone is glad you're here, but no one is focused on you. You can be yourself. You can be yourself and not get shot by a stranger who hates you or people like you. It is safe here. We are all smiling behind our masks. See, look at our eyes. Hello, I am Marjorie Pagel from Franklin, Wisconsin. Today I'm reading two short poems I wrote one references Billy Collins, the other Raylan, Waylon Jennings. First, reading Billy Collins. I picture Billy Collins in his claw-footed bathtub, reflecting on the long day just behind him, eating a banana that morning, working on a poem, and thinking about the alphabet, the letters flying out of the halls of kindergarten. I leave him soaking in his tub, the water getting cold, think instead about the neighbor boys, twins John and Jesse, embarking on their own kindergarten journey. In the mornings they dash toward the bus behind their sisters, Rose and Violet. Though the school is just around the corner, it's on a busy street deemed too dangerous to walk. The parking lot is clogged with overanxious parents dropping their little ones off in the morning, picking them up in the afternoon. All four neighbor kids take the bus. It's a long day for five-year-olds. When I return to Billy Collins, he has left kindergarten and the bathtub behind, has entered a new poem where he remembers Lawrence Ferlinghetti, how he carried that Coney Island book of poems in his side pocket, up and down the treacherous halls of high school. The second poem is Omaha, Nebraska. I've been there only once, not likely going back, but still that song replays itself over and over inside my head. The voice of Waylon Jennings, an echo that won't stop. Omaha, Nebraska, he sings, you've been weighing heavy on my mind. Guess I never really left it behind. What do I remember? What I do remember is watching son Matt hobble across the stage to get his diploma at Creighton. A dislocated knee from an over-exuberant game of basketball the night before. And later, walking to Boys Town, recalling the worn slogan, He ain't heavy, father. He's my brother. There's nothing to call me back to Omaha today. 
but I can't seem to banish the song. It lingers, the melody, the rhythm, the words and guitar, and Waylon himself singing his heart out. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday Writers Group. I'm so glad you're here to listen to all of us as we present our various poems. I have three love poems that I'd like to share with you. The first one is Moon Singular. It is just past midnight as I stand on the shore of Lake Michigan, this vast, sweet inland sea, big as an ocean. The air is still, fragrant with mist and voyages. Quiet laps of water, the only sound, until a call, a loud question mark, pierces the night sky. Quiet again. Then another call, and another. A loom, nearby, alone. Calling, calling, calling. Urgent, emergent, pleading, solitary calls of a solitary loon. I am alone too, I say. I will stay with you. It's a promise I'm prepared to keep, though the night's nice chill is beginning to seep through my jacket. Though the wind is picking up, though I'm starting to shiver, I will stay with you. I am not the companion he seeks and his heart-wrenching calls continue. All I can do is bear witness to his distress, to his sorrow, to his plaintive cries. Are you there? Can you hear me? Will you come back? That's what I hear in those calls, though I do not know, cannot know for sure. We stay together till first flight, nearly 4 a.m. I'm sure I doze off from cold and fatigue. I hear a new call, not sure if it is real or a dream. The call seems to come from a distant shore. My nearby nocturnal partner of this night sends his call in response, a trumpet, unsteady and muted at first, then triumphant, filled with jubilation, the two calls separated by acres of water meet in midair. The joy is unmistakable. Is it you? Is it really you? I am here. I am here. And with a great whoosh of feathers, wings, tail, my loon breaks the sound barrier, scrapes the stars, blazes past the moon to reach his heart. Erica. In passing. Then, two photographs taken 60 years apart. One of her in her nun's habit, Sister Claude, as she was known back then, medical mission sister traveling down a river in India, ready to provide health care in the most at risk and most in need places on the planet. The other photo, a recent one, sitting in her hospice room reading a newspaper, eyes sparkling behind her ever-present glasses in their simple pewter frames, enchanting oh-so-slightly mischievous smile and bright eyes did not age with her body, remained vibrant, ready to be drawn in, to be delighted, dazzled, amazed by ordinary wonders. And now, now, her glasses, with their broken frames entrusted to my care. Her wisdom, kindness, determination, spark embedded in the metal. Practicing love. For love is a practice too, as much as Tai Chi 
or kickboxing. It does not arrive full born or well understood. It comes unfinished, ready to be experienced, unfolded gently over time in the limbed light of soft patience with the courage of great care. Thank you. My name is Diane Bazella, and um, the first poem I have to share is The Porcelain Cup. One saved porcelain cup, keep one of what you love, the philosophy of moving, no yellowed letters to treasure, a lifetime in pictures boxed, disappeared. No more long walks and fields of wild flowers and planted treasure. No birdhouses or feeders on floors above the first. Nowhere to go back to. An old woman, you, surrounded by what's left, that one of everything, not having made any new choices for this new phase of life, this last one. You venture out, porcelain cup in hand, eyes roam the lounge. You sit on the common port couch, sip coffee poured from the communal pot, escape into a book before an empty hearth. St. Vitus Dance. Those who were dancing were thought to be insane by those who couldn't hear the music. She said she heard it, the music in the middle of the night. The one who came when she called didn't hear anything, said it could be something echoing in the pipes. A million stories reverberate in those pipes. What to make of it or her? Rumor was hallucinations, an elderly disabled demanding husband, a wife who practiced the pelvic tilt defense kept a beautiful young man from her past hidden in her room for a while. One day on their way to the magic chair, the old man kept in the hallway, a tornado swept through, catching the old man's feet, snaring hers as she trailed to help. Two sets of feet pointed skyward, unsettling. He wore ruby slippers. No one came when they called the tornado and his well-defended wife until they did. Take care of my wife, he said, and died barefoot. Nightgown, she dances in the hallway now after dark. When doors open, she asks, have you seen my husband? He should be home soon. I hear him singing. Winter sleep, breathing his name in the mist on my breath drifts before me. All these years longing to see him again, I create an image of youth, his, mine. He comes toward me, sadness fills me up, a body lying in bed waiting for death. Does he remember? Does he know me? Does he ask himself, who is this stranger? A body lying in my bed waiting for death. I push this ghost into a chair, sit with him drinking coffee, make him leave as morning comes. His leaving wounds me with a kiss he does not give, a word he does not say, sadness he does not share. He does not lie to me. He does not speak. He leaves in silence. The last moment. The last moment. The smell of cinnamon. Rich warm colors, purple, red, burgundy. Window open. A breeze over the water, through the trees, into the room, mingling scents colors, soft blankets pulled over my shoulders, 
I dance on a sandy shore, ankles decorated, conch shells, singing sunshine, a leaf pirouetting, heart waiting, listening, soft, warm, footsteps, wait, weightless. Thank you. My name is Maria Elena Scott, and I'll be reading three poems. Marking time long ago. Birthdays in Mexico. No cake, no candles, no pin the tail on the donkey games. Not celebrated at La Guarderia de Niños Orphanage in Matamoros, Mexico. Yearly celebrations, pageantry, yes, of course. Fiestas de guardar, days of obligation, of course, buñuelos after midnight mass, hundreds of them, palm size, flower dough, orbs stretched out, rolled to flat, lightly fried, crisp cinnamon sugar laden pastry, crystal freckles lingered on my face and hands, milagros and votive candles lit, constant pleas for miracles, weekly rituals, mass, Latin orations and incense, when to stand up, kneel or sit, just follow the elders lead. Confession, a menu of sins rotated, white tissue paper doves, gifts of beauty and hope. Communion, memorize the catechism first, open your mouth, receive the holy host on your tongue. Beware, it may stick to the roof of your mouth. I did receive birthday presents in Mexico, however oddly marked by the rituals of a different calendar. Enduring fear, enduring loss in a broken immigration system. What kind of morning is it when you kiss your loved one off to work amid the smell of cafe and maple syrup Again, brushing away the doubt of your return. What kind of noontime is it when with a novella drama blaring on Telemundo, your heart sinks at the thought of your toddler's life without you? What kind of dinner time is it when with anxious eyes you watch the glint of the front doorknob, sit down at the borrowed oak table, por favor, please God, let it not be today home security or immigration, homeland security or immigration and custom agent stage arrayed. Your cold dinner plate sits empty waiting. What kind of nighttime is it when as you get ready for bed, you wonder why today the mailbox did not hold that official looking envelope promised by the last immigration lawyer? What kind of sunrise is it when the cold of another January and the heat of another August witnesses you tossing and turning unable to sleep? What kind of Tuesday morning is it when in a haze, you remember that the glint of the front doorknob did not turn, the echo of your work boots did not make it home, the you are home ritual did not occur to calm your nerves. Your cold dinner plate sits empty waiting Wednesday dinner time waiting, Thursday dinner time waiting, four nights waiting, six nights waiting, eight weeks, 10 weeks, waiting 12 months, months become years. Our son has stopped asking, where is he? Why, mama? And the last poem is titled, Sister Ocean and Me, The Atlantic at Virginia Beach. With feet firmly planted, edge of foam and sand, I caress your horizon, your roaring sing-song, white-capped waves. I wait, exhilarated, ancient rhythm known for childhood. Ballet step closer, touch your bubbling excitement. Trickster wind whips my long, mostly black, black hair this way and that, tickles my happy sun-drenched face. Laughing out loud, I move wisps of hair out of my mouth, step back, watch my footprints erase. 
You splash tag me, what? Whoa, almost falling, but only wobble and scream for joy. I am your beloved dancer. You are my forever romance. Hello, I'm Carol Lee Safioti Hughes. <clears throat> I have two poems today. This is your poem, Rabbit. This is your poem, Rabbit. I remember asking you, was it a coyote? But I knew he would have taken you. I came closer. You couldn't run. I nudged you. There was no blood. Your ears laid back. And I stroked that soft inner space between my fingers. I never thought the wildness in you would ever let me hold you. But there we sat a while, you in my lap. I felt the length of you, no breaks and no leaping away in pain. It was early spring. I remember erasing under your ribs, your chest rising in quick half breaths, the shed door swinging in the March wind. Did you get in there, find something as I pondered the rage of every argument unresolved, stuff to kill still in the shed. Your eyes opened as if to see if I was still there and mine closed as if shutting out the world could make it go away or help you stay in it. And my second poem is called Plain Air. The skyline, hints of a second glass of wine when brush strokes glow and the sun drops low through the pines, pencils against the sky, swift line branches, a haiku hand defines there by the gone, here by the where, wing beats strike across lowering light. As the long rays slip the pale blue grays to the horizon, sheer small sun seeps into the jagged between house shadows and sumac trees, brushing content to bend to ground. Thank you. Language, my name is Barbara Lee. Language is so fascinating. It can open up new worlds or it can make me feel trapped. 35 years ago, I was injured in a car accident and I was partially paralyzed. I was no longer a tab, temporarily able-bodied like most of you. I became disabled, a special person, disconnected from the norm. So who am I now? That woman in a wheelchair? And who is my new family? When I was on my first field trip from the hospital, I was in a special transit van strapped in with four other people in chairs. To break the silence, I turned to the woman next to me. She looked all shriveled and bent over. Her hair was scraggly. She was strolling a little. I felt a little queasy, but I asked her, what were you doing today? She looked up and said, bowling. Oh, <laughs> really? She was actually perky. And then she said, did you walk? Oh, I said, not really. Oh, she said, I feel so sorry for you. I hope you can walk. I was blown away. A month later, while I was still in the hospital, I was there for four months. I was told that some people wanted to see me in the waiting room. So people from Waukesha's ACAP, Adaptive Community Approach Program, who are they? Well, there were several people in wheelchairs and one woman in a power chair came wheeling towards me and said, uh, struggling to get the words out, we have heard about your accident and we put on a bake sale and raised some money for you. And so I'm giving you this check. That just put me over the edge. I didn't know how long I would be in this new fraternity, but 
there were some amazing people in it. I started to take heart. After I got out of the hospital, ACAP asked me to lead some theater workshops for them to create a play that toured the schools. Kate was one of my favorite actors. He couldn't speak, but he could type with two fingers on a board fastened to his chair. Whatever he typed, his language was on a ticker tape. And it was always jokes. <laughs> He's definitely not stuck in stereotypes. Fast forward 32 years. Three winters ago, the weather was terrible. I couldn't take the bus, so I called a special transit cab to get places. The drivers are most often from other cultures, so I try to figure out what they're saying, maybe in Arabic, Hindu, Spanish, Spanish, I'm learning that. And some of them talk to me, and I get their take on the world, on their homeland and in Milwaukee. And some of them I really connect with, like this guy from Pakistan, at first, he seemed really grumpy. So when I gave him my special transit card, he said, I can't take this. I'm like, really, take it back. What do you mean? And he said, oh, just kidding. Oh, well, after that, we were on a roll. <laughs> he tells me, I'm a comedian. <laughs> and he starts telling me jokes. It's all cool. A few weeks later, I called for a cab again. This driver who's really angry, doesn't open the door for me. Then he starts loading my chair and complaining. Anybody else tell you this wheelchair is too heavy? I say, no, actually, they say it's pretty light. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Is he the guy I met before? Kind of looks like him. Is he just kidding? Oh, he's in a rush. He gets behind the wheel while I'm struggling to get my legs into the cab. He says, where are you going? I say, Comedy sports. Oh, you're a comedian, he says. I say hesitantly, I like to laugh. Do you like to laugh? And then he says, I'm a comedian. <laughs> I say, you were just kidding about my wheelchair. He said, next time we get a crane to lift it. <laughs> and we're on a roll again. <laughs> I ask him about his family. He tells me he adopted a little boy in Pakistan whose parents had abandoned him. We get to comedy sports, takes the wheelchair out, helps me out of the cab, opens the door for me and wheels me into the building. Then he tells me, you know, what you've got in my cab, I was really angry. Why well, have to do all this and work so hard? But then we start talking and how you know I was comedian? <laughs> now I'm thinking, I should be thanking God that I have my two legs. I thank you. And I take his hand and say, and I thank you for adopting that little boy and for helping me and so many other people. Later that week, I was going to Sojourner Truth and I called for a cab again. He answered the call. I know you, I can get you. And I bring the crane. Uh, humor and empathy, such liberating language. Thanks. Greetings to you in Cyberwood land from me, Darlene Weisenberg Jeshatarski, aka Ms. RZ, aka Lolly. I have three poems to share with you. First is called Meditation. This is the deep season of the thrice born, the message in a hollow tree, the cloud sweep around her straw broom clearing cobwebs. The fatted calf is ready to be served. Memories float like whispered visions around the table and nobody mentions the dead. Good God, let's eat. This is the sad season of drooping wings, of distractions and gaiety that seek to transcend loss. The blurred words of sky-written gibberish, the scrawled message propped on the brim of the top hat. The dead, the dead ones hover. Feed me, feed me, they croon. 
Only the cheerful mandolin twang blocks their voices. Friends, lift a glass to the mourners, to the keepers of memories, to the hearers of ancient chants, to the venerable mirrors on the road that lead at once in two directions. We will all end up at the place where the three roads meet. And a, a second poem, not quite as morose, for my friend. Walking through a trail of poems, trial of the heart, forest gnomes, candy cane domes, gingerbread homes, yellowed tomes, following the path of a honeybee, peering into a hollow tree, I see a cat and the cat sees me. Weather beaten ball of stripes, spending the last of his nine lives. Blow him a kiss and steal away. Moss on the rock, hole in my sock, keeping it real. Mice at play, last light of day. This is the way I like to pray. And my final poem is called. Pathetic fallacy. That many trees weep, not just willows, I have observed. Wind blowing leaves say, we're off to make some new mulch now. Mother tree waves goodbye with mother sighs. They flutter away like carefree acrobats without a net. Below, the bleeding stump mourns for the rings that will never be. I went for 100, but a butcher came and hacked away. What has become of my thick trunk? I once put forth branches that danced in the storm. I dangled twigs like good luck charms. All this is gone. Wanderer, stoop down. Take a pine cone home with you as a souvenir. Put it under your pillow for sweet dreams. Listen to the song stuck inside it that only sings itself in sleep. It is not the voice of the tree. It is the voice of a sparrow. Habitat, habitat. Thank you. I'm not the killing time. I'm not the killing time. I'm not. I'm not the killing time. But first, let's pick a number, this birthday gift that changes your life for all those boys, for all those young men. Who? Who is I? I am the healthy candidate. I am the willing soldier. I am the one with a favorable doctor's note. I am the one who fled to Canada. I'm not the killing type. Soon I will learn who I am. I'm the one born on September 14th, the number one pick. I went with a case of beer at my fraternity watch party. I went a trip to Canada. I went a trip to a doctor willing to give me a get out of jail card. I am the one who kills. I am the one who is killed. I am a boy. The Vietnam War, 
first draft lottery in the United States is held since World War II. This is the time, and this is the record of the time. Laurie Anderson. My name is Eudemon. That's happy spirit. Or maybe demon. I'm not real, though. If I slap my face, it feels like I am. It feels like I'm real. It feels like I am 21 years old. I have this crystal ball, and it allows me to go forward and backward in time. I was born in 1948, and I look like this in 1969. I will graduate in August of 1970. If I jump in time to 2022, I look like this. But let's stay in 1969, thinking about what was going to happen in 1970. In August of 1969, it was the age of Aquarius, and it was Woodstock, the gathering of the clans, the hippies, the love children. Country Joe was up on the stage. He was a vet. My crystal ball says he sang at Linneman's, always giving the cheer. It's the I feel like I'm fixing to die rag, also known as the fish cheer. With manipulation of the four life fish cheer went something like this. Give me an F. Give me a U. Give me a C. Give me a K. What's that spell? What's that spell? And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. Open up the pearly gates. There ain't no use to wonder why. Whoopee, we're all gonna die. But let's get back to the present. Um, I guess that's your past. I live in a six unit, three floor brick walk up near UWM. We, my girlfriend and I, live on the top floor. I grow marijuana on the little space outside my front window. I watched us land on the moon in July of 69 in this flat. Things were happening on campus. We protested the war. We marched. We rallied. Eventually, we closed the campus in 1970, that was. But December 1st, 1969, that was a special day. The day they picked the numbers, they, the government, and the Selective Service Organization. Where fate is inside a plastic egg. Where fate is inside a plastic egg. Each egg had a day and a date. All 366 days of the year. Yup, February 29th was there too. It was a somber night that night to learn our fates at the, tux the tuxedo bar on Downer Avenue. I lived just around the block. The 27-inch black and white TV was set up so all could see. My friend from Tannenbaum Arms was there too, Jay the Poet. Roger Mudd was on the TV. The drawing was about to begin. The futures of 850,000 young men between the ages of 1826 all around the country were contained in those plastic capsules the size of Easter eggs. Then the drawing began. It continued until all 366 states were picked. The ranking of war selection. Leap Babies, February 29th, got number 285, and that sounder turned out to be a good number. September 3rd got number 49. My brother, that was his birth, that he was going to go. He accepted it, but failed the physical, saved by football injuries to his knee. Doctor told him to come back after he got it fixed. He waited to get it fixed until it did not matter. I got number 250, also turned out to be a good number, but we did not know how high the choices would go until later, much later. Those young men with low numbers, let's say below 100, got free drinks that night, such lucky lads. My crystal ball says all numbers from one to 195 were to be called. But alas, time would tell how this would fall out. But now it was December and then New Year's. Time to celebrate, to join with friends, share food and drink around a tree. O oh, Tannenbaum, hold me in your green arms. This is the time 
and this is the record of the time. Hello, my name is Karen Haley, and I've enjoyed being part of Wednesday Writers for many years. I'm grateful to Woodland Patterns for being part of this marathon again this year. I will start with something rather timely called Drift. I can watch wind and snow, often grand in scale, carve lucent change on the landscape, visible, immediate in this day. While that world shifts in larger ways, my body splays with continental drift in miniature. Skin, bones, and muscle confine gravity to an infinitesimal drag along the lines of elemental accumulation, or more tellingly, the face that looks back at me from the mirror. Untitled. I remember too many suns, too many moons to be sad, Sad for the few clouds that want to gather at the far line of the horizon, like waves more gray than blue, faint tumbling in unfinished memory, thunder still to be heard. Here on the shore, we are as fragile as glass that holds the minutia of lives, lived one drop at a time, stand in unbroken rows, vulnerable to crashing surf, its colors changing in answer to clear light. Not for me to know the time or place to be broken, but I marvel how many still stand, these seeming fragile vessels, well-filled in various and varied ways, but always knowing they are of the sand and sea to be ground to mere essence by those same banks of gray shaded blue that roll uncharted, implacably, unendingly forward. Now something with a little nostalgia. Farm Kid. A position of alone was the way of the day. A parent had no time to be a friend, nor was it even thought. Do not assume that this was a harshness. A sibling was your company, most times engaged in labor side by side, availing of laughter when it could, but sometimes tired and quiet and persistent. A sturdy rootful, rootedness seemingly was grown in that green and on solid ground. And I'll end with something more quiet. Cabin night. There is comfort imparted with simple presence, the quiet dependability of heartbeats, then the quiet itself in this wooded hillside dark, enhanced, not broken, 
by the distant call of an owl, distinct in this silence, gift for my wide awake ears to hear, pushing toward dawn. Thank you. Welcome, I'm so grateful to be here. My name is Virginia Small, and I'm grateful for all of the poets reading, but especially those in the Wednesday Writers Group with Woodland Pattern. The first, I'm gonna read three poems, and the first is an older poem, and the others are, are, are quite new. Cells and Thunder. Wind whips, pine branches whistle, Low thunder rumbles like a slow approaching train. I curl under a white sheath of down, reading C.S. Lewis, observing his grief, trying to get used to my own. I yawn till my eyes draw water. The thunder gets louder and closer. God is rearranging furniture as we explain the heavens rumbling when as children, we huddled for cover. As the body, gnarled and wood heavy, stretches to heal, as the mind scurries to recreate some sense of order, cells rearrange within. Biological furniture shifts to fit, struggles to once again feel at home. Overture, if a fading crone invites you to visit, bring herbs to fix tea, lift it to her lips if need be, be warmed by its heat. Gaze into her eyes and follow wherever they lead. If you feel compelled to speak, ask her what would serve. Do not expect an answer. Try to forget all that you know. And the final poem um, is one that I wrote uh, recently called William's Beloved City in memory of Bill Sell, 1938 to 2022. We crave the simple benches, shade, rest, comfort, thoughtfulness, and breathing. Those are Bill's words in an email sent to those in power in hopes of protecting a sacred grove across from City Hall on May 6, 2019. You imagined a city in which we all belonged and then invited everyone to relish the street ballet to frolic together in parks, to rest within urban oases. You rode the bus through our neighborhoods, often reading a book, sometimes chatting with strangers because all types of stories interested you. You showed up in halls and basements and chambers where democracy might happen because you believed that what each of us does matters, that all voices can and should be heard. You savored markets where neighbors mingled and meals made by friends. You cooked food from nearby farms and your own garden and sipped tea slowly. You studied venerable texts and honored legacies while embracing the cutting edge. You saw no need to sacrifice the old for the new. In your late 70s, you once rode a bus all day and night with other people who want the Great Lakes and all lakes and rivers to be protected from inevitable spills seeping through fallible pipelines. You spent your life nudging officials to build infrastructure to support your beloved community. And to, and to keep our grounds for democracy safe from exploitation or from casual whittling away through neglect. 
you blazed trails and then walked and biked them again and again, alone or with others, taking in everything, seeing beauty in all beings, in grit and grandeur and green. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Judith Chugurewski Gomez, and I'm going to read a couple of poems. The first one is by Jorge Luis Borges, an Argentinian poet, essayist, and short story writer. Um, and I'm going to read my rendition of his poem, Elogio de la Sombra. Praise of the Shadows. Old age, such is the name given by others, may be our time of bliss. The animal has died or almost died. The man and his soul remain. I live among luminous and vague forms that are not yet dry. Buenos Aires, once shredded in the suburbs towards the endless plains, has returned to being Recoleta, the Tiro, the blur streets of Once, and the old meager houses that still call El Sur. There have always been too many things in my life. Democritus of Abdera tore his eyes out to think. Time has been my Democritus. This twilight is slow and painless. It flows down a gentle slope and it looks like eternity. My friends have no face. Women are as they were so many years ago. The street corners can be others. There are no letters on the pages of the book. All of this should scare me, but it is a sweetness a return of the generations of texts on earth, I will only have read a few, those that I keep reading in my memory, reading and transforming. From the south, from the east, from the west, from the north, the roads that have brought me converge at my secret center. Those roads were echoes and footsteps, women, men, agonies, resurrections, days and nights, slumbers and dreams, each minuscule instant of yesterday and the yesterdays of the world. The strong sword of the Dane and the moon of the Persian, the acts of the dead, the shared love, the words, Emerson and the snow, and so many things. Now I can forget them. I'm arriving to my center, to my algebra and my P, to my mirror. Soon I shall know who I am. The second poem is by Antonio Machado, and it's, um, he's a Spanish writer, poet, and this is from, from Cantares y Proverbios, number 16. First, uh, his poem in Spanish, and then my rendition. El hombre es por natura la bestia paradójica, un animal absurdo que necesita lógica. Creo de nada un mundo y su obra terminada. Ya estoy en el secreto, se dijo. Todo es nada. Man is by nature a paradoxical beast, an absurd animal who logic needs. Having created the world from nothing and his peace finished, I am in the secret now, said he to himself. Or is not. Thank you very much. I am Suzanne Rosenfly, and the name of this poem is Musk. I didn't know anything about Elon Musk when I learned he wanted to, wanted to buy Twitter. I hoped he planned to use a worldwide platform to get away from hate and lies, to make people more aware that as stewards of the earth, We've become climate changers for every earthly inhabitant. We've created endless dangers. In the past couple of days, something else has getting, gotten stranger. His name. The only other Musk I could think of was Musk 
melon. And I realized that if you remove the M of melon, you get musk, Elon. And I keep wondering if that's a coincidence. Elon Musk, who are you? Reverse the Ellen Elon and your Leon. Replace Leon's E with an I and your Lion. Is that the I as an ego? Well, it's the I, but not the why. Why would you want to be the richest man in the world? What does that say about you? What do you do with the dough? Do you know where it will go? What's it for? Just to accumulate more and more? Elon, Leon, Lion, Lie on and on and on. Why did you buy Twitter? To re return platforms to the world's most dangerous liars? To reinstate the racists, the haters, the self-haters? Are all of you trying to fill up holes in your inner selves? Were you born or grown with no sense of self? Born bored, grown groaning? What was missing? Was it wealth? Was it no loving fathers or mothers? No power over others? No thoughtful analysis? Just mental paralysis? To whom are you trying to prove your worth, to prove you deserve your space on Earth? What will you Twitter, Mr. Musk? Will you fiddle, twiddle, twiddle, Twitter with empty souls like yours as feral forests burn? Become another Nero. Or could you make your life take a drastic turn? Turn your Twitter in a climate change into a climate change clock. List the daily devastating events worldwide the resulting fatalities on every side. Twitter, Twitter, TikTok, TikTok, instead of a Nero, you could become a hero. You could save the world. Do you have the get up and go? You bought the perfect setup. Supposedly, the richest two or three percent of people on earth own half the world's resources. So you'll have to form your own summit. Since earth has already begun to plummet, but maybe it's not yet time for earth's demise, yes, you might have the time for your own twin Twitter summit with your friends, the billionaires who have the assets and with the finest climate scientists who are already devoting their lives to saving life on this planet. Elon, Leon, Lion, lie on and on and on. You must deliver the truth and cast out all lies. Keep in your mind, your riches are useless if earth becomes ruthless, so ruthless that no one survives.
Winter Apple by David White. Let the apple ripen on the branch beyond your need to take it down. Let the coolness of autumn and the breathing blowing wind test its adherence to endurance. Let the others fall. Wait longer than you would. Go against yourself. Find the pale nobility of quiet that ripening demands. Let winter come and the first frost threaten. And then wait one morning to see the breath of winter has haloed its redness with light. So that a full two months after you should have taken the apple down, you hold it in your closed hand at last and bite into the cool sweetness spread evenly. So that you taste on that cool gray day. Not only an after reward of a patient's remembered, not only the summer sunlight of a postponed perfection, but the sweet inward stillness of the weight itself. Hello, my name is Ed Wurstein. I am the East Region Representative of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets. And the fellowship is very happy to be hosting this hour of the Woodland Pattern Marathon. If you're interested in the fellowship, you can find out about us at wfop.org. Hello, my name is Ronnie Hess. I am co-president of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, which is happy to co-sponsor this hour of Woodland Patterns Marathon. I'm going to read to you from my new chapbook, Tripping the Light Ekphrastic um, by Kelsey Books. And the reason why I'm reading it is not to promote it other than buy my book, buy my book. Um, but because these poems would not have come to light had it not been for WFOP. And um, the women in my poetry writing group who are members of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets. Um, so I am very grateful. And with that, um, let me start by reading um, the first poem in the collection, which is Art Lesson, after Stephen Dunn. A museum guide once held my underarm and my sister's, ostensibly to point out light and lace, the details of 17th century Dutch paintings. C'est fou, he repeated several times. She and I were young and nubile. He pressed his fingers into our flesh, pulled us around the exhibition rooms. We were too shy or good to think the worst, to free ourselves, and painting's loveliness kept us in thrall. We nodded, learned, art is not what you expect, brings you to the cutting edge of the canvas, leaves wounds. And um, something else. In rereading these, I realized how um, how they're all um, they really are wounds. So this is um, reflections on George Alt's painting Hudson Street, nineteen thirty-two. Dare to smooth over it, iron out life's complications. These earthy reds, this structural simplicity. 
Familiar buildings, neatly lined up, streamlined, synchronous, alliterative, floor by floor, windows dark and blank, brownstones without drama, water towers dripping no leaks, smokestacks belching no smoke, streets without people, the gritty landscape of the exterior cleansed, leaving only what you would make of it. There is no confused child, head in curls. There is no blood on the sidewalk. Here, no police, nobody jumped. Mrs. Figueroa wasn't stabbed to death in her fourth story apartment by the distraught man she had refused. She was so near to God, top floor, the skies, three perfect clouds. And um, I'll close with the last one, which is based on a photograph by Lindsay Adario in the New York Times. It's called A Portrait of Flight. A friend sends me a photo of the cover of the New York Times, dateline August 13, 2021, Kandahar, where the Taliban have reached the outskirts of the city and a family is getting out of harm's way. Five girls, and you assume their mother, have packed their most valued possessions. A duffel bag is strung over one of the girl's shoulders. A large box sits on another's head. But it's the youngster on the left of the frame that grabs your attention, her head covered with an aquamarine scarf trailing to the ground. There's a flower on the right shoulder of her navy blue dress. She's looking directly into the camera, and in her arms, a scrawny spotted brown hen, its feet tied together so that it won't fly. Who knows where they are going or what will they find when they get there? One thing sure, the hen is capital, currency, sustenance, something to get up for in the morning, to believe in, like a kind of religion where you can honestly believe in miracles, even peace. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'd like to say thanks to Woodland Pattern um, and to the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, whose uh, hour I'm reading in. I always enjoy coming together in this space. Um, and it's so nice when we're able to be virtual to see people from so many different places. I'm C. Cabasta, um, and I'm coming to you from Mineral Point. Um, I'm going to read a few short poems. Um, so the first one is new, and I don't have a title for it yet. So it may be terrible, but we'll see where it goes. In a recurring dream of my hometown, some shop I've never been in before, but this time it's all my things. Childhood mementos and clothes I thought I'd lost. But when I put them on again, I'd grown thinner and taller and cannot see my reflection in the mirror's frame. When we were splitting things, I mentioned that I'd never been able to see myself in the kitchen mirror, too short. And you stopped and stared at me as if you were seeing me for the first time. That mirror had been there for more than 10 years, attested by the rhyme of dust I'd never cleaned. Never married, so there was no celebration. So no divorce, but it was 22 years. We're careful to never get too angry or too mean or too sad in each other's company. You have a small hand surgery and call to report once the stitches are out. The feeling hasn't all come back, but the surgeon reassures you it will. The nerve doesn't like to be touched. This one is called Poem About Ending Friendship. When you trim the branches and limbs off a tree cleanly, it leaves perfect O-shaped scars that look like little mouths caught open. Poem about how Jay always calls it. After several days of no fish fishing, there's finally a single walleye on the stringer and we can't decide what to do about dinner. So he hangs it off the side of the pier until later. 
She looks up. That's like locking a girl in the basement. As the day wears, he checks it. And even after we've moved on to another menu, he leaves it for a while, says he's teaching it a lesson. Poem about the time you were almost a fairy tale heroine. Mostly sand and mostly smiles, and mostly you remember it fondly. But recently you saw a tweet that said something about odd things that happened when you were young that now you know were fucked up. He was a photographer, he said, and you were beautiful, he said, and he'd love to take your picture, he said, and he gave you his card. You don't remember what he looked like. In fairy tales, people transform, often with kisses. Beasts into princes, frogs into princes. Maybe the photographer was a prince or a beast or a frog. But when you said, I'm 15, he turned back into a man, said, I'm sorry, and walked away. And then lastly, performance art for middle-aged women. She swallows bees, one only, one at a time, closes her mouth and lets it bump and travel the soft places inside her, mouth to belly and back again, esophageal flesh all pink and wet and glisten. Sometimes the bee stings, depositing its bitter toxin, strobing heartbeat and blood running. Sometimes the bee does its disoriented dance and dies, small body intact, still owning its barbed stinger, only harmed and not harming. Open the soft space of your body and invite pain in. Imagine the crazed flight, body full of danger pheromones. A cloud of confused hives surrounds you. And not one of the bees, she army comrades able to find the source. Mouth shut tight, breath held. Thank you. Thanks, Woodland Pattern. Hello, my name is Marianne Hurd, and I live in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, and I'm going to read four story poems. Uh, the first poem is Sunflower Yellow Gem Corn Hoop Dancing. I was in New Mexico a few years ago, and I helped cook it up Pueblo Feast Day, and this poem came out of that time. I chop celery, cabbage, potatoes, feel the heat of Orno's first fire, watch the miracle of dough becoming bread. No in my bones, not in my ears, the blessing of the new domed adobe oven. Listen now how the drums, the hoop dancers draw circles in my waiting heart. And the pale old grandpa, gone too young Tino, hoop dancer extraordinaire, gives me corn. Sunflower, yellow gem corn, slips the kernels into an oily old popcorn bag, instructs me, take them back to Wisconsin, plant them in the light, where his grandson will grow, taste the sun, dance again. This next poem takes place in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City in 2019. Uh, purple orchids and Agent Orange. A Ben Thon Market, a flower stall holds orchids so purple, so blue, so pink, you believe you've landed in a rainbow where everything kind is possible. Down the hall, a butcher lays out livers, brains, hearts. A young man rolls by, his four-wheeled oversized skateboard propelled with splayed backward hands a foot born in reverse, and only a stump below his knee. He looks up, smiles, bright as any sun, creator of rainbows. You wonder about forgiveness, the vendor's fish, its forever accusing eyes. Uh, this poem is braiding his wife's hair. I was a hospice nurse most of my working life, and I 
uh, watched an old man braid his wife's hair and it really uh, kind of broke my heart braiding his wife's hair. Her hair just whispers now, hardly enough to braid, but he tries hard to keep the tangles from scattering her already tired mind. Sometimes she sits still, lets his fingers soothe her. He thinks she might remember lying with him, a pine needle floor soft beneath them, an evergreen scent they thought would last forever. Before a storm drenched them hard and cold, still occasional dew come morning. Uh, the last poem is Even Dead Fish Become Roses. Uh, I listened to an old couple tell me about their early courtship. Uh, it was a really hard time in their life. She was on her way out with cancer, but they still had some memories of some pretty amazing times. This is at Even Dead Fish Become Roses. She remembers in her last days as cancer slipped through a back door, trying to steal whatever was good. But memories sustain her of a time relishing second chance, lust, even love, and how she and her man lay on Onion River's bank, joining muck and grit with unexpected kisses, then rolling onto the carcass of a stinky dead fish. An explosion of guts and almost pee in your pants laughter, taking too many mean years into something so sweet, even dead fish become roses. A way she learned and would never forget to love the flower and the bramble. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. I'm DeWitt Clinton. I'm broadcasting from the village of Shorewood, which is a block north of Milwaukee. I'm reading from a new book, Hello There. I'm reading a couple of long poems, which I favor. This first one is Goodbye in Case I Have to Go. If I had to leave immediately, unexpectedly, as I have to go now, no time to even pack, I'd want to say how much I enjoyed all of you. From top to bottom, every day, all with everything else we've ever done, but I did want to say, and don't take this like you will, which you probably will, but next time perhaps we should have more dogs and fewer cats. But that's just what I've been thinking about as I'm rushing out of the house, not even realizing that I'm not going to ever be rushing out of the house anymore, ever, as I'm about to be exited, as someone might say, or dusted or mowed down or simply passed over. And now I'm even wondering what the heck is passed over supposed to mean? But then it doesn't really matter, does it? As this is it, sweetheart. And I only hope all those walks we took outside our little hotel in Florence or even on the beach in the Yucatan, well, it was fun, wasn't it? Of course I have to go now as I'm not even expected to know what to expect, but something dreadful is going to happen. And if it doesn't, I'll be forever grateful that I may have even one more moment with you. But that's asking way too much, knowing what may have already happened without even knowing what's already happened. I know, as this is probably a goodbye, though I really didn't mean forever, just until dinner or drinks sometime this evening. Here's the second poem. You're a lovely neighbor down the street. She's always cycling by. We wave and talk a little bit. This is a title poem to this collection, which is called Hello There from, uh, from Word Poetry in Cincinnati is the publisher. Hello There is the title. The elder of our tiny neighborhood cycled by just in time for neither of us to know who said what, but then it doesn't really matter, does it, as we're on our way to somewhere. But now that you ask, I'm not even sure where we thought we were headed, but certainly headed somewhere. You and your fancy white new outfit, me in a pair of dark pants and a pink shirt, off to a meal to share with someone, though we still don't know who that might be or how well the night will go. But isn't that pretty much how it goes most of the time we set out on a drive to go somewhere, even if we don't know exactly when we'll arrive or even leave, or worse, not ever arriving back where we started this evening when the old one down the road waved us by. 
And the two of us barely had enough time to look up to see who it was that was so kind enough to wish us a simple hello. But then none of us expected to sit down on the curb and hear about all the suras passing through each one of us. And for the most part, it's probably better to keep on moving, trying not to stop, to figure out what in the world just happened that will make our tiny lives even more miserable than they were yesterday. But somehow, that's the pulse most of us have these days, pushing the old misery back as far as we humanly can and hoping a friendly voice who doesn't expect anything in return lifts a voice that's barely there anymore as she pedals away on our old road, lifting her wobbly arm once again. But now she's fading into the end of the day. And then you ask, who was that? Oh, that's, she's down the road. She lost her husband a few years ago. Even so, we see her fading away in the evening light, almost gone, hearing in the distance something with a wave and a sweet echo of, Hello there. Thank you all. Hi, I'm Sandy Lindo, and I'm reading to you today from Menominee, Wisconsin. This first poem is from my collection, Chasing Wild Grief, and it's called After Mary Oliver's Wild Geese. Grieving reconsidered. Let go displacement, the harsh cries of the goose lost from familiar flock. Seek soft when hard scrabble paths obstruct your animal life, and you limp doggedly, thinking of the flight two take together, lifting into lightness your arms encircling ease from long practice. Embody now the strength those flights have given. Love now what brightness is offered, what sings of simple kindness in autumn night. It will not be easy, but it will get easier. Loves will come as grain left after harvest. The next poem is called Tree Trimming, and it looks like this. The angel at the top never looks entirely comfortable. Maybe it's her closeness to all those Santa's sugar plum ballerinas, rocking horses, teddy bears, and other gaudy baubles of Christmas materialism. I've tried to assuage her by adding more stars and two herald angels, trumpets to mouths. But she says that if she had her druthers, everything would be white and gold. I say, Go back to your meditations. Christmas is for everyone, the pagan as well as the ethereal, even for one whose only gifts are empty, festooned packages of grief. Eyes closed, she smiles. Reread the Tao. In emptiness, there's potential. And the last one from this book is called Powers. Danger. Due to operation of the generator, the water may at any time change quickly from low, quiet to high, turbulent. There will be no warning. January dazzles thaw. Whirlpools roil from the sleuth below Red Cedar Dam, where hydraulic rapids pulse. Saucer outward while crisscrossing power lines diverge uphill as trail follows riverbank and winds under the timber trestle bridge. Below sun dogs the river, white water ripping around the rocky man made island, old snow shrugging to the ragged shoreline where one tree bent horizontal still bears a sun struck ballet of flirting ice fans. Above, an eagle cleaves a piece of sky while startled wood ducks formation fly and one woman dances as if alone. The next poem comes from my chapbook, The Island of Amazon Women, and it's a woman warrior's poetic guide 
to breast cancer and recovery. And this is called Once. Once there was a poem that would not be written, but languished like bare boughs against a dirty water sky. Once there was a poem that could not write itself, huddling in a hollow beneath gravid rose bushes, hunkering like toppled tundra, where street sounds were muffled and the light was dimmed by a month of no more good lines. Once amid a muddle of matted stanzas, it slept the sleep of the restless, muttering incoherencies, tepid trochies, anemic anapests, absent I ams, drifting and melting a February blight. Once there was a poem that could not write itself. I had to grab it, prop it, and hold on tight. Heidi ho, humdrum, hallelujah, marching it into the light. And the last poem I'm going to read is new, and it's called Reaching. In the soup aisle at Walmart, I'm looking for comfort. Too many suppers eaten alone with only the TV, while film clips of war, epidemic, and vitriol roll endlessly in front of me. Perhaps something creamy served over biscuits, I muse, when three little boys interrupt my reverie. Could you hand us some chicken and stars? The oldest one beckons toward the red and white striped sip and go microwave cups on a high shelf next to me. How many, I ask? Three. Well, of course, three. Three for three hungry little boys whose mother is probably waiting for them in the line at checkout 13. Here, I say, enjoy. We will, the middle one replies, and they scuttle off around the corner, their heroic quest complete. Suddenly, some barbed wire barrier has shifted, isolation dissolving in a moment of human connection. What about me, my inner child asks. I nod and reach for the stars. Thank you. I'm going to read two poems this afternoon. Uh, they're both from a manuscript that is filled with weather and gods. And the two pieces I'm reading are in a section that opens with an epigraph by Wallace Stevens, which reads, the people grow out of the weather. The gods grow out of the people. This is titled Joseph Cornell. Begin at paragraph six. Oh, sphincterless bird, he is my Gertrude Stein. Birds resound in ice, take down times. In Earth's atmospheres, geomagnetic substorms, blowy, wise moans. Begin at paragraph six. In tool, snow lights, episodic chokeholds. Afternoons in Flushing on Utopia Parkway, Joseph Cornell spilled birdseed on the kitchen table and opened his windows to allow birds in. Evenings, he would turn his oven to a very low temperature and put his whole upper body in. He was rain's subjunctive, thankful for Oreos, and monastic basements, lip sinking light. Ugly does so rhyme with lovely. He aired modernity's certainties. Ugly does so important lost thing. Airborne, Joseph Cornell liked the international house of pancakes. Airborne changes air. Imprinted with Coney Island happiness, the least and best of, and Buffalo Bill's wild west spectacular, he, celestial, navigated with birds, dropped one aquatic blue marble into a freshly washed aperitif glass, boxed shadows, glass, grave, lights. The 
the next piece is titled Think of Basho. And it starts with an epigraph from Basho's The Knapsack Notebook. Within this temporal body composed of a hundred bones and nine holes, there resides a spirit which I think of as windblown. The boy who early mornings swam with trees and clung to them like they were poems and herded them into shore is gone. Bright leaves skim the lake, geese fly low, tracing the shoreline south. Under shelf clouds, a tug pulls a double M dash across the horizon. Warnings of coyotes are taped to lake trees. The single eye wanders solitude, the dangerous naked eye. He said, keep your eyes peeled. Nights, the sanctuary of stars with their oppositions and conjunctions habit sky. Do you speak a second language? I speak star and wild aster in place for the time being, the earth opens, I put poems in to hold my place. More soon, I say, yours are quick, catch your breath. The earth opens for all of us. Think of Basho's late life restlessness. Think of Basho apologizing to his older brother for dying before him. Happy 2023 Marathon, everyone. Hello, my name is Ed Wurstein. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. First poem is called Think About This Now, and it starts with an epigraph by the poet Mark Strand. You live between two great darks, the first with an ending, the second without one. Think about this now, how the sun is always simultaneously rising and setting somewhere, how one now is always becoming then, just as the next now appears, how all this has been said before a million times, only that now, this now, it's your turn, and then it too quickly becomes someone else's chance, always now becoming then, as the sun seems to circle into a new time zone, when in reality, it is us circling into a new now, now, now. Sense as memory. I can see her in the sound of the word doily, mom's mom, hand on a crochet hook, wire rim specks perched on the bridge of her nose, and dad's mom, I conjure too, whiff of boiled cabbage putting me back in her kitchen, tall Maggie stooping, her gnarly hands on a tin of molasses cookies to offer me one, grandpa at the table trying to parse out the little English he could read in the story she's interrupted to feed me. Maggie, then what happened? Mom sings to me each time I hear the Andrews Sisters or the Glenn Miller Orchestra. And I can imagine dad riding that Farmall H tractor rusting in a field I pass by. The way my fingers on your skin bring back the eagerness of my youth. Caution, the contents of this poem are hot. Mishandling may result in serious burns. To remove this poem from an oven or microwave, the use of an oven mitt is recommended. Open with care. The contents of this poem are under pressure. Refrigerate after opening. Due to the risk of injury, including possible suffocation, do not place this poem within the reach of infants or children. The reading of this poem is not to exceed 20 minutes. If experiencing shortness of breath or dizziness, exit this poem immediately and seek medical attention. 
Do not read this poem while under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Do not leave this poem unattended in airports. Refuse to read poems offered to you by strangers in airports. Report all suspicious poetic activity to the proper authorities. Wear a seatbelt while operating this poem. Exceeding the speed limit while reading this poem is illegal and will result in fines and a loss of points on your poetic license. Do not attempt to read this poem without first reading the owner's manual. Doing so will invalidate the stated warranty. Use this poem only as directed. Serious or even fatal side effects may occur. The most common side effects include ranting, punning, doggerel, triteness, and obscure references. If you experience any of these side effects, consult your state's poet laureate immediately. Ask doctor if your heart is healthy enough to read this poem. Seek immediate medical attention if reading this poem causes an erection lasting more than four hours. You may cancel your subscription at any time and receive a full refund. Just return the unread portion to your local library. Call within the next 10 minutes and receive a bonus poem at no extra charge. Just pay shipping and handling. You may exit this poem at any time. A hand stamp is required for re-entry. The poet accepts no responsibility for injuries resulting from reading this poem. This poem was written by a poet who consumes peanuts and undercooked eggs for external use only. Upon completion, lather, rinse, repeat. And I'll close with this poem. This is just to say that I have eaten the moon, which was just hanging there like a crescent roll and which you probably were saving to inspire your next poem. Forgive me, I was hungry. It was not very cheesy, but it was cold, extremely cold. I spit out the flag. Hello, my name is Catherine Yetz, and today I'll be reading a variety of poems. My first poem was published by Woodland Patterns during April Poetry Month in 2015. It's called During the War and is inspired by Brittany Sanchez's photography, which is shown. Spring had left us restless like crocuses crouched in the grass. The sound of airplanes brought us home every night, rustling through the backyard to a wet porch, flood lit by the kitchen window, the sky washed out denim, stalling before the stars came. We stumbled up the wood steps and the whoosh above made us cover our ears. We were young and our eyes rolled up like in death to look. We were young and knew nothing of disaster or a longing for home. We were always home. <clears throat> could smell our stepdad's vodka before it hit the glass. The planes flew just above our roof, so close we thought we could just reach and grab a ring. My next poem is called Remember Rivers, inspired by Allison Townsend's The Green Hour. I remember the water's murk and the mossed rocks on shore. Childhood called but I did not answer, left the tadpoles be. The algae on the surface, as green as any hour swirled, and the water striders capered on the surface in the current. The fox was alive with spirits that day. A lost friend turned as her butterfly flittered around my foot and landed. I'd yet to feel true grief. Memories flooded the shores, and I tried to net them in stanzas, but there were no words that could convey the nostalgia of the sky. So I simply held them inside myself to save for a day I would be trapped in thought and wish for nature to engulf me in moments lost. My last poem is partly inspired by Lorraine Niederdecker, has no title. Brad, the moon lies flat tonight, not its usual sphere of marvel and mischief. So I wonder where you are in all of this wholeheartedly mundane existence of want for wisdom, of hope, 
holes with black centers that wander across the surface in misunderstood rotation. Brad. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Annalisa Finka with the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets. This first poem is titled, Wherever You Are, Look. Wherever you are, look out the window. Please let there be a window. At the sky, at something green if you can find it. This world can't exist just to grind us down. I refuse to believe it. And if I'm wrong, at least let me be ground down, not by concrete and rulers. Let me be crushed under the weight of a mountain, the sight of a storm, and the towering lightning-cracked redwood. This next one is called Lake Michigan. Beautiful iceberg scar across the land, love is always dangerous and deep. One moment, your toes are curled in cool sand, the sun warming your forehead. Then, without warning, the current comes. It's no use trying to swim back to shore. Whatever strength you thought you had, this requires a different kind. To see safety and not reach for it. To strike out instead along the coast, deep waters and the sight of land, Hope and fear and exhilaration curled up together in your chest, if you are the kind of person who falls in love with a scar. And this one is listening to the snow. Go to sleep, go to sleep. Let us cover up all the harsh edges of the world. Let us settle over the dead and unburied, let our deep drifts pile against your gravestones and erase the dates and then the names. When you think of one, you think of all the dead. They are no more separate than we are. Listen to what we show you, this white silence. Go to sleep, go to sleep. This next one is titled Resurrection. We are the only ones who would be surprised. Days, months, years, no matter. Your dog would run to the door, barking, tail wagging. Your cat would trot forward, winding between your ankles. Like every time you came home from the store, juggling bags of groceries, or came back from work at that same familiar time. One day you leave and don't come back. But what is forever? Why shouldn't I go on as always, stealing glances at the door? This next one is titled North Seven Night Bus. Living rooms glow like beacons as we pass through the dark outside, the barest glimpses of lives, lives, lives. And suddenly I'm filled with warmth. I want to go, I want to enter each one like a lonely ghost, filled with fondness for these strangers and their places, televisions tuned to who knows what, walls with shelves, pictures, photos, souvenirs or goodwill knickknacks, couches chosen for comfort or for looks, all passing too quickly to truly see. Love is easy at this distance for ghosts, for the dead who gather outside our windows, where even on the coldest night, their breath leaves no trace. And I will end with a poem called The Fool. If I could paint, this is what I would paint tonight. A great black dog leaping across the sky, body stretched the way a dog's body stretches in the moment during running when all its paws have left the ground, the moment when it decides against gravity, but instead to reach for the full moon, take it in its jaws and hold on tight while the stars stream off its fur like water. Now I see there is a person, too, standing on its back like a circus performer, arms outstretched for balance, a wild grin on their face. I am not the performer, not the dog, the moon, or even the painter. Yet here I am, standing in the moonlight, grinning like a fool.
Now, why do we read poems? Here's a thought. We read poems so we can repeat them. We read poems so we can repeat them. We read poems so to live as poems. To build from thought and song a home. We read poems so to live as poems. And this last night was to be a poem. I have no name. I am but two days old. What shall I call thee? I happy am. Joy is my name. Sweet joy befall thee. Pretty joy, sweet joy, but two days old. Sweet joy I call thee. Thou dost smile, I sing the while. Sweet joy befall thee. Oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. There is a happiness that morning is, just is, just on its own, outside the hiss and song of whatever serpents and larks are playing throughout the chambers of our hearts. Valley of Things. Hang your head when you walk. Yesterday's news is greener. To survive, ham with ideas of a common holiness. Decisions to make about what's going to siphon off your thoughts. Fuse giddiness to the citizen elective, creature by creature. When a very young child throws down an object, it's beautiful to watch. They don't know about the value of thingification hanging over the river banks. A good poet prays to nature. I brush out tangles during graceful animal hunting season. Sometimes we hear a crush, figure out a daily schedule, read tortured philosophers, Listen to James Booker on repeat. Black woman on a plane, 21st century. Minutia in a bowl, jury rigged hand in need of a drink. The fly attendant said, it's on me. I must have looked like I needed one. Such a rough climb wobbly as the sun during Leo season. Come to find out a brand new plane is hot to handle. The first breath, crucial, coughs. My favorite path of looking winds up when I'm in the air. There's no way to vacuum seal death up here, I suppose, even though I've never felt the urge to buy a traveling pillow. If something develops, if our machine defects, I'll ask if I can hold the hand of the woman who gave me a drink. Then it's time to land like nothing happened. The captain standing at the door with his crew. He's younger than I am, a baby-faced white boy. We don't know his name or where he came from. Prayer sonnet. Sewn up again in a data harvest meadow, moving through me as pelvic bull thunder. To learn how to laugh at their indifference, revenge of the chattel is not being shown in any of the popular art houses. Blood heavy is the iron binding us together. Public wordplay is called getting dragged. Violences of daily metaphor, 
in our very real world, these solvent metaphors are true. Hell investigates life with great opportunity. My little candle mouth kindling for the wounded when the stars are committed to the worst timing and no one wants to get out of bed in the morning. Jamais vu state of mind. When you keep repeating a lie, people will accept it as truth. But underneath that feeling is a merciful border that never existed, splitting the familiar stone tablets when we grind our teeth at night and wake up in the morning tired. There's a lot of work to get done Love and devotion are strange deities who are notoriously indirect with their instructions. It happens when you focus on somebody while walking, the trees straining towards each other and past the flailing villages made from our kin. They're playing a funny game about me. Wonder if he felt the noose tighten or the rope burn. Wonder was he manic or caught unaware when the oncoming storm arrived as expected. Was his mind present? When the grim reaper arrived, gaunt and inexorable. The graves lined the marketplace, the riots have moved between the pews, red lights are meaningless, rappers get fed to morticians like popcorn in movie theaters, and I heard a white lady cop murdered a black man in his own home eating ice cream and got a hug and a Bible out the deal. They are playing a funny game above me. Better man with a better Jesus who forgives them for everything, even when they did it on purpose, even when it was premeditated, even when they laid in wait, waiting to devour any passerby while I watched my cousin grow ancient behind cement castles that defiled the distant skyline. They would, wouldn't dare put the ships for slaves near the shoreline. Looking at them, these fools might notice their fate. It all sounds ridiculous. Before you turn to face the firing squad's applause, with no breaks in your attention, just the death you have been promised delivered right when it was supposed to arrive. It all was written. The ballot box can't be stuffed enough to change the outcome. Outcome the charlatans, politicians, and poets begging for your money and praying for their pockets. Never noticing the holes in the family's patchwork, can't work God into a poem without condemning him to judgment, can't see the forest for the service to the service revolver solves that problem. You can tell God to his face all he kept from you they kept from you was really looking at your situation, breathing without smoke, just being alive inside the moment and recognizing who you really are. We are falling for the jugs, sacrificing our virtue for victimhood. In my hood, being smart makes you the enemy. Being clever somehow makes you slick. And goons and goofballs lead each other into conflict, shooting each other over places in line at Walmart. It doesn't seem as funny during the broadcast as it was during the rehearsal. Doesn't seem as important dressed in jet black, staring at the Auburn accents in the coffin lining. Seems like being wicked is exonerated. Being ruthless and unforgiving celebrated the Willie Lynchman giggle while we caught away father after father over false pride, fear of failure, and fragile egos till the moon full of blood breaks out its flashlight and we must face the moonlit night. You can't undo death, can't remix or reprise your final exhalation. It was, is, and always will be exactly what it is. That's that point. <clears throat> Called Fear God. Fear God. Fear God that he might desert you when your hunt for a savior repent, lest Christ climb down from the cross unwounded and the corpus be made useless. Fall from the savannas of my ancestors, walk in the tracks with the satanic conjurings of my own vanity. Convinced the valley shadows look familiar. Death is eventual, but a righteous man would tear the tongue from his throat to keep from murdering the light in his brother left here in his care to resurrection. Pity the man without mercy. 
calm as advocates makes an accounting and the good die mostly over bullshit, but the evil die slowly more often than alone. Do not envy the hell they photograph, even when it looks like vacation destinations and deeds of sale. The mountains remember other men called them theirs. These lies are common among small mammals who hoard what they can never eat, like storehouses can keep away the darkness you cannot buy time. Only stays of execution. But the judge who wrote the sky has no reprieve for you to appeal. There is no lower court or change of venue. Be careful in your wantings that they do not corrupt your mind. Drink more water and mind your own damn business. Your sister's safety is your business. Keep her safe and feed your children love like breast milk because long after the ducks have dried for drinking, your seeds will need love for growing strong and survival. Notice the sun who reigns in the sky but commune with the moon for she is far closer and more likely to hear you. God is far closer than the moon or the sun but we have lost the custom of speaking to the unseen so scream to the celestial bodies you can keep track of and fear God. Far more than police dogs and bureau agents his jurisdiction is absolute, and though his mercy is endless, do not test the depths of the water, because in drowning, there is no escape. Fear God. That's that. Hi, I'm Angie Trudell Vasquez, City of Madison Poet Laureate and Chair of the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission. Coming up in this hour, you will be hearing from current and former members of the Wisconsin Poets Laureate Commission, Poets Laureate of the State of Wisconsin, and poets and artists who make things happen across the state and in their regions. You will also hear poems from our new State Poet Laureate, Nicholas Gulig, just named on January 14th, and our outgoing State Poet Laureate, Dasha Kelly Hamilton. I want to let you know the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission is comprised of many different organizations. We are not just one body. From our fiscal sponsor, the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters, we are so grateful for their ongoing support and help in this work, and the following member organizations. Council for Wisconsin Writers, Wisconsin Arts Board, Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, Wisconsin Humanities, Wisconsin Center for the Book, Right on Door County, and the Chippewa Valley Writers Guild. Together, we are the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission, and every two years, we select the new Poet Laureate for the state of Wisconsin. We are all volunteers coming together to make this happen and are so thankful for the support of the community and our partners, and of course, to be here at Woodland Pattern today. Woodland Pattern is one of a kind, a unique and wonderful resource available to all of us, the entire state and really the world. I'm so thankful you're here listening today and supporting the arts. We need your support. Many of us write in obscurity a few of us get published. Sharing poems with you is the best. Connecting through words, connecting through art, being together in this holy space, something we created out of breath and language is magical. Welcome to our hour and please be generous in your donations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Gulig. I am the current Poet Laureate of Wisconsin, and it is an honor to be reading for the Woodland Pattern Bookstore's Poetry Marathon. I have just one poem to read this afternoon, and it is called In Our Gardens, Forests Are Prepared. In our gardens, forests are prepared. Our being here together is the night-struck violet plucked from an edge-blue curve of air. The light does not absolve us. Because we named our children in the shadow of a failing garden, the white rose listens. I love the thousand names of you. 
Every morning, our daughters sleep beyond themselves in day glow. The house grows quiet in their wake. To the place where you should be, I lash the ache of every brightness I've disfigured. The years that we have left. Bury with me the bottom half of fence posts in the yard. Pack the loose dirt harder. These days, I'm beginning to believe that I belong here. Because we chose to raise our children in the center of an empire, the low grass glistens in the west wind. At night, the sky edge finds us staring at our hands. It is easy to forget we left a world for this one. Thank you for listening. I think of you in flavors. Wild berries crush beneath my tongue, trailing tart ceilings across the span of your shoulders, skin just salty enough beneath this sweet jam. We are trading recipes, basil and mango, bittersweet boundaries dusted with spells and cinnamon. I swallow your sin and spit back extract. I think of you in exotic extracts, dabbing invitations against my wrists, vanilla hazelnut abandoned, thick like syrup, lacing the patterns of my tasting, rich, potent, and dangerous the way I think of you. Hello, Woodland Pattern Marathon people. Um, my name is Jody Vandermolen, and I represent Wisconsin Humanities on the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission. Us, unwritten. Late at night, my mind insists on thoughts of love. Tonight, my musings come in three. One, you, I've tried to convince me, now cast aside in brutal truth. Moments need this thirsty sponge looking to get soaked. Two, Labyrinthine ball dragging me one step behind in the maze. The turning and the turning and the turning spun out, pinball popping from plunger, then whack, then whack into a tunnel, and whack, then back again. Gutter that reliably waits. Then there's you, mannequin across the room, hand upon your chin. Then Pinocchio, you come to life, duck out before the photo op, trip into backwards wormhole history woven by me. The two of us, undying, sitting up on deathless beds, preceding grandkids lifted off laps, their unbirthings, preceding unweddings, disengagements of our respective kids. With many, unsentimental untoast with a side of not corny at all. Photos unsnapping on a loop. Our two bodies exit dance floor, unentwining. Our fingers, the last ones to go. Back further still, gravity. Unthrown graduation caps snapping back into place on two heads, no tassels, some nine years apart. Cut to uncut, pineapple right side up cake for two. Topped with backward swirls, smooth, cool prairies of untouched cream. And somewhere, you, not showing up on my doorstep, no flowers, that non-moment you came to me right now in this exact unwritten line. My cheek that now undampens 
your brow that unfurrows, these tears I now uncry. Back to you, across the room, mannequin, hand upon your chin. Back to me, not in the rain, without an umbrella, unrushing to a gig, never having yet first seen your face. Seven haiku with titles. May 2021 to November 2022, passed in the blink of an eye, right? May 4th, 2021, normalcy. After school chatter, today's topic, puberty. Giggles, fifth grade spring. May 25, George Floyd, one year gone. 929, each tick, then it's talk. Lost ourselves as he was lost. June winds, show us breath. Cut to fall, October 26, crunch. Another rough patch, blowing leaves that won't rake still. Pile them, collapse. Skip the winter, on to April 5th, 2022, invocation. Sheer force willing it, we offer bounding dogs, fruits, you. Spring, show yourself. June 28, four days after Roe. To whom it may, force this motherhood, we confront, decide, then bleed. You cringe, run, decree. November 8th, election day, again, bay keeping, wide mouth blast that clogs your pores, winter shield, this pen. And November 15th, first big snow turned. Finally, it feels over what's been blanket thrown, forced fresh winter's dawn. Thank you. Wishing you all a great 2023. Here in the amiable dark, Whatever I want, I can outwalk. William Matthews. Here in the amiable dark where we live now, alone or in couples or with dogs or plugged into music only one at a time can hear, comes this quelling above the lethal math of plague and dearth of love. Amid the new ruins and ransacked history, where the same familiar beast with a different mask is always slouching. Above the daily count of final breaths, we console ourselves by knowing are not ours, persuade ourselves are other and elsewhere. Here, in the amiable dark, where we are walking tonight, the cadence of sidewalks rising through the circuitry, climbing the stacked and loaded dice of the spine toward the blood-rich fields of the brain, that drenched bouquet of electrochemical flowers, which is no more singular than the mind is singular, the way reefs and constellations are never singular, as pity is never singular, though each holds a portion trembling in a cup. It's a bottomless cup we carry where even walking alone is never really alone, whether walking toward or away from. They're still walking for company and pity and mine here in the amiable dark where we live now. Social distancing. Say there came a pandemic. Some news drunk virus set its hooks in us, and only the sky for a nurse arced and empty and barely even blue, and only the musical pulse and the several senses for consolation, except for a stream of distant words like waves bearing the rush, curl, and foam of elsewhere arriving, the distant rhythm of others 
to bridge the gap between head and heart, dark and day, fear, and whatever it is one feels on the brink of when walking next to great waters. How the surf catches and releases the light, and the waves and bones tremble like the distant cousins of constant thunder. We know salt tumbles eventually from ocean to body and back and forth. We know it takes ages to regather the shaken self into the good world again. I remember a ritual once where hundreds of tiny basket-like boats were launched and lit with prayers and flowers and misfortunes, ignited and cast out on the water until the whole bay was a blaze, a rocking constellation of human woe, uttered in small tongues of flame. Until little by little, they drifted, burned, blinked out, and then it was just dark water again, and we all went home. Did our troubles never return? Were we really less burdened or better people? What I mean is, sometimes worry needs to be ignited, launched into words, if only to blaze a while among flotillas of sorrow we thought were ours alone. What I really mean, of course, is keep in touch. Even if you don't know what to say, especially if you don't know what to say. Kind words fellow castaways, mind-lit emergencies of fingertip and tongue, float this festival of downtime and distance. Repopulate the dark with your fledgling human light. Greetings, Lisa Vijos here, Poet Laureate of Sheboygan. First, I wanna say thank you to Woodland Pattern for hosting the marathon yet again, and, and for all you do for poets and poetry. And today, I, I wanna honor my dear friend, the poet Michael Rothenberg, who passed away on November 21st, 2022, at the age of 71. And along with his numerous publications, Michael, in 2011, with his partner, Terry Carrion, founded the worldwide movement known as 100,000 Poets for Change. And Michael was an amazing force of nature, an amazing person, poet, activist, organizer, and a friend to so many poets all over the world. And, and he brought us all together. Um, so we miss him and we will miss him. But I want to read two poems. The first one was actually written way back in 2017. And I, I was visiting Michael and Terry in at their home in late in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. They live on the, um, the edge of Lake Jackson, which is a um, prairie lake. And so the poem is called Poem for the Passing, and it starts with an epigram from Michael. The epigram says, when the heartbeat and pulse of the inevitable Lake Jackson are no longer a marshy bother, I too, with any luck, will disappear. Michael Rothenberg from On Lake Jackson. You're getting it all wrong, my friend, because no matter where we go, we never completely disappear. I have been learning this the hard way as one death after another weighs down upon me this past year. Old school friend, vibrant work friend, dearest poet friend, three mentors in one year, and my father, who left almost four years ago now, which seems like only yesterday. I'm telling you, no one who writes, paints, teaches, cooks, breathes, or dreams ever disappears completely. Because of marks left, seeds planted, roads traveled, and even when the ocean washes the last footprints from the face of the beach, the sand remembers who stood there and who carried the smallest grains of it away to other shores. And then 
the second poem I want to read also for Michael, I, I wrote it, I started it this past summer after talking to him on the phone and he wasn't feeling very good. And um, he told me a story about a blanket and um, that's what the poem is about. I finished the poem though, after he passed, it was, I was having trouble finishing it. And I, once he had left us, the poem came to an end. So it's called The Blanket of Immortality for Michael Rothenberg. We go back a long way, you and I. On the night we met, you were words on a screen and a picture of a man in front of a sunflower who said he was looking for poets, 100,000 of them, to organize poetry readings, to share words, words of change. I answered the call and we became friends and words became threads that held us. For 12 years, you brought a world of poets together every September, floating up their words to make many skies, one sky, many dreams, one dream. You had a dream to make the world a better place. I had a dream to help. There was joy along the way and never ending sorrow, grievances, uncertainties, and a long list of injustices that had us screaming for change. Not for ego, never ego, but to make a difference, to right the wrongs of this world. Now you are gone, but not gone. Not here, but here. Cancer took your body, but not your words. Before you left, you told me a story of an alpaca blanket that you bought in Colombia when you were 20 and wide-eyed, brimming over with the music of the world. That blanket carried you, kept you, sang you to sleep, and made you feel as if you could live forever. So much easier to believe that at 20 than at 70. But the story is that the blanket was destroyed by a chance toss into the washing machine, then the dryer, all this done by a well-meaning caregiver who offered to buy you a new blanket, not understanding that it was not the blanket that mattered, but the dream that it embodied. And now you have taken on a new shroud, one we will all wear each in our own time. Wherever you are now, I know you will meet the soul of the alpaca and thank him for the wool he gave. He knows you loved him for the blanket he became, just as the world will always know you and love you for the words you have become. December 1st, 2022. Michael taught me to date your poems at the end of them. So I did that in his honor. So thank you all for listening. Michael, may you rest and rise in poetry. Hey everybody, my name is Frisia and I'm so happy to be here with all of you. This poem is called Resurrection Lilies. Some say it's unlikely a queer couple would live on this block, so small town quiet that fawns sleep in the empty lots and yet we are here, of course, across the street from a flag one notch away from insanity, from neighbor kids sidewalk bicycling the whole shimmering summer, from lilies pink and rich as the inside of fruit, and non-binary middle schoolers asking to pet our dog because Merlin won't say anything but love. People say it was just kids when someone wrote, you have a gay penis with their finger in the dust on the pane of our front door, they forget once we were just kids too. Last summer, when my partner drove me through her hometown, pointing to the field behind the high school where they hosted marching band practice, the green pond with its bird-stepped scum, and from the road, the parsonage she grew up in, my God, that yellow house. I felt that we were resurrection lilies, us queer people, awake again and open on every shoulderless road in a country that believes we die on the coasts and are never born anywhere at all. We were back this year and taller than you'd think. The second poem is called, A Student Asks, Are We Allowed to Write About Abortion in This Class? 
Because we are made of light, because we are grabbed and taken in the water of our blood, because it was a grove of pines that told me you must, because we bleed with and without, because my boyfriend back in college, bad as he was, offered to lend the money to a friend because I still don't know if that was a lie or the truth, because I found myself that fall in a house of worship because from the boats we heard the otters barking for their kin, because my great grandmother could not be a professor or a poet, but she could give herself an abortion. Because when you cut a yard tree down, you're left with the work of hauling it out. Because we walked outdoors to be with each other, to heal ourselves. Because the cicada's drone runs through our bodies and we are strong, so quick and smart, the air lifts into our ears. Because another student said writing is like meditation because there is so little I can do to keep my students safe. And that is why I must teach them to be writers because it's not a matter of finding your voice, but sharpening your life like a knife. Because any night is a night for a poem about abortion or a cracked limb or pressing your fingers muddy because we are deer disappearing into the woods. Thank you, Woodland Pattern. This is Dr. Seuss's The Telltale Heart. That heart, that heart, that terrible heart is beating and tearing my mind right apart. It beat the same beat, this telltale heart, that it pounded while I pried his darn chest apart. Now they're here and they know and they're sniffing around, pretending they don't hear that terrible sound. Sanity unraveling with every new pound, their vision eyeballing and searching the ground. You see, I was smooth when I plotted his death. I had expert timing control of my breath, and I dreamt of his eye as I plotted my plan, because he had to die by my tender hand. And you can say much as you call me insane, but I've never had tighter control of my brain. And as they came to my squeals, were called by my screams, ignoring what was real for rosy-eyed dreams. They looked all about as I sprang with a start, startled by the pounding of that sinister heart. Six things my father taught me before he died. One, nothing is permanent. Two, loved ones will always leave you. Three, there is always a new way Someone you can you care about can hurt you. Four. Blood means everything, or blood means nothing. Five. Even the best moments can fade in the sun. And six. Sometimes it's already too late. This next poem is called One More. Um, it's based on Sofia Chiodo, which I um, was able to see at the um, Racine Art Museum. Uh, I really enjoyed the piece and I wrote a piece about it. Sofia has heard the venom in your Groundhog Day words. Knows days like the back of the moon, so rarely kissed by the sun, every river has run salty from cheeks. Sophia has filled a necklace of ears with all the opinions of what she should do and what she should be. Meowling cats repeating the same calls, pretending to be the fates. But most of all, Sophia blazes forward like a comet flown free into space, too happy, too driven for small souls like us, too used to talking about whatever she isn't.
This is an, an untitled piece. She lives for Tuesday. Agreed to terms, feeds day after day to the same demon. She managed to acquire a day of rest, a chance to re-knit the twisting of her arms, the fraying bone matter of her legs, to give her a second of relaxation, to purge the purgatory that crawls into her legs, all too eager to beg for non-existence. She lives for the knitter's circle, a breath between beats, the occasional volcanic eruption of laughter so hard she catches ashes of it in her memory days later, so very noisy she can't hear the winter's howl of her loneliness. She considers more cats, not yet defined by them and the assumed insanity of anyone willing to gather so many of them in one place at one time, she wonders if the hunger of twenty bellies, the prodding of forty paws, will claim her with nuzzles and warmth. On Tuesdays, she knits blankets no one uses. Will just be donated to goodwill if she forces such gifts upon others. She imagines a world where each of her blankets warms the toes of family and friends alike. But she knits anyway, knowing in this world her blankets will only be there to help strangers one day identify the body. Thank you. Intercession. There are patron saints for archives in Arkansas and advertisers, against dying alone, for backward children, boxers, and boys' choirs, for birds and breastfeeding, for cancer patients, pastry chefs, and good confessions, for country girls and criminals, against cold, for dancers, the recently dead, and dentists against sudden death, for engineers, exiles, and evil spirits, against eating disorders and enemy plots, against earaches and earthquakes, for fathers and fugitives and forgotten causes in Florida, against frenzy, for gas station workers and guards in the Greek Air Force, against gout, for hostages, hangovers, and hardware stores, against sick horses and hair loss, against hesitation, for inquisitors ice skating in the cooks of Italy, against invaders, bacterial infections, and infertility, for jailers and jurors in Jackson, Mississippi, for Kings, Kentucky, and Kalamazoo, against losing keys, against lightning, for librarians and lawyers, for mechanics and musicians and mail, against mice and mad dogs, against fear of night, for New Orleans and news dealers, for obsessions and old maids and Ohio, against oversleeping, for plumbers and pawnbrokers and parents of large families, against poverty, for queens and quartermasters, against riots and rats, for rain and against rain, for silence, for bomb technicians and medical technicians and television writers, for reformed thieves and test takers against twitching, for ugly people and uncontrolled gambling, for victims of apoplexy, betrayal, child abuse, drowning, incest, jealousy, kidnapping, rape, spouse abuse, stroke, torture, and unfaithfulness, against vertigo, for working people in West Virginia, against bad weather, for expectant mothers, expeditious solutions, and excluded people, against explosions, for New York and young people in general, and one for each tiger crouched in the zoo, stared at by children with no one to pray to and nothing to do.
Restoring the Prairie. Hope is a flounce of goldenrod arcing over a stem of purple asters. A bee nuzzling blossom to blossom. A proliferation of tiny white petals centered in gold. One solid orange line across the wings of a black butterfly. We walk unpaved trails, crisscrossing these 90 acres of restored prairie. Hope is your naming the beauty I pause to admire, though I didn't know its name. Between our knowing and all our unknowing, hope grows. Of course, above and beyond the 1840s house whose roof and chimneys I see, on the rise of a knoll, branches sway, leaves flutter in the wind. In the sun, the undersides of leaves look like white lilacs. Of course the greens meet over that the quaking aspen lighter than the oak. Of course, the house is shorter than the trees. Of course, branches. Of course, leaves. Of course, steady. Of course, wind and nearly invisible trunks. And of course, roots which I cannot see at all. Hello, everybody. I'm Marilyn Taylor, and I live in Madison, and I'm delighted to be even virtually at Woodland Pattern because it's such a wonderful place. And I want to thank Angie Vasquez right away, right off the bat, for making this whole uh, reunion possible. I have three poems to read to you today, and uh, the first one points up the sort of difference between doing a reading online and doing a reading in person. And I think all of you will pretty much agree that uh, in person is best. But anyway, regarding that differential, I have a poem here called The 70 Somethings in the Workshop, which I really think are the best poets on earth. Breathless in their quilted overcoats, the silver haired contingent now arrives, shouldering their zippered canvas totes stuffed with recent cuttings from their lives. They claim they can't recall a single line of poetry, but soon they're reeling off entire chunks of Frost and Gertrude Stein, Malay, McLeish, Penn Warren, Nemiroff, and finally from three ring binders lift their own bespattered pages, creased and smudged with fierce self-edits, like a sacred gift to lady, to lady for the others to be judged. While Pound and Parker, Bishop and Jarrell smile down upon them, wink and wish them well. Uh, the second poem I'll read today is called For Lucy who came first, and you know the Lucy I'm referring to, the one who was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 by the um, Leaky organization and uh, who may have been the mother, literally the mother of us all. And Donald Johansson, the paleoanthropologist who found her, said she simply settled down in one place, right where she was in the sand of a long vanished lake edge or stream and died. <coughs> Excuse me. For Lucy, who came first. When I put my hand up to my face, I can trace 
her heavy jawbone and the sockets of her eyes under my skin. And in the dark, I sometimes feel her trying to uncurl from where she sank into mud-bound sleep on that soft and temporary shore. So staggeringly long ago, she had not yet cut, time had not yet cut its straight line through the tangle of the planet, nor taken up the measured sweep that stacks the days and seasons into an ordered path. But I can feel her stirring in the core of me, trying to rise up from the deep hollow where she fell, wanting to prowl on long calloused toes to see what made that shadow move, to face the creature in the dark thicket, needing to know if this late spreading dawn will bring handfuls of berries black as blood or the sting of snow or the steady slap of sand and weed that wraps itself like fur around the body. And finally, I'll read a poem that's far more contemporary. It's called Before Row. Donna, terrible story. Everybody said she must have gone and gotten herself pregnant after one of the high school track meets. She always went to them, you know. And the boy, guess he stuck with her anyway. Although the people who showed up for their instant wedding said he didn't look at her, not even once, not even when he mumbled out his vows. They say his dad got him a decent job, something to do with selling appliances, but everybody knew he was really an athlete, you know, a sprinter, could have won a scholarship to Penn. We never saw them out together, but I'm told he bought her things she didn't even ask for like a brand new Dodge Dart and a fancy washer dryer combination from his store. Hadn't she heard about those places where the Lord helps bring girls like her to term and the boy can still go on to college, but no, miscarriage. That's what everybody said, even though they found her in that very Dodge once they unsealed the door to the garage. Thank you. I'm sorry to end on a bit of a downbeat, but that poem is an important one, at least for me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Angie Trudel Vasquez. I'm gonna read some poems for you. How to Write Absence. A hollow cobalt vase, a bottle universe, dirges sung at your funeral. Chiseled gravestone markers, one plate at supper. Rugged wheelbarrows still, purple iris bloom short. Violet carpets cry out for your footsteps. Silent moth wings drink at night from the bird bath, take turns with the bees. Fireflies, crickets sing. Ants plow tunnels underneath. Worms creep, churn dirt in their wake. Tonight, we forget our worries. Spoon sleep sound, kick up blankets, tug sheets. Cold at night, we lack insulation from the deep freeze. The earth hums, hello, goodbye, gracias, go to sleep. Agile light streams bend the glass. Gold orange dream halos circle the bamboo floor. You laid, new homeowner, with fresh knees, broad back. We wax for years with bare toes, feet, padded slipper soles, pet dander. Filio dust fills the cracks. Now you stir, feed the mew cats. I cry five minutes max. Anticipate your absence. No smooth torso flush smell at dawn. Write the scene where you come back. This is called the wonder chair. Stars die, black ink constellations, vast dust clouds vanish, sprout, seed earth, ancestor dreams among cornfields, stony graves, tar pits, 
water caves forgotten. Merry sweat, tears leak mountainside, spill violets, daffodils, rise with the humid air, become dark matter. Molecules invisible float past the blue earth crust, sometimes land. We spin half blinks of history, skin cells regenerate, a million plants breathe, the body anew, veins root. Gravity calls the spine home. We stand on two legs, stare at night sky, sit in the wonder chair. We are all God's poems. When you pray to the silver maple, arms across its bark body, cheek against grizzled wood. When you drink from the water faucet, lined up after recess, your friends look pursed in glory, clear stream bubbles between flesh and chrome, sunlight highlights, brown hair, small limbs. When you dance at a summer festival, the band cues a holy drum roll, a sax bellows bluegrass blankets, winter toes relish spring, green blades tickle ankles. When you breathe the scent of cinnamon, candy your papa bought to cover tobacco breath, coffee, the scent of wet wool warms the spine. When you let the mother of four go ahead, take back the cart for a stranger. When you pick up park litter, the critters left behind, stretch for the high pieces caught to evergreen branches. When you break for a squirrel, release the mother raccoon with her babies in a forest glen outside the city where creeks run and river pour fish. Where oak roots mingle, spread gossip beneath our hiking boots, our footprints. This next poem is called What and That Part Five. Five. You, me, in our sleep bodies take the dirt road through golden prairies sand dunes open our wings step off the cliff dive into the cyan sea our birth cradle come up for air this last poem's an old poem on the question of war to agree would be to give up life relinquish the rain pitter-pattering on the leaves and the gorgeous trees with roots so deep they must be what holds the earth together. Thank you so much. I'm Angie Trudell Vasquez, Madison Poet Laureate 2020 to 2024, and I am so appreciative of Woodland Pattern and all you give to us poets. get some food started but you're putting in the garbage disposal yourself why don't you just call a plumber it's an easy process it is yeah. i've got some rice soaking do you want to uh chop some onions no <laughs> what can i do besides chop up onions <laughs> <laughs> let's take a let's take a breath and okay. think about the the Big picture. Which big picture? Of getting something to eat. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> How about some mushrooms? Onion, mushroom, rutabaga. I've got uh, some late fall produce from the garden. If you're willing to just chop some things. Why don't you chop the onions? It'll take your mind off of this thing. Let me just start this rice. Oh, you have rice. I've got some rice. What, what kind of rice? Uh, it's a nice Indian basmati. Okay. I mean, onion will be good. I feel Which like one? it's a good onion day. Maybe two. Two onions? Two onions. You know, I can't. 
I'm not okay with it. You asked me to do it. I don't love it. Now really? Hey, Paul. Hey. How are you? Come on in. Hello. Good to see you. How are you? I'm okay. Okay, I stop by. It's I mean, always I'm okay, but it's not a quite a typical day. In okay. The I just kitchen. turned on the water to rinse these off. It's broken. The sink is broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not draining properly. That's why it stinks. Wait, am I, am I smelling it? Hang on a second. Come on in. I'm sorry. Evan, this was... Oh my. I heard good things about Milwaukee Kitchen and I thought maybe I'd come and take pictures of some of the beautiful food. The rice. That's all we have. Oh my. This isn't good. How'd you do that? Like I washed it as you're supposed to, yeah. and then I pre-soaked it, and I was supposed to add a little more water. Can you make this look interesting? I don't know if it would look that great. <laughs> 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 it's the smell that's so nice. Can I feel like we can make it work. I think we should call a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could continue chop onions because it makes you happy. <laughs> <laughs> it does smell good. Somewhere my, my Japanese ancestors are, are frowning on it on your right. Mm, do you like to cut up onions? Uh, I'm terrible in, in the kitchen, but I'll, I'll try. Okay, so we have onions. Got some garden That's tomatoes. Oh, my <laughs> My knife skills are terrible here. No. I like photographing food and chefs and restaurants, but I'm rarely actually trusted with cooking it. My wife's a great cook. Uh, You're lucky. Very lucky. It's a well played, as they say. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> I'm not sure how well the burnt rice was photographed, to be honest with you. Do you want these diced, like small? Does it, you have to speak to the chef here. <laughs> Come on in. Find the right place. You have found Milwaukee Kitchen. Is that Pedro? Marcy. Great to see you. It's been so long. I know. Oh, you had mentioned Kevin. Yeah. 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 Pedro. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. His music could be great with Milwaukee. You're a musician. Mm -hmm. I am. This is a piece I recorded at the beginning of the pandemic called oh. Post Momentum. Can this music we somehow revive? Burnt rice. Burnt rice. Let's go make fried rice out of it, I suppose. How do you feel about cooking? <laughs> I wish I was better at it. I have, uh, I have a few dishes. What's your go to dish? My go to dish vegetable uh, madras curry. Yum. Oh, nice. oh, yeah. Maybe chop another onion? Would you be willing? Yeah, I'll join the <laughs> onion chopping party. Yeah, yeah, this is like a rite of passage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the knives around I... here are always thick. Oh, look! Oh, no. Hey! Hi, hi. I brought my friend Anana. Well, it's a little chaotic in today, but... What's the smell? Uh, we burnt rice. Please, come on in. Hi, Ariana. Hey. Hi, Kevin. I'm Anana. Nice to meet you. Anana? Anana, yes. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Kevin. Kevin, nice to meet you. What's your name? Marcy. What genre of music do you do? Uh, I try to jump all around, but, uh, I like jazz, uh, electronic, noisy, weird. Hip hop, whatever you know. Very I love nice. music, all types. Like, so I love yeah. to hear your music. Do you have do you have recordings too? Yeah, I do. Cool. Yes. Are you gonna play some now for me? Not now. I don't know. Is that why not? Right now. Is that okay? Is it
may not taste good, but we can make it look good. All right. <laughs> yes. That's why I love that is the Milwaukee <laughs> kitchen. That is the Milwaukee kitchen spirit. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> or maybe we should just make a new batch of rice. Okay. Yeah. And I just need to get this cleaned out. Oh, wait, um, but. Do you have a hose outside? How are you doing, Ariana? You just had a big talk that you gave I this did. week. Yes. I did. At the University of Milwaukee, um, Peck School of the Arts, I had a little artist talk. Nice. You can find it in the archives. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, was it enjoyable? It was, it was. You know, you always just, like remember the things you left out. I like specifically had a mural, the mural I did of, of you and Anna in there, and then I think I coasted over it. <laughs> Where's the mural? It is 30 Clydemore, I think. Okay. okay. You always bring the good energy to Milwaukee Kitchen. Yeah, I was looking to celebrate with a delicious meal. <laughs> <laughs> I think everything looks great. The rice, the veggies. You're coming around to the rice. Yeah. I like that. I like it. Uh-huh. I think... I mean, Kevin and I were just talking about it, how it has texture. Yeah. And if we stir-fried it quickly with this, uh -huh. we'd have a feast. I mean, it's definitely artistic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you have any butter? I do have some butter. That helps. Mm -hmm. Flora! Hey! Oh. hey. Oh, is that Flora? <laughs> Come on in! Well, it's any really better now that you are here. Oh, good. Yeah, I thought this might help. You sounded really, really stressed out. I was oh, really stressed. Uh, Laura, you're a hero. Pizza! Yeah. The day is a star. Um, there's a really nice little eat again. Where did you get those pizzas? At a, at a Sapphira. Oh, oh yeah. that's, oh, that's, that's my favorite. favorite. We have. Oh, my a couple pies. Thank you so it's, it's much. It's all vegetarian. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Look at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, Mom. Here it Yes. Wow. Now, the question is, yes. do we need to make it right. easy? Yeah. Everybody oh, relax. I like. You are very welcome. Who are you, by the way? I'm Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, Kevin. And, and you are? I'm Pedro. Pedro. Yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And I know Ariana, where are you? And My are you? name is Anana. Anana. You yeah. deserve the throne. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> save the day. Wow, this is good. What's the origin of this thin, very thin Milwaukee? Where does that come from? I think you save money when the bread's thin. Oh, maybe really? that's why. <laughs> I think it's a gangster thing. I mean, Milwaukee yeah. Italian communities are a lot from Sicily, is that right? Sicily? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Packer crust. It's delicious. Good. Oh, we can have fried rice for breakfast tomorrow. There's such a divide between people who like thin crust versus I think thick. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love all the pan. You like all pizza, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. School pizza. I'm not buying at all <laughs> pizza. <laughs> Even the pineapple. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. good. Oh, yeah. So where do you guys usually get your pizza? Mm, I usually go to Topper. That's my favorite. But Anodyne and Bayview is really good. They've got the brick oven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks really good. People get kind of spicy about their favorite pizza joint and they won't go with you somewhere else. They, they, they gotta go there. Not me. I don't have okay. <laughs> I like most pizza. Really. I'm pretty sure I like all pizza. Mm -hmm. I'm from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are some pizza spots. We did a pretty good job on that pie. Yes, yeah, quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
I can't wait to come back. Greetings, Woodland Pattern. I'm Brenda Cardenas, and I'm reading my poem, Shipping and Receiving. Sick of fumbling with lunch sack, purse, umbrella, mask, keys, and the two-ton backpack overflowing with unread essays, laptop discussion posts, poems caught in the jammed zipper, I slam it all down on the kitchen table and declare to the dog that I quit. I will never again work anywhere that sends me home to work even harder all weekend long. End of story, period, punto, ya. I decide to shift careers, go into shipping and receiving when I find my feet in thick-soled boots on a cement floor, pencil behind my ear, clipboard in hand, colossal rolls of packing tape and boxes, large as coffins, small as keys. When I raise my hand above my head, semi-trucks turn on their engines, roll into formation. My clipboard clamps one end of a scroll that drops past my feet, trails me around the warehouse like a tail. And so I ship. Every essay current and future students will write, paper clips caught in their corners, to a grading factory in Antarctica where workers are hungry for words. My email and all social media accounts with their humble bragging to the ether from whence they came. Parking tickets, alarm clocks, blue light and dry eye, long lines and loud commercials to the island of irritation. Foothills of snow at every crosswalk to Tampa, Dallas, and Orange County, specially packaged with a dozen stalactite icicles to hang from their metal awnings. Light pollution to the darkest corners of hell, air pollution back to the factories that produced it, estimated arrival well after third shift has bust home. Our mother's arthritic knees, swollen ankles, and bulging discs on shooting stars to Pluto, where pain's roots shrivel in the dark, never to bud. I send cancer to its crabby constellation, where cells heal in each other's light. Politicians to the world's largest library, where books finally shut their fat mouths. Macroaggressions, microaggressions, all our isms I zap back two million years so we can choose to evolve without them. Stop and frisk, billy clubs, choke holds, bullet holes, knees on necks to a police state that lives only in our history books. Hunger to pastures turned gardens, row upon row of corn, beans, squash, carrots, potatoes, onions, tomatoes, lettuce, let there be lettuce. Special delivery, the right wing to Alcatraz, where they must read and recite critical race theory while bowing to unions who've rescued them from 12-hour shifts. All pandemics and their anti-vaxxers on an Elon Musk spaceship to a distant zombie galaxy about to be devoured by its starved cannibal neighbor. The itch I cannot reach to breeding mosquitoes so they can tear open red bumps in the middle of their own backs. I consider shipping 
the mosquitoes as well. But then remember dragonflies, bats, birds, fish, frogs, turtles. And instead, I order a crate of calamine lotion. This I will receive. Along with a black and white dog named Maya and the human I love who walks her in healthy forests awash with birds, bear, fox, deer, berries, moss, and mushroom spores. A comfortable bed, books, blankets for all, students who whisper their poems in my ears, a cup of cinnamon tea, a mug of Belgian beer, butternut squash, sage, basil, ajo, clove, canela, cominos, tamales, tomate, sopa de tortilla, sopa de papa, many pachangas, muchos mariachis. Every instrument and its music, tiny sculptures blown together by wind, fresh water, endangered languages and species in multiple shipments, all those killed for their color, their culture, religion, poverty, for the one they love. The 81 women murdered by men in 28 days, all of them alive again. Con mis tías y tíos, abuelos y primos, mi papá y hermanito, a flatbed full of sempasuchil to light their way. Visits from ancestors, visits from stars. Muchas gracias. Hi everyone, my name is Elias Sepulveda. I'll be reading a few poems today. This first one is called Abuela uh, Socorro. These violet fleas, audible memories from summer entries into Abuela's home, the wind lavenders interrupted by a swung cancel, ese cancel, rot stealing rust, its leeching azaleas now break. Mariposa de mar, mareas, his portrait floated in a bowl of toloache and we climbed until we didn't. You said we are mountain people. Witchcraft lifts these heavy songs and curses. That gate open to violent debris these words carry you. I'm guarded. <clears throat> this next piece is called uh, Ikebana. <clears throat> he was like us from a, from a place far away and out here. The broken rivers leave us, our bodies breathe maladies open to the rain. Our bodies, units for pollen songs. The arrangement for black and brown deaths is ready-made. Baltimore, Chicago, East LA, statistic, corrido, heap. In the place far away and after the cane fire. Charred limbs of sugar cane are unlaced from the earth, bundled, packed into pickups. Campesinos hack at any left standing. Enough arrangement and scattering can harvest a wound. This next piece is a religious apparition in Los Angeles. In the young weather's light, the body closes land voices. A brief city swollen with bone presses against the window glass of veladoras. Each fever lit for those who carry walls through summer Love speak after strange water and offer. Marigolds fall from limbs like mine. We chant in heavy skins and again sing the cycle of melancholy bulls. The apparition of Afterstone exhibits set to here, appear. Here the concrete canvas of the holy image. There is a weight in a dream if enough pollution can pull. There are caves in a mouth in each a corresponding darkness disappears you. And my final piece today is Maquiladora Daydream. She sees herself falling through the diseased light of woven circuits as she presses red, black, white snakes into motherboards assembled by madres. 
The migration of electricity is copper, skinned like her grandmother's palms, rising from generational tilling of fresh soil, lifting the desire for lightning through the performance of this ritual. Like a colony of pixels holds an image of the deceased, the village carries portraits of saints, biblical figures to the top of an ancestral hill. Her home screen is a picture of that grandmother before wounds. Her grandmother crystallized mid-dance deep in the Sierra Madre. Their village does not stop responding in the vicinity of random bodies around her. Through quotas, rework, and overtime, somewhere the land is played, dies, and it appears at various spawn points. She can't live in these memories. A boy drowned yesterday. A strange bobbing just above the broken surface. She could only standardize, think of the indefinite metric volume of water. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mauricio Kilwain Guevara, and I'm wishing you all love and connection in the coming year. Here are two poems, the first in English. The second poem is in a bilingual format, first in Spanish, then in English. Breakfast for Siwar. Thank you for coming to our feast and small fire last month. Thank you also for answering my question about the tenderest words for grandmother in Arabic. Tita is the one I chose. Let it be my first step with you in our journey across the Levant. The sun is ever rising in Bayview as in Amman. Janet's in Brooklyn and you in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're all connected by love as by the mastodon. I spent the morning thinking of glass frogs in the Ecuadorian Oriente, broods hidden under leaves above the stream, the males guarding upside down, booming over their clutches until one by one they hatch and drop into the slow moving Yaku. If one fully grown were on your fingernail in the sun, you could see the etc. of the egg mass and looking down through the core, her heart, tiny, dark, pulsing. This morning, I cut the first zucchini from our green bed beside the garage, sauteed it lightly with oil pressed in Tunis, crushed garlic, cracked black pepper, kosher salt, sides of hummus and ajvar, all of it carried to my mouth on a wheel of warm pita. Why then should I have felt such loneliness? The band of sun had settled on my neck as my dog circled the buzzing he heard in the light blue morning glories. The upturned bell of coffee was in my hands, steaming, while the fly honing its legs to taste and clean reminded me, nervously, to be grateful for the last marrow. Esta mañana en Costa Rica. Bajo un cielo estrellado de azul añil, volaron esta noche los 21. Amigo mío, no siempre damos con el poema, caballo o vaca. Hay veces que pasamos hambre de leche o sangre. Ahora una ha fracasado ya por dos noches, y ella moriría 
y dejarla morir así, con todos los otros buches llenos y cercanos, sería una aniquilación, una locura de la cual los murciélagos vuelan lejos. Esta mañana, en la cercanía de una tranquila finca, en una cavidad de un árbol, ella, quien ya ha fallado dos veces, está siendo alimentada. Es el regalo de la sangre prestada, es la bendición de la calidad compartida. Sí, yo diría, es familia. Amigo hermano, deja que este poema cuelgue de tu seso boca abajo. Deja que el cambio nos permita volar fuera de nosotros mismos. Pido esto, que resuene. Que resuene. This morning in Costa Rica. Tonight the 21 flew through a star-pricked indigo sky. My friend, we don't always find the poem. Horse or cow, sometimes we go days hungry for milk or blood. Now one has failed two nights. And she would die. And to let her die with the other bellies near and full would be annihilation, a craziness the bats fly from. This morning near a quiet finca in a hollow tree, she who has twice failed is being fed. Mouth to mouth, it's the loan of blood, the blessing of shared warmth. Yes, I think I would call it family. Human friend, let this poem hang in your brain upside down. Let it change us to fly out of ourselves. This I would ask. Let it echo. Let it echo. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Pettis, and I'm thrilled to be reading for Woodland Pattern. I'm going to be reading from my book of poetry, What Flies Want, um, which came out in May of 2022 from the University of Iowa Press. Um, one of the main concerns of this book is how uh, children and adults even learn gender and gendered roles. And so I'm going to read a few poems that have to do with that. This first one is called Before I Learned to Be a Girl. I used to howl around the eaves, a wind unwound. I used to bridle like a groom atop a stallion, cowing pirates into spilling bullion. Never buckled like a shoe, but shooed the shorn beyond the barn so I could hoard the golden fleece. I fleeced the flock, a picky phoenix culling coppers from their pockets. I pockmarked concrete castles with a fist. I frisked the guards and gunmen. I manned the gunwale, gunned down the siren song until I heard my sternum thrum. Wound my way around the capes and through canals, threading narrow courses like a needle, needling all my naysayers and needing nothing but my own fine fire. This next piece is a found poem using words said by my children. Um, so it's called Battle Song. Battle Song to be performed as a trio with a silent drone. Mom, pretend this is a base. Pretend we are in training. Pretend we are on grass duty, on rock duty, on hills. Pretend you cannot see us. Pretend that these are real guns. Pretend that we won't shoot them. Pretend that we don't hear you when you say to wait, tell us to stop, please tell us to stop. Pretend we are invisible. Pretend that we are bad guys. Good, no, guys just starting training. Pretend the world's at war, war one, war two, 
or 10. Pretend that we aren't scared. Pretend that we can stop when it gets dark. Pretend that we aren't lambs, that we aren't armed, that we are boys becoming men, that we are boys just growing up. And this last piece um, is uh, from the end of the book and is dedicated to my youngest child who loves underwear or used to love underwear, I think still does, um, and was very jealous when he learned that women often get to wear two kinds of underwear um, and he wanted to wear more kinds of underwear. So tonight when they try on my bra. The little one crushes the cups, testing their air as if the garment will fill with fantasy. He wants the straps and fastenings. He wants the silky armor girding his six-year-old skin. His chest shimmers with laughter. Their father breathing down the stairs. I shout a half-truth to the stairwell before he's in the door. I'm half sure of what he'll do. Some men would meet the sight with fists, others with shame. He cocks half a smile as if to say, what did he expect leaving his boys alone with such a woman? Thank you. Hi, I'm Anthony Cody, and today I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Yokuts and Mono people, otherwise known as Fresno, California. I'm grateful to be here with you all with this invitation from Brenda Gardenas and Roberto Harrison for the Latinx Hour of the Poetry Marathon at Woodland Pattern. I'll be reading three poems today from my collection, Borderland Apocrypha, published by Omnidon. The first is titled, an old white man is not Gil Scott Heron saying, because I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place, is not how you pronounce exile or escapar. An old white man is now my father, was once his father, and one day a stranger may assume I am. Gil Scott Heron dies on the same day astronauts aboard Endeavour walk on what is perceived the final walk in space by NASA, and was born 97 years to the day Carlos Esclava was lynched for theft in Macalumny Hill, California, before a crowd of about 1,000. I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place. In the night, the air is what I find, in a dream when I reach for the hand of a friend. All that remains is a round patch of scar at the end of his right arm. He does not skip a beat and places the limb in my palm, and I cradle it. He says it has been a long time since we touched. This is true. I do not pull away. Want to. He laughs, pulls away and does a handstand with his good arm, and a spider appears, says it is a frontera window. He crawls through, stands, waves goodbye. Pronounce exhale, exile, like exhale, like missile, like monkey, like key, like a door that must be opened and while a glave exists, you cannot make it from your mouth. Escapar is not a choice, but the shape of a hand carving itself moonlight. The next poem is titled, Searching. Perhaps a weeping cactus in the pancreas of all fauna. Perhaps everyone listens, gathers in an apse of echo. Perhaps the center of Maine, now of carcasses, create eclipse. Perhaps in the absence, a kingdom of mirrors. Perhaps each reflection births, shudders, and crumbles. Perhaps remains. Perhaps a weeping cactus speaks in a desert town the names of the soon slain rest in the pancreas of Alfana. Perhaps everyone listens, gathers their dogs, unyokes the oxen, and bundles the sparrows in an apse of echo. 
Perhaps the center of Maine now cleaves a river of coagulation and the pile of carcasses create eclipse. Perhaps in the absence, each person rummages the innards for the forgotten and discovers the kingdom of mirrors. Perhaps each reflection births a howl so shrill that each root, mountain, and river hears, shudders, and crumbles. Perhaps a cactus remains. This final poem is titled Night Jars. Thank you so much. Night jars know this land burns and rebuke nest. Night jars see tinseled vineyards, raisin paper trays kindle and observe how fog is just a patient fence for the worker. Night jars refuse breath, mechanics, firmament, man, God. Night jars trill murmuration, distraction, cease consumption to offer silence, sight discovery of flight, the immolation of sky. Night jars say before, 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 treaties and trails and migrations, before, 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 lend lease, before, 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 this had a name, 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 this had a name. Hello, my name is Susie F. Garcia. I want to thank Michael and Woodland Pattern for hosting this amazing event. I also want to express my gratitude to Roberto Harrison for inviting me, as well as my fellow readers. And finally, thank you to all who have donated. It's so exciting to see our community come together to support this bit of literary haven. The first poem I am reading today is Returning. Returning. One. In Spain, my lover promises we can find a map in Garcia Lorca's words if our Spanish got good enough. He has secrets in his grave, but my tongue is a tarnished sword and my mouth weeds grow in my throat. Two, Johannes Hoffler thought that nostalgia may be fatal, but with the right treatment, it could also be cured. And for centuries, the debate raged on some said that the only antidote for nostalgic soldiers was furlough. Others said, no, it's the opposite. The solution is to forget, and Canada banned the bagpipes that reminded Canadian Scots of sharp blades of grass and thick wool of sheep. And I, I visit the Mesoamerican collection at Notre Dame's art museum. I speak to that which has been kidnapped, stolen, ransomed away. Hello, dear friends. I bring you news of home. I tell them that Trujillo is no longer safe, that the monuments crumble on top of mountains, but luckily there is much more treasure under the earth. In response, there is a silence from a woman with large swinging breasts who decorates a stone rolling pin. She is my mother, stopped in action, a metaphor for creation and redemption thus a metaphor for the loss of both. Three, the boy who almost kissed me on prom night is dead now. So at night in my dreams, I ask him to stay next to me on cold grass to keep talking instead of turning him away. But what next? So many boys I almost kissed are dead from drug overdoses. When you are young and living in a country city, we kiss and we drug. He died before social media, and when I try to Google him, I can't remember how to spell his name. My yearbooks are packed away, so I go through obituaries online, find vague references. I redraw his hair, scraggly strands of blonde, his nails short and stubbed, the smell of the cigarette we shared on the riverbank, the one we swore had a hint of chocolate in the smoke flavor. What was sweetness to Ash? Four. 
Joseph opened the stores of grain, and everyone was full and happy. And he saw those he loved again, and he still loved them, even though they betrayed him, because God told him he would. Because God said he would see them kneel before him, and they did. And it is easy to forgive when you are full of sureness, and when those who hurt you recognize your righteousness and when they beg for your forgiveness and when your father cries in joy for your existence and you cry too and someone writes down the story and maybe hundreds of years later you can still ride high the bliss of knowing what you know is true and that those you loved love you too five my siblings and I don't talk much, but if I had to go on the amazing race, it would definitely be with my older brother. If anyone understands intense rage and then laughter, it is him. It used to scare me the way we were like, the way we would break ourselves, the things of others, the way we begged for forgiveness in deep tragedy, the clawing feeling in our chest that could not be quenched. But I think we'd make a good team. He's very athletic, and I think we'd like to travel together. We are both very comfortable with misery. Hi, my name is Cheyenne Figueroa Bennett. I am a poet and teaching artist joining in from Queens, New York, the traditional homeland of the Lenape people. I am excited to share a double sonnet that I wrote while I was in Panama the indigenous land of the Embera, Wonin, Kuna, Nove, and Bugle people, among other people groups. This poem is specifically dedicated to the Black West Indian men and women who died um, giving their lives to the construction of the Panama Canal. This poem is titled, They Came in Ships After Mahadai Das. They came in ships. They came in ships from across the seas, rapid like their rivers, Ganges, Huangqi, and Niger, blistered bulk bodies, pungent like fruit, Yet sweet sorrow blossoms from lasso tongues. Our labored bodies heave to birth monuments, roads, rails, and locks. The transatlantic was never singular. The transatlantic duplicates itself. They coolly or coolly or Yoruba made black, cut cane and lay track. Them charcoal line henna stains, silk sewn skins, like rudders othered exotic laborers in foreign lands. They came in fleets of ships, they came in droves, this time from Barbados, Jamaica, Martinique, Guadeloupe. All of them aboard are men of crisp collars hewed from the bow and stern, descended from hook to isthmus. They came all alike now, just like before. To Isthmus they came all alike now, just like before. Us women, we came too, hand in hand, my sister and I. She is the one deliberate as a map. I am the one full-blooded in all my ways. On our islands, we left behind children so young, our nipples still saying wet milk. Strong men on high horse snuff at what kind of mothers we are, but they don't know what it is like to claw at your own bosom when it relentlessly refuses to give what it is like to carry scarcity in one hand and in the other, the clear, still gaze of your child like a mirror. We love to build anew as mothers are supposedly made to do. 
we left to carve ourselves into new landscape. The canals of our bodies bore babes and birth men. What could they have made without us? So to Isthmus we came, all alike, now, just like before. Hello, my name is Jose Luis Moctezuma, and I'm reading two poems for the Latinx Poetry Hour. The first poem is titled Noyo Linchoca, after Nezahualcoyot, translates to My Heart Weeps. I drank mushrooms bathing in pulque, and now my heart weeps. I feel that the earth abandons me. I sense that I am no longer glad. The earth tells me I am undeliverable and death asks me when I'll pay the rent, but there's nothing to show for it. And even the terminally irate counterfeit their monies an empty wing-like gesture. Although we are crested in quetzales and flush in green affections, unisoned as gems are on jade necklace. Few things are solid anymore. Our anger burns like dust on the comal, and nothing is forged. My friend, dear friend, friend of casual encounters, only the lure of better selves tempts me to proffer this offering up, perishable as our rising smoke in the sun of certain death. So here, I render up to you these flowers, these hand-wrung petals. And the second poem I will read is TFW, The Feels Win. Purloined these sentimental reminders of our mortality what seeks other names for its glamour among the broken-hearted, a sublime redistributed among memes for ease of access to earlier personhoods. Better than group therapy or thaumaturgy or pangolin soup, separation anxieties along one-way streets relayed, what it feels in throes of anon, to be alive, to be of a world, to eat of other people's boredoms in a metonymy of Gog and Magog, walled off by yacht rock affect, what pings the screen and smoothens the capillaries, and what night thoughts decrypt in passageways in cheap matrixial green, will I only describe as sinewy in the way sinewy means animal and muscle memory except it is the reaction time astrologers use to caption our unknown quantities in fields of magnetic parlance. You who do not feel as I do, though we share a body switched on by blockchain and our language is a punctum sealed in wax as a needle fixed in the heart's vinyl its unreason manages our percepts quite delectably in drops and dumps of data transversely so good dope as fuck inasmuch these lunacies of abbreviated breathing pulse heavy submit receipts i co-sign this feeling i live its thunderclap the terror of being outward drawn made immune to the drawl of the interior. What remains of me is downpour and declination and a churn rate of burner phones, unsubscribing from lines of imminence, blocks of spectrum anxiety melting as the ice caps on glacial distances between you and me and the undiscovered pleasures. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Rafael Perez y Perez. I develop a computer system called Mexica that writes short stories about the Mexica, also known as Aztecs. I would like to read for you two stories produced by my computer program, one in English and one in Spanish. I hope you enjoy them. Story 9. The Jaguar Nine opened his eyes while Tonatiu, the god of the sun, started to cross the blue sky. The lady was proud to be a member of the Mexica society. Some years ago, the princess was born under the protection of the great god Huitzilopochtli. A hungry puma wounded the Jaguar Knight and the princess. The lady went to find some medical plants and cured both the Jaguar Knight and the princess. They were very grateful. The princess was impressed by the lady and she fell in love with her. The lady and the princess were good friends. The lady appreciated the friend, princess' friendship. Why did the princess fall in love with her? The lady was mad. The desire that the lady felt for the Jaguar Knight was reciprocal. They could not help it. The lady and the Jaguar Knight fell in love with each other. When the princess found out that the Jaguar Knight had feelings for the lady, she got really irritated with the Jaguar Knight. The princess insulted the Jaguar Knight because she was irritated with him. Instantly, the princess and the Jaguar Knight started to punch each other. The Jaguar Knight realized that the princess could kill him at once. He had to run away. The Jaguar Knight decided to go to the Tlatelolco market. The end. Cuento cuatro. El caballero Celote sentía una gran atracción hacia la princesa. La princesa sintió un innegable afecto por el caballero Celote. No lo pudieron evitar. El caballero Celote y la princesa se enamoraron. Era claro que tanto el guerrero como la princesa sentían un gran deseo el uno por el otro. No lo pudieron evitar. El guerrero y la princesa se enamoraron. El guerrero se sintió traicionado por la princesa cuando se enteró que ella también amaba al caballero Celote. ¿Cómo pudieron hacerle esto? El guerrero sentía amor y odio hacia la princesa. El caballero Celote quedó muy decepcionado del amor cuando se dio cuenta que la princesa también tenía fuertes sentimientos hacia el guerrero. No estaba dispuesto a compartirla. El caballero Celote se preguntó por qué la princesa se comportaba así. El caballero Celote envió a la princesa a prisión para darle una lección. Ahora, él tenía un nuevo enemigo. La princesa sentía emociones opuestas hacia el caballero Celote. El caballero Celote estaba furioso y logró que el guerrero fuera confinado en las tierras salvajes del norte. La princesa logró escapar. La princesa decidió trasladarse al mercado de Tlatelolco. La princesa no se pudo contender y ofendió al caballero Ocelote. Repentinamente, la princesa y el caballero Ocelote se ensarzaron en una dura riña. La princesa tomó su daga y atravesó el corazón del caballero Ocelote mientras Tonatiu, dios del cielo, desaparecía en el horizonte. El guerrero decidió trasladarse al mercado de Tlatelolco. El guerrero arremetió contra la princesa. La princesa sentía y compasión y desprecio por el guerrero. Con un movimiento rápido, la princesa hirió al guerrero. Las heridas del guerrero eran serias. Usando tepescohuite, logró curarse. Sin perder tiempo, la princesa se escabulló hacia el Popocatépetl. Fin.
This guy lives down in San Antonio. He's a terrific artist. Um, his name is Cesar A. Martinez. And um, the poem is called On the King's Road in San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from. So this poem is a, in honor of him. He's still alive. He's kicking, he's kicking it with his art. Humble householder, modern Tejano Toltec, welcomes us to his armadillo corrugated casa while he opens his guarded black clippings binder. It reveals a parade of rostros de los Chicanos muertos, of those posed in their favorite or final public photo. We ponder the once alive many ceased orbits. Notice how heat has oxidized white print to brown. He draws and paints as deliberate as science allows, forms prism, prisms from the heart crystal. Out of each human face, resurrection springs in new colors inside the artist's mind studio. A magician's mortuary without mourners, tears, or egocentric memories. Decades gone, grins, sunglasses squint, sampaku eyes stare again, afloat on a tapestry of luxuriant magentas, green and umbers. Cesar's magic of peyote kaleidoscope snaps open. Towers of firecrackers sizzle in a torrent of canvas strokes while listening to the silver chords of España's flamenco, which accompanies him as he strikes and strums one magnetic brush flashing side to side, open, closed, como el torador's dance to free the bull of blindness with shafts of light. Artists in Chicago are many, uh, but the ones who get a lot of notoriety in the Mexican community are the muralists. And so uh, some of our muralists are doing stuff and I salute them in this poem uh, and the canvas guys too. So it's called, It Is Dream. We emerged from the dark char, oh, by the way, the word Toltec, I have to tell you this. When you hear this word Toltec, what it means is when the Aztecs got to the Valley of Mexico, they encountered what they called the Toltec people. And they were the people who were the master artisans, the master builders, the architects. They knew stuff. They were, they were like, you know, this is the Romans meeting the Greeks type of thing. You know, the Greeks knew stuff. They knew all kinds of art. So anyway, the Toltecs. And you're going to hear that word. So it just means people talented in their craft. It is dream. We emerge from the dark charcoal blanket of night. Our ancestors forged for more than food. They generated the genius seed of all Toltecs. It is too big for hooks, spears, arrows, or nets. It is dream. You watch for its presence with hunter-gatherer eyes and heart. It climbs and descends, offering a compass to fertile gardens as we walk the land. Tiny hummingbird heads south. Alights on the breeze where Huichilapochli directed the first Mexica to nectar savored in, cinnamon, in crimson beaks and ruby tongues. Come again to us in art. It is dream. You are the young guardians of grand designs, sons and daughters of the codex keepers, mound magicians and pyramid magicians and musicians. Sure-footed and agile as a spiderweb mathematician, within the spinning galaxy of delta paints, you dive unburdened into the healing fires to retrieve what is hidden inside the obsidian mirror.
to Vanessa Alvarez and my audition tape for Smash Dance Marathon. Bonjour everyone, Kim Blazer and Indigenous. I'm here as founding director of INAPO, Indigenous Nations Poets, and we're delighted to participate in Woodland Patterns Annual Poetry Marathon. 
NAPO is a national indigenous poetry community committed to mentoring emerging writers, nurturing the growth of indigenous poetic practices, and raising the visibility of all native writers, past, present, and future. We recognize the important role poetry plays in sustaining tribal sovereign nations and indigenous languages. Including me, we have seven NA poets performing in today's marathon. Allow me to introduce them to you. Hallie Kirkwood is a direct descendant of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. They were a 2019-2020 Loft Mentor Series Fellow and a recipient of an MFA from Hamlin University. They are a 2021 Minnesota State Arts Board grant recipient, executive editor of Runestone Journal, and a bookseller at Birchbark Book and Books and Native Arts. Jennifer Elise Forrester is the author of three books of poetry, most recently, The Maybe Bird from Song Cave. She is the recipient of an NEA Creative Writing Fellowship, a Lannan Foundation Writing Residency Fellowship, and she was a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. She lives in San Francisco. Max Early is from Laguna Pueblo. He is a 2022 inaugural NEA Poe Fellow a recent MFA graduate from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and his poems are published in Poetry Northwest, Zocalo Public Square, Poetry Magazine, Poets.org, Poemaday, Green Linden Press, and are forthcoming in Hayden Ferry Review. His first poetry collection Ears of Corn, Listen, was published by Three Eight House, Eight House Press. He has received fellowships from Writing by Writers, Orion in the Wilderness, and School of Advanced Research Indigenous Writer. Early lives in the village of Paguet in New Mexico. Tacey Atsidi, is a Diné poet. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Poetry, Epic, Kenyan Review Online, Massachusetts Review, Poma Day, and other publications. Her recent book is Rain Scald from University of New Mexico Press. She holds an MFA for, from Cornell University and is currently a PhD student at Florida State University. Anthony Sabalas is a poet, writer, and enthusiastic bibliophile. He stops to smell the blossoms in South Minneapolis, Minnesota. He can be found penning staff recommendations at Birchbark Books and Native Arts and he is a first-generation descendant of the Malak Band of Ojibwe. Annie Wenstrup is a Dene'ina woman living in Fairbanks, Alaska. A 2022 Stone Coast graduate, she is also a Smithsonian Arctic Studies Fellow, an inaugural Indigenous Nations Poets Fellow, and a Story Knife Fireweed Fellow. Her work can be found or is forthcoming in Poetry Northwest, the Eleno Review, After, Palette, and Ran Off with the Star Bassoon. All of our books can be purchased through Wooden Pattern. Miigwech. Thank you for supporting poetry and enjoy the readings.
Bonjour, my name is Haley Kirkwood, and I'm very honored to be a part of Woodland Pattern Book Center's online poetry festival marathon this year. I'm going to read three poems, and the first poem um, came from a workshop that I took as part of Indigenous Nation Poets inaugural fellowship this year in Washington, D.C. This poem was written after a workshop um, led by poet and teacher Edgar Sillix. This poem is after him and it's for my found family with Indigenous Nations poets. It's titled Gift Shop Blues. When my uncle died in the car crash, coming home from the floodwood powwow, my grandmother was gifted a statue of an eagle carved in quartz and amethyst. It was the kind of gift I'd look upon now with suspicion. Pan-Indian, vague, megasy, commodified. But when my brother and I shattered a wing in one of our fights, the ones which erupted after we were taken from our mother's custody, we panicked, each blaming the other. There are many stories of the animals beating the odds but I've never heard of an eagle making it with only one wing. I stumble into gift shops now and then with similar cheap objects that would not carry the ma we could lay down for them, not for all the ma in the world, but still we tried to glue that wing back together, and when our grandmother finally came home, she did not scold us for our carelessness, though, in a way, it's what we wanted, acknowledgement of fractured flight. The next poem is comprised of a few clippings lifted from an old newspaper, um, in the, a newspaper that was from the small town of Red Wing, Minnesota, and the poem is simply titled, Clipping from the Red Wing Republican Eagle. Here, an opinion piece titled, Where Have All the Peacocks Gone? Pasted next to another titled, Waters of Biblical Fame Yield Chemicals, Early 1940s. It is suggested that women rear ornamental birds to beautify countrysides. It is suggested that bromide and magnesium from the Dead Sea are needed for the war. If a garden is necessarily a captive thing, then is anything captive a garden? Reaps of sun, a periodic table, gizik, kahasa, a wife, a child, a soldier, a bird, the very dirt itself, from which each delicious feather is plucked. And the final poem is titled The Pom Pom Crab. For 140 years, scientists have puzzled over carcinization, a global and convergent evolution in which crustaceans evolve into a crab-like form. If I am to live and realize the brief panic in which the internet wonders if humans will eventually become crab, I think out of the king, rock, spider, snow, fiddler, horsehair, horseshoe, ghost, flower, and Sally Lightfoot crab. I'd most want to be the pom-pom crab, anemones wielded on each claw, raving through the cool and cobalt waters of my cluster. I will leave the duty of the Cuban land crab, scuttling six miles from rainforest to the Bay of Pigs, to lay their eggs to my friends with the hearts and hands of would-be parents, had the world turned out kinder. The big claw drumming of the fiddler crab to the shy and broken-hearted, the coconut crab to the conspiracy theorists, so they may finally know what happened to Amelia Earhart's body, for we will not know homelessness, see how the hermit crabs post their sentinels beneath palm fronds, watching for a new shell to wash ashore, all afternoon in their orderly queues, a jubilee of shell swapping, whirl still warm from the body before. We will glimmer with abundance. 
we will cast our constellation of inevitability across the planet and wave our pincers to each other across the sea. Thank you. This is Max Early. My first poem is Bessie's Transmission, recently published in Hayden's Fairy Review, issue 71. Bessie's Transmission for Kathleen Wall. If only we had lit up the candles on your cake. If only I could hear your party of mud song. If only I could have a cheerful toast to let this bliss dashboard like a bluebird. If only we weren't in the fall kiss of your water clan summer. If only we didn't have to dry our clay pots and never sand away. If only Mama Fanny could still braid your pigtails tighter than tight. If only we could finish a pottery mask that whispered global warming. If only your clay clowns could text and eat watermelon at the same time. If only I could hear you sing happy birthday Mr. President and shout impeach, impeach, impeach while impersonating Marilyn Monroe standing above a subway vent. If only you had shouted isn't it delicious if only you had taught me to make Hamas enchiladas. If only you could be next year's native treasure. If only the transmission wasn't in the shop. If only roads could diffuse the distance. We could have danced even after the crowd left. If only I could have wished you a long life and drove back to Laguna with a bluebird behind the wheel. My second poem is Flowers in the Deer's House, published in Grounded in Clay, The Spirit of Pueblo Pottery. Flowers in the Deer's House. Painted black line encircles damp earth oya, opening a subtle path to skyward realms as cirrus cloud spiral nearby rainbows. Light and shadow crosshatch distant rains. Sound of shock waves slice like knives. Thunder to arouse zitrui. The horned water serpent ribbons through winds of red leaves and feathers, while rainbirds stream into dark caverns. Water streaks down a stalactite as she applies a stroke of black paint to the slipped white clay surface. With curves, hooks, and pointed beaks, she bends willow to form a hoop, a drumstick tied with yucca fiber. Sonic voice of water drum ripples as buds, Amanadora and Delia, bloom on adobe floors and walls. Outside the house of fluorescence, burnished moon of ancient pursuit, halos night sky, when stellar trail glistens north. Cosmic star flower guides her journey to a trio of bucks standing silent in the deer's home at winter solstice. As she sketches the eyes of the deer, she whispers a blessing of fortuity to enhance her man's chances of gain. From mouth to slender neck to mid-body, she paints reddish-brown line to an arrow-tipped heart above a belly of beya. She exhales as she exits the opening of thoughts and prayers infused on clay, prosperous hunt, abundant rain, long life. Unfired masterpiece nestles in her lap, 
She lays her yucca brush aside to rest and daydreams of her distant relatives. Her fingers roll the silver pearl necklace she wears night and day, a gift from her father when her mother returned to Laguna. In the days of horse and wagon trails, a child of the Zuni Coyote clan she treasures designs from her father's kin. Into the fired Gran Oya she pours cascades of blue from bare grass baskets, storing shelled corn for winter sustenance. Dawaya, shkunama. Thank you. Yat a shay sonny little in a dashitine, Sanabil in a slant hotness on the bashishin, to call my head a shichero hashk a hot zoe da chanelle, a coat out and a hasanish lint. So it's like my third time recording. I'm like, Wah! and I figure now I only have, um, I can only read one poem to you. So, um, this poem is called Near Frank Lloyd Wright's Spring House, and I literally live like two minutes away. Um, from that house and um, I am a PhD student in Tallahassee uh, at Florida State in creative writing. So here's my poem. Every morning when I push aside my bedroom curtain, I see green bananas. Their curved true stem weighs down the tree's neck. It hangs lower than the day before. Male flowers begin brushing the shrubbery beneath in light wind. I wonder if my neighbor Cooper even knows they're ripe now. And my other neighbor Shell hacks down her entire tree when harvesting bananas. They only come in every few years, she says, while stroking the bark. They're sticky, too. There are things you learn as a homeowner in Florida coming from the West Deserts. Lemon trees, for instance, come like roses, heavy and thick with thorns. My lemons are acting weird this year. They're not falling like they should be, even when I take the tree of the branches. Though they're full and plum covered with dust. A landscaper once said my lemon tree was planted too close to my driveway. Why did they plant your fig so close to the house anyway? He went on and on about it. Manny, who lives on the corner and told me about the man who once owned my house, how he shot and killed himself in my front yard. And after a quick inhale, I said, my house and property have been blessed and thanked him for waiting at least a year before telling me this. Maybe that's why the guy before me planted an entire garden in the front yard. It looked funny, Shell said, but it grew really well. He planted everything, she said, tomatoes, raspberries, strawberries. And one year the guy planted a small cornfield and Shell thought she saw a crop circle. Maddie told me about the other corner man who swore aliens took over the body of his brother, shaking him violently until the paramedics arrived. About how the now overgrown molded blue house once thrived as a makeshift cafe where fishermen would bring their fresh catches from Lake Jackson just at the road's end to be fried up. There'd be cars parked up all up and down water line. You couldn't hardly get into your driveway. And Miss Rita, boy, she was one heck of a cook. She'd fry up those fish and hush puppies like it was nothing, then boil up some grits and greens for your plate. Of course, she had lots of practice, being a carny for all those years after her parents gave her up. Half of her siblings, too. That was during the Depression time. They could only afford to feed seven of the 14 of them. The rest, well, maybe it's why she took in all those prostitutes, didn't want no one feeling left out the way she felt all those years. Yeah, those were some tough years, Manny said, before going on about the peach orchard that once thrived where Coop's house now sits. Where Coop's banana tree overhangs the fence into my yard heavy with fruit. Thank you.
My name is Anthony Sabalas, and this is called Pray It Be Forgiven. Maybe I forgive you, Father. I can't stay mad forever. It's a dangerous slope, a thin layer of ice and no traction. Too easy to slide all the way down a hill they write songs about. And at the bottom, every poem I ever brought into this world about you. Like you calling me into form, into body, your body, though never like you, too much like you. I can never look away from all that makes us same. So instead, maybe I forgive you, and in a way, forgive myself for being a son who holds grievances against the dead. It's never our singular fault. Sometimes the hand is drawn from a defective deck. Sometimes the odds are in no one's favor. And I need to breathe compassion like air, my father. I need an empathy for the no longer with us. For the Father, the art in heaven, you're broken, hallelujah. You hurt me still, from beyond a grave I cannot reach, an empty space. No chance to sit across from you, talk with you, ask you about love. What love? Your love, a father's love, a son's love. How about a mother and wife's love for both? I wear your name unwillingly. Sometimes a shackle, sometimes the only thing you gave, and no one asked me how it felt. Well, today it feels like bills collecting dust. When to pay, how long to ignore this debt I owe you, owe forgiveness. Maybe today will put a little down. Pray for the best. Al obsessed. Sometimes I forget to brush my teeth. I have tartar around my gum line. I do my best, but still, it happens. Reassuringly, dental decay stops once you die. Suddenly durable, your teeth outlast almost everything. After the rest of you softens to earth, your teeth will keep company with your jewelry and the nylon thread that held your clothes together. In a thousand years, it could happen to me. In 2019, an archaeologist cleaned plaque off a nun's thousand-year-old tooth. First, she dissolved the tartar in weak acid, then placed it on a slide. She was looking for food, bacteria, or pollen. Research like this is how we know 3,000 years ago, the Philistines imported bananas, turmeric, and soy. I imagine that looking through the microscope and discerning cream from ivory is like looking at paint samples on a wall. But this tooth, under the lens, this woman's tartar bloomed with blue speckles like a robin's egg, blue like the Virgin Mary's robe, blue like the sky in the last judgment. 
blue as though she'd eaten lapis lazuli for breakfast. Who does that with a stone? One so precious it was once more valuable than gold. So holy it was crushed to illustrate the word of God. Once I played with my grandfather's magnifying glass. I pretended to be like him, held over pennies and dimes. The raised profiles of men swelled the glass. It was the kind of seeing where looking confirmed the faces that were already there. This looking is different. Through the microscope's eye comes a woman. See her. See her tongue tip her paintbrush to a point. See how holiness kisses her teeth. See her illuminate her manuscript. Dear Chakotay, Stardate 2373. Simply, I loved you, like the captain loves you, in sidelong glances, in unreality. How could I not, you with your tattoo, a professional, you lost in light years away from home, and still you believe your ancestors guide you. I've watched you close your eyes to contact your spirit guides. It was more intimate than a kiss. I wanted to learn to pray the same way. Oh, Chakotay, if you'd asked, I would have joined the Maquis to be with you. I would have left my sun and moon to follow you into uncharted space. I'd even adopt the doctrine of discovery for you. I'd imagined us standing on deck quoting Picard, imagined us daring each other to boldly go where no one's ever gone before. I wanted to want you because you were a wanted Indian, someone I wanted to be. Oh, Chakotay, how my heart broke when I realized each night with your cold cream and your washcloth, you untattoo your face before you fall asleep, unreddened, unmarked. Gugwini transcribes the archive as Vanitas. Summer, stage for my desire. Always I've wanted this. Decadence, an insured home. Year-round strawberries. My hands softened, no longer rough from flattening cardboard boxes or counting up registers. Now my gloved hands tend tomato plants. Steak vines, guide rugos leaves trellis them and allow the stem to bear weight while ripening fruits take their sunning. The scent, heavy, green, pungent. It clings to my hands after I've lopped their tops. Laughing like Henry VIII, I'm triumphant. It takes a wealthy man to laugh like that, not in mirth or wonder, but in feeling all that greenness stain you while watching it fall. Wild Kin by Aja Kushwa Duncan. Affinity, skin. The doe runs faster than Gizig clears the clouds through reek grass and sagebrush. She runs so hard and artery stretches and then bursts, blood spilling into her organs. She runs through wetlands until she can't hear anything but her hooves, until she has no memory of where she ran from, the fawn, its mother, the sound of death cleaving sky. People who don't sleep will say that night is day, twisted up a knot of darkness in which everything buried unfurls its raptorial claws, clutching memories like prey. People who can't sleep will tell you they have always been awake, except for some time in an unknown yesterday when they must have slept through it. People who sleep remember the dark essence of origin, magic, a falling start, 
from which we all came, some debris on the earth. What wilderness that once a grestal doe who birthed no fawns, only antlers protruding from her asshole, calcified protrusions she evinced from the fields of bucks who once mounted her, only to find their own nostrils filled with bone. Disoriented, seemingly alone, in the darkness all she feels is her own hand reaching towards the trees, their ears and vulvas, some primordial dampness, this deepest of sleeps from which all life sprang forth. It is dusk when the dough hits the wall of human habitation. Suburban homes spread a blight along the hillside. She later learns how to graze between the fenced yards and asphalt drives, how to read the direction and speed of their cars. But the first few days, she weeps beneath the power lines, a broken landscape. At night, the cabin shrinks until the darkness is inside of her, lifetimes of dismemberment at the hands of others, the foul taste of them. Cursed, they said, you are cursed. And she was, but so was God in that life where everything was buried in the middle world. Being proximate to the doe learns a new language, one of sibilance, subtle intonation. The doe listens, grazes on domesticated grasses, bound by a periphery of humans, their strange architecture, concrete, metal, giant eyes of glass, as if anything could be more solid than soil, sky, the landscape of skin. Gichie Aigag told stories to remind her that humankind was not without guidance. Two leggeds arrived long after willow, pine, sycamore, tendered the sky with oxygen, released from the undulation of leaves. After plants came swimmers, then birds, then humped and furred ones sowed their medicine. So much bounty. It made some humans angry. Why else would they tear things from the earth, from each other, all around them, a distressed fury? The doe slips farther west, past Bad Mountain and all its dead. The doe can hear them now that she understands their language. So many desires for more and less. What human is ever satisfied? The doe longs for every blade of grass, what she bends herself into. Thank you. Bushu Nindinawe Magani Dok, Kim Blazer Nindijinakaz, Anishnabe Kwe Nindao, Gawababi Boni Kog Nindun Jaba. I'm Kim Blazer. I'm Anishinaabe from the White Earth Nation of Northwestern Minnesota. I'm here to celebrate Woodland Patterns Annual Poetry Marathon as a part of NAPO Indigenous Nations Poets. I have two poems for you. The first takes a look at the ongoing colonial possession, both figuratively and literally, of indigenous bodies. Taxonomy. The ancestors live in boxes now. I live squared, only head. The world is blue screen, is screen. Name something intact without acronyms. Morning cormorant, a silhouette, elongated and familiar, a routine of hunger, then bulk. We swallow whole the impossible. No one feeds prettily. 
avert your eyes, survive. The ancestors live in white cardboard boxes. I am fasting, no news feed or rumor, politics, a super spreader, how we shelter in non-places. Here the hooked bill of the cormorant fills. I ignore the chat, have exited the Zoom room. My dry throat opens to swallow, convulses by reflex or instinct. Water birds, we live this story. Ancestors wait on shelves in numbered boxes. They dive, propel themselves with webbed feet. Shaggy cormorant wings spread wide to dry. Perhaps we are not praying when we lift our hands. The second poem is looking at the supposedly post-pandemic world where we are all still immersed in calling forth healing. Soft pampas grass, we bed down like deer after the dying. Spirits all walk toward horizon, transform against the evening chrysalis of sky. You feed me your dark-eyed loneliness, wisdom from Dr. Fauci, and sectors of tangerine, small as my thumb. Scent the air, everything is shrunken or overblown now. I am undressing, blue jeans, flannel, my polished toes naked in the dark, tickling fronds, the bottom of my feet tender as story. Soon we are turning to black and white, a hundred years ago, just before Betty White was born, just before that other dying time. Those epidemic faces framed like myths, in our eyes, everybody sainted but us. We tether ourselves, but things grow out of control. Network images on repeat, guns and knees, shattered windows and black death, plague upon plague. I keep seeing the picture of the elk, its antlers turned to tree, bare black branches silhouetted against a stormy sky. In that tangle, a singing bird. Let us stand now where the grass is tall, settle our legs there among the growing, Listen like all forlorn for the least crackle of air until nocturnal bats hum our names. Perhaps then we shall feel edges splintering. How soon a bough, a stem, a tributary, how soon we too shall antler like dear woman. Yes, rise now after the dying, thick-necked and sturdy, russet with hope. Await the perch of bird, miigwech.
Hi, my name is Janet Jenner John, and I'm very happy to be reading in Woodland Patterns 2023 Marathon. I recently retired from teaching uh, English at the college level, so the first poem I'd like to read is an example of a assignment I gave my students many times, which was to write an ekphrastic poem about a piece of art at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And this particular poem is about a very well-known sculpture at the museum. It is also a mirrored poem, and it is called The Children Gather Round Him, Janitor, 1973, Dwayne Hansen. The children gather around him, so close he might feel their breath. They giggle and point. Don't touch, their teacher exhales. He feels that too, her breath. Different though, sour and aged, like his skin so frail, a thin veneer of wax. He wonders what it might feel like to be touched again. His creator's hand, brush, tiny trowel. He remembers each stroke, mottled sockets and joints, a whisper to attach a lash the tiny screw holding his glasses. The children crowd closer to see. When the teacher turns to admire another work of art, the second grade field trip moves, slips into a new gallery, and the solitary work of being returns. The solitary work of being returns, slips into a new gallery, the second grade field trip moves to admire another work of art. When the teacher turns, the children crowd closer to see, the tiny screw holding his glasses, a whisper attached to a lash, mottled sockets and joints. He remembers each stroke, his creator's hand, brush, tiny trowel. To be touched again, he wonders what it might feel like a thin veneer of wax, like his skin so frail. Different though, sour and aged, he feels that too, her breath. Don't touch, the teacher exhales. They giggle and point, so close he might feel their breath. And the second poem I'd like to read, it's called <clears throat> Family Album. I'm dedicating it to my son, Diego. I have two wonderful sons, both of whom who were born in Bogota, Colombia. Family album for Diego. 
This was the first moment you loved me. Your tiny arms open wide as naked trees in winter. Tears drying on your face, slowly evaporating memories of mother, littered streets, tiny fires burning on the mountainside. This was the day you realized one word wasn't going to be enough. Your cousin's language loud and annoying, her greed overwhelming, yet all you could say was no. This was the day I introduced you to Bruce, my Nancy Sinatra nightgown paisley as fuck twirling its polyester threads into a cyclone, us in the middle of spin, around and around, baby, we were born to run. This was the day you met your brother, clip on corbata in place, straight as the white lines on the runway. Then we were four, king, queen, jack, ace, climbing the stairs of our little house, rented and warm, nesting beneath the covers, tulips buried in snow waiting for spring. If you could go back in time, would you? Would you search for them? your two-year-old frame stumbling into every shanty, peering beneath the tar paper, hoping that one of the faces looking back at you was yours. Teenager, brown, lean, armored, returning to your birthplace, lean over the city, stretch into the mounting clouds, fly. Thank you for listening. Okay, last take. Lizard Mound. We missed the solstice, the utilities coming due. Notice came late, May apples levitate, easterly conical mound. North, center, copper, evergreen, in a million parallels, in a vernal pool. My solitary vireo, adjacent yellow birch, landlord of a single salamander. Indigo, adjacent to partial oak and oak grove, we drove through taken by fragmentary beauty, the old grove broken by a road. Blue-eyed grass and grass pinks adjacent to beach maple canopy. We drove through, taken by fragmentary beauty, the canopy broken by a road. Wild lupin, oh, the slightest blues, oak openings, we drove through, taken by fragmentary beauty, open oaks, broken by a road. Birds without number, books without number, birches numb without. Birds without number, books without number, birches without. Long Lake. Round River. In future islands, a subtle terrain. All is periphery, arrow grass, osier shift. The acrimonious marsh wren and the superior pintail, very superior, old pale. And the salt loving Phragmites, the good, the bad, the loose strife. Wild geranium, wood betony, meadow loop, yellow throat, cinnamon fern, meadow loop, viri, tamarack, footprint, imprint of a lake. This familiar September hour turns like a digitized 78. It's rounds per minute. Autumn soon comes. 
A river without islands is like a lake within a river. White-breasted ventriloquist, red-breasted ventriloquist, and three heuristics. Blue-eyed vireo, red-eyed vertigo, a wide wind, open as a canopy, as specific as arrowgrass, as talkative as prickly ash. Travel or soon touch, peach orchard, coral tender. Lee buys ankle bone, those tiny veins, blue whales seen from the moon. The flute. You've read this book before, narrow road. 12 times, and now the refrain, now the turnaround. Hello, I'm Irene Cooper. I'm happy to be here and grateful to Woodland Pattern and to all of you for this event. I come to you from Oregon, from the ancestral lands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Even my dreams are over the constant state of anxiety. I was scheduled for a bar shift, though I didn't work there, didn't know it was a bar, thought it was a Monday night anyway, not a busy Thursday. I've been on the phone, an old faded yellow phone that hung on the wall and had a spiral cord. Someone was telling me I'd inherited or won a house, possibly a lot of money. I tried to hang up, orders were coming in, service had started. I gestured with my right finger in the air, you know, like, I'll be with you in one minute. A woman wanted a Dewar's Latina. I said, could you tell me what that is? She said, it's Dewar's Scotch with salty tears that come in a tiny blue bird bottle labeled Lagrimas. I looked everywhere in the bar. It was a mess. I thought if I'd known I had a shift, I would have stocked the glassware. At least there was ice. But why was there ice? That was weird. The line at the bar grew. The manager was upset. But I was doing my best. And anyway, this shit show had nothing to do with me. The poet posits. Jesus was deliberate in his contradictions, set out to foster a kind of creative imagination in his followers, but we're more tender than smart. Theoretical individualists who take kinder to a commandment than a concept, a mistake to believe we'd appreciate his God-given irony, ill-equipped as we are for the cosmic joke. Not even omnipotence can stop a flock once it gets tumbling downhill. Sweet Jesus, what can you expect of a people after they've suffered the locusts, the plagues, been flooded with such love? Que sera, sera, is not fatalism is not to be or not to be mean at the core of matter like a corm in relation to a crocus pit to peach tree a seed in relation to the right conditional lots of germinations fail to thrive resist the visible what will be will be aspirational microbial a missing gene a quarantine of least resistance incubate, intubate, blooming misogyny, innocence, be not synonymous with dumb virtues, vice in drag, the numbers grow too large to fathom, a son known only by its kin, one million killed, is ten, is one killed, plus so many nothings at their wake, what was, ain't, and what will be, is panacea, for the pain struck, the scorch of powder, and the scare cities of what will be a matter of trigger and of choice, detour and deter, a matter of state and all but out of your hands, baby. I don't meditate, I'm not respirated, never run unless chased, and I'm never chased, and so rarely take note of my breath as the miracle persists, quotidian 
Stressful to watch fish breathe in a tank, nude mechanics, mystery of gill. Asthma, coma, plethora of childhood distress. I could be a better host. Aerobics, a song. Breathy indication of capacity, of aspiration. Token thanks for bouncing back from all that freedom of choice. And hubris, pink and spongy as a fresh dime store. Sponge, ball on a brick, stoop, catching air. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Happy Marathon. This is called a symbol for a kiss. Most of the living things on Earth do not have bones. Does not everything of Caesar's eventually get rendered upon his archetype on the daily? In Halifax, they sell miniature meat sandwiches. Marionettes are suspending supple various calamities. We stroll, my right hand clasped to your left. There is nothing wrong. What if it is in God's plan to transfigure themselves into nothingness? The language into which we put the order of stories from this kind of memory is a mesmerizing of sins, like the spirit soldering a sinewy sculpture, one which has no purpose but to propose beauty as it dreamily deteriorates across time's vicious expanse. This caused stun, the audience looked on. A magnet pools without shame, light organisms, orgasms, sometimes in the dark. Can you satiate the vast palette of this coarse vibrational reality? Beasts tamely touch flesh as it is ripped to smithereens. Dry sacrificial seasons, Dedication, deification of a goddess, a goddamn goddess, whose martyrdom is a someday touch dethronement, the periscope primitive phrasing of a nebulous fate. And this last one is just called Versace, Versace, Versace. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is some folks in cars commuting. There is community divided in Gilead. There is a dice game in Houston, Texas. There is a bomb in the dice game. There is a 28-year-old rapper shot dead in Gilead. There is a baby born in Cranky and Cranky St. Joe's Hospital. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a psalm in silence. There is a recycling pickup day in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There is a bomb in nothingness. There is a frantic exhalation explosion in Ukraine. There is a seagull a flutter in Gilead on the Day of the Dead. There is a crimson leaf departing majestic maple tree. There is a man muttering in studded, stuttering English on Chase Avenue. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead. Thank you. Hi, Woodland Patter. It's good to be with you again. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems to you. What with intimacy, the found object cast on a dark republic, a green spread of real estate, cute animal discipline, a formatted antiseptic rage. On such ruptured climes, we feel a rent calling us. Such awesome technology I have as my cynicism, the boast, the kayfabe, the amazing detail around a benign wheat stain. The performance was of wrathful cinnamon through a bright feeding tube. The president fogged what we saw as burning, as rent, as clever equivocation. Sing the hooded jack-up, attitude sublime, restive. 
transmission as the pain that is ordinary. A leak cements, cements an economy. Found intimacy rates. Much fumbled, tender and ordinary gestures cast into performance algorithm. These New England facelifts we thought would help as such strange and abusive vocabulary enters our limits. Salt Bay opens up about Bitcoin mining, enjoying a beer with a funny reason why. And today is a lot of sun, but tomorrow is never more than a palimpsest on the future, superimpositions on the future, impositions forming a country, and a string over the rousted people of our habitat. Colonized places hold memory till whatever comes home to roost can be repackaged. Pale memory. Slow motion nuke of trad bird brain makes a new sun in a closed mind. Points ahead, polar or voluble. Sex rolls on their tongues. Bedrock falling into nasty boys. Blind date creams. Illusory cubes of hate body action. Twitching fleeces closing up on long pale memories. Backroom sonnet. Not in that syndrome's room space, thoughtscape, staley swiping, wiping a mouth of air, a separate dazzle of dimension. The toggle must be satiated to sovereignty. Make view bigger until balance is plump, tight, nighty, the underwear stretched to view. It is such that it reduces my testosterone. I am more than Alaska, a cultivate of aerosols and awesome sauce. I must make my dream a room with a view, elaborating a goose that much more than I can explain here to you in a bounce house. Is this bad? To wanna and expand a hallway in your head space, a squirrel in a binding loggerhead. It is what it degrades. You can tell by what I offer to bring as a dish. I like to toggle and you can tell an adjacent room holds the master's minutes. It is what offers no view to nothing to view. The neonatalists. Genetic superior spud growths of Silicon Valley must be allowed to thrive on immaterial polyester mattress pads of idle and ridiculous thought. Calvinist egotism must supplant gerontocratic orbitrons in salved hardware. Who let the dogs out? Theistic carbon bars. Each human, a mixed bag of telegraphed automatism and profuse gravity, making molecules move through abstractions of suffering and bliss. Predicting the behavior of the sun, staunch billionaires fly perfect parallelograms through mushroom structures, bright with tandem quality. They believe their children will throng wetly at the timely abyss that is programmed by the thinking man's philosopher. They feed innards to their offspring when it is time to regale their puntings by sound of mooching artificial spray off planets of harried experiencing your cash dimension of scrolling stock, capital image generation, morning star veggie burger with the best minds of your generation. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Allison. Happy to be a part of another Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon. Um, late, of course, this is my late submission. Um, I'll read a couple poems today. Um, first one's untitled, it's usually how it goes for me. I don't get to really pick a title until um, later on. And so this is like a newer piece. Along Lake Michigan shores, the saltwater alewives have found their resting place. Their last drinks like mold on garden lettuce. They brought their heroics, and like heroes, there are too many funerals and the gravestones are unnamed. 
She once made a rock so slick when I skipped it. It brought a body to shore and I couldn't ID it from the last. She is tired of being dirty and also tired of us trying to clean her. She a giant womb for spawn. It has to be hard to be breathed into. How does she explain it to the children? Like a mother, she is tired. Like a mother, she continues. I watch a gull grab two parents in its jaw and swallow. I hear the eggs falling open against her size. All right. And then this next one is called Elegy with Locusts. This memory, pocket of time oozing with bodies. I scrub my air fryer so hard the Teflon cascades down the sink drain because I don't know what else to do. Their swarm, TV static. Perhaps I'm trying to recreate that with all my scrubbing. At the time, constant checking and swiping of the shoulders, back, ankles, their nipples, nightmare fuel. I once dreamt they were eating your flesh. I jolted lucid and reminded myself that you were ash. You turned to ash. The scrubbing sound is like their crushed knot bones under my bike tires and the goosebumps afterwards. They were an omen, a god wrath. I guess I can't help the fear then. Every time after, the dread. There is something to be said about not being alive to feel it. The air fryer forever caked in grease, and yourself scattered somewhere in South Dakota, safe from the swarm. Thank you. Some roads to knowledge do not lead where knowledge lives, cannot be explored by sugar-coated saints in white drapery, pairing their nights and days with tiny blades, hair thin and inoffensive, endlessly polite. The dream of correctness, the dream of power to correct everyone around them, one road down the border between two vast cornfields. The grass dances in the rain. Another crossroads plates the top of a hill, the dainty center, no man's land of August crushed toad. How practical these desiccations and saturations, difficult to justify. The avoidance of dung, avoidance of doubt, as though both unspeakable sins. I want the knife to open with a different sound, maybe a different language, the hiss of a sudden shower gusting against the webbed window pane, the dainty thumbprints, time leaves in the corners of the glass are different. My thumbs, small but not dainty, like that. The traces I leave are greasy, redolent of manhood and perfume. Flowers, a forest of trillium, may apple and trout lily. I wanted the knife to help define my parameters, to offer a type of groundedness or touchstone. I've tried to do that, find a touchstone in my body and in space I move through, and even space I love, tried to find a touchstone in others, friends, loved ones, family. I don't know my family, don't know what I am in there. I think my family has nothing to do with my body, but there's the blood, the mess of the blood, 
And always there's the madness, that white madness. Land made into image of home is no home. A stranger comes to town and tears it down, wants to build, thinks he has a right to remake the people, build the new home he will sit in from the bones of the ones who do not yield. He pulls a pelvis from each bearing person, pushes his hands in there, his cabin, he pushes his stone in there, his horse, its rough cart, he pushes his life in there. His life fills the bodies of the people, the lives he stole, the bodies he stole. Before they know it, there are many hundred thousand of him, and still it is not enough to sustain him. He says, to others of him. I will make of these people ships to use, to bring other people to use, to sustain me and everything that is mine, and they too shall be mine. And the days after that begin and end with the sound of an axe. Hi, my name is Ish Klein, and I'm doing a reading for the Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon. I'm proud to be a part of it. Ash Pollution and the Nobility. And the nobility are all dogs now. The minute I walked into the museum with its woolly mammoth and jar, I knew my home is a temporary display. This memorable mammoth in that room toppling the canopy bed, stamping the frame to splinters, African blackwood, the plaque says, mainly used for instruments. Oh dear, isn't there a copy somewhere? I have ordered the synthetic shoes for work, that and several supplements for health. The work I do can make one rather ill. There's an office ventilation problem. Also, our building is on a brown field. One must be proactive with golden seal, milk thistle, and myrrh. I can send you some. If I buy one more thing, the shipping's free. Hiding versus parasite, the inside. Necessarily, one tries to be worse. The attention of a swan, fox, or goat. I do not eat the rare hardwoods these days. One cannot eat adoration. And two, isn't adoration a kind of mess? A contaminated lake in the west beset by geese who leave and leave again the second time they're dead. Does this fix it? Dead bodies and copper combine inert. Oh, green computer. Oh, heavy, heavy. In your brain, a certain space. In the future, keep it pure. Now, this poem is called, um, I Was on One Roof. I was on one roof, part one one part. Commercials are constant for the shingle improvements, but the state of the floor, listen, we aren't going anywhere. What about you? To write it down at last seven days, seven days, a big deal for two of them. Seven days, seven days, seven dues, then creation. Do I mean yes to make this make its way to you? 
when a person is a loner, like in the movies, of course we knew, nobody says you stole, and it is hard when the first family you had leaves you without their signals. Why do you leave that way too? Part two, you were talking up the roof. What fixes this? A new word? I know, doi doi, with an I. It means I am an idiot, but also a good guy. Notice gifts, amico no, well then, my family. Your heart here, familia, blood, so I can see what you pass on. You don't have to do anything, we just want to see you. <coughs> here are your complaints. That can't be where you are only seeing who you call peers. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Fetus, the accusative plural of fat. Oh, my weeks break open. Wanting to deposit some relaxed formation in a holding pattern. What? A national award? That lets the germs in. Just take the money and bring your wolf. Do you capiche? Are the others so special? We are all very special who sing among remaining blood. Thank you. Hi, it's great to be back for this year's marathon. I'm going to read six bird poems. The Red-Bellied Woodpecker in Yahara Place Park. This goddamn woodpecker, postering spring, stuttering liar. I fall for every endless February. I almost love him for it. Chumpy optimist, scry awking bolster, ever shying from sight for his oral blustings, the lake winds blisters blistered by. Goddamn the beak that posits rescue. I almost said salvation, and sorry I didn't. In a gelid landscape there glows. The grackles are snackling and crackling in the down spackled sward to be. Everyone says it's a miserable April. Seems the gauding as huge grags in their green purple glitter bronze didn't get the signs right. I haven't seen an urban blue jay for years, but don't blame the grackles. Fewer hop yards than when the were jays were. We did see Grax on our honeymoon way down Mexico way, so I wouldn't blame him anyways. And like Cab saying, a chicken ain't nothing but a bird. It's Grackles, but not nothing but just, and this remains the kicker, R. In this next poem, there's an allusion to a poem by Eugenio Montale called Voice That Came With The Coots, in which he hears or remembers his father as he's watching Coots. So this one's called Arrivederci Coots Arrivist. Clots of Coots hand car near shore, not exactly. Fulcrum and ignoring silence, and have brought me no lost voices. Yet they black bob in session, too, on the rhythm gray water. Clusters of them de-vanish only to re, and will leave usually soon, as always, elseless, recursive. It's April, it's snowing, another way of meanwhile putting it as Brodigan once did, how is your ass? Etudinal adjustment. <clears throat> Cardinal improvising, the staking flag I'm told of his descending scale. Vocation, vocation, vocation. It cheers to misspeak. As a twirl, apologies to yes who's at tending the barble, we bollocks up to Wail de la schwa, my swervy alumbusist, dance us we, a distal thorn off a of the offhand. Still on the descend, the young old mastering master matriculates this cleared off as blue sky een. All my life and swoon enough is the day it is. There is also this kind of lonesome. <clears throat> Did you ever feel the verge like it loved you? Rilke's gaze grades, Thomas's triadic gas, or gosh, a gash, oh gee, Mr. Willikers, said the heap-drunk poet supreme not long before he died. 
Though when you die at 40, all of life is not long before that, and keener and more keenworthy still, the dolefully gone at 36 master of leaps and prebounds as though a real two searings bird swaying on a single sex. There is always no one to call, more than yourself, if only you had swerved to the spondence from D to runs, eat buns. If only unforgetting was a thing to be found, not found by, and if this be all for the taking needed, why by? I diced ain't I availed in the air to four and back again and backed against I ask so in uh, the second poem I made a reference to the fact that I hadn't heard a blue jay in years and it wasn't long after that poem actually this past fall when I heard a blue jay in the city again and I was very pleased and elated and so I had to write this poem called blue jays return Talon voice cross chalkboard sky make a good shudder. The blue, blue sky jays. I thought gone, gong, cheap medallions for against the urban death. Furble din rod arogma to welcome weight I doff to mint shiny coin of doma's lure to lure a strafe in lieu of recent red winged blackbirds. Glad to unneed nostalgia. J do va scratch across skype. Irreerasable as echo made origin of voice. Thank you. Films for the Zero, but if Pie. Oh, Thank you. 
This is mm. This is mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Fumsu, 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 First one is on sales, a jump rope chant for Angie F8. Eight. 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 Let's get one thing straight. You were much too young to go out on a date. Wait. Wait. Don't anticipate. When it comes to love, you're better off late. Fate, fate will lead you to your mate. You can't rush love or you might find hate. Great, great. Did I hear you state? I guess. The next poem is also an introduction to anatomy and physiology. What the hungry bird said. I smell them from the sky. Those wavy little lines are difficult to see, but wounds are on my mind. They look just like the ground, but hunger helps me seek, and patience lets me find my I dive and boldly walk through all the sticks and mud, and there I hunt and peck and catch one by the head. Or could it be the tail? I never can decide. This 
destiny so womb-like, my own digestive system. My last poem is also a spelling of Who threw this through the window with a puff and a huff and a half for the cough? I was hoping that no one would call my bluff. So I swam through the trough for the verses, but how could I hear? saw with the moon turned off. Then I jumped on the plow and I fed it raw dough. When I woke up, they gave me the keys to the cow. I can spell and I know how to read. And these animals love what I write. Although, when they tell me that spelling correctly is tough, I answer, for me, it's not tough enough. Thank you. Thank you for the A knife I use. As you sharpen the blade, a knife must slowly disappear. My great uncle Claude's butcher knife has a concave curve where a straight, sharp edge was plumb, and the poor just goes to. The world is with us. Or here old, late and soon, rising from the sea, spending, we lay waste, glimpses that would make little we see that is ours, given a sordid boon, creed, bears, the moon, moves, us not, howling at all hours, for everything, out of tune, out of tune, the world is howling at all hours. Hard to defend against argument you don't know exists. Irritating and sad to discover once again that I am captive to a second hand negative opinion of a poet for God's sake whom I admired without reservation or suspicion was his opinion born of jealousy, perhaps, disappointment, that a poem a person couldn't measure up, and now since he has died, I will never know as if that were ever possible, and besides, that is pointless speculation, though quite probably he could have changed his mind as I would like to change mine. No longer captive if I remain to this definitely inaccessible and former opinion. That's an excerpt from that that I'm trying to figure out. The poem, as written, sung to be heard, sung without attribution. How much of it is his word? And our quotations, his composition. And this is an old, old poem. Uh, a friend of mine died, uh, uh, Bonnie Rob, who, who need, uh, needed her, and uh, this poem kept occurring to me. Oh, sing the Noah's Peters, whose 
keep their leaves in winter and shield cemeteries upon the frozen prairie from snow for those we buried. The grass is green, after all, against what fire destroyed. The hills and black ashes, the grass destroyed is green. The hills, after all, in black against ashes. What fire, grass, what fire destroyed ashes and black hills all against green. The grass springs green against black hills fire destroyed. After all, the ashes. What each blade of grass is, is not another blade of grass. Thinking critically is empirical, an effort to discover something like truth. Thinking not an act of opposition, but something like tenderness, something like love. In those days, we learned a lingering goodbye met higher phone bills. Fifty-two years, just the other day, for Anne, waking, his hand touching her arm in bed as if it had always touched, as in a dream. Hey everyone, this year once again I got words from friends and family and included them in a poem that I wrote for the Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon. Uh, so I want to thank all of my friends and family that donated um, and contributed a word. I got 24 words this year. And thanks to Woodland Pattern for all of the great work that you do in Milwaukee and around the world. So I'll read the poem for you. It's called Dance Paradoxical. It said a girl, Pepita, watched in wonder as the common weeds she'd grown to gather burst bright red upon the Christmas altar. Or did she watch in horror that feeling when your friend bleeds out for Jesus, then a botanist, a Southern diplomat and slaver, saves her, takes her home, his home, and calls her by his name, Poinsett, for Quetla Shoshit, the flower out of residue proved unspeakable for the man, now set in bronze in the Greenville town square, patina setting in, petunias all around. From far away they come and leave their offerings, a book, a key, a bag of pretzels. What if we fast forward to forever, witness the fervor of weeds climbing over time to topple a foreboding citadel, a sisterhood of vines invisible sinister as feminism, blasting through the past where girls give thanks in the dance for fields of red and green. To those who have left well enough alone, thanks in advance. To those tossed like a dongle on a husky zermin collar, mushing to Mongolia as the owlets flutter faster than a man with misophonia from a pretzel. Come home, come in, brush the salt and snow, Friend, if we're ever scattered to ephemera, we must remember bliss. Even as the sun goes snowboarding inward, untoward the warm red days we hope to fill with hope, and cattywampus makes a comeback. Mothers, fathers, children, mentors, toppling a heavy past turn green. For what is a patina but a test of metal, a key beneath the petals? Go start something, go let someone in.
Hi, uh, this is Crystal Langwell. I am recording in Chicago, and I'm really happy to be part of Woodland Patterns Marathon. I'm going to read three poems. Tree Poem Night rain and another one buds out, the moon yellowy in its branches. After years of self-sabotage, I smell the daffodils at its base. A woman married to a tree couldn't describe the marriage, besides speaking to the tree daily, for decades, on land she owned. A safe arrangement for the tree, who could not describe it either. Clean, rural scent in my hair, I secrete a boggy musk. Buying the forest is no choice for a city tree with hazards. Gateway to the West Iron entry closed, secured from what threat that embers the nth degree of birth, dawn, seaweed, in American apparel, paid sex, some trovert seeking help at the seasonal whatever. Could severability violate the rust compact between friends with no futures? To freeze a heart, first make a simple mistake. Spidery ivy grows over the face of it. And this is called, I Build the Puzzle. Previously, the bad word was brutal and everyone wanted it from fiction, or it was real or weak, masculinity, muscularity, and the one connection, your train of thought. You, protagonist. That's the way men used to write before they got too afraid, so afraid, which is what I'm telling you about. In the bad old days, there was room for error, an abundance mindset for it. They laid the track quickly for a type of man who could shout his way through an entire evening. That man has never been harmed, despite his risky behavior. I build the puzzle that I have to unlock. I lay the track down before my own steps. I call upon the forces of nature to destroy any structure I deem irrelevant, even now. I bury my own resume in exchange for a set of tools in pink so I can read them. Each day there is a bad word and mostly the word is mucus or flatmate. While the yellow fire burns, a dark photosynthesis occurs yonder, and the films curl to blink out. The flame isn't hot, and we inhale some new chemicals that go right to work inside us. Our body temperatures edge up briefly a half degree, then down a full one. When we cough a little blood tomorrow, we can type it all out in detail to make a real record of what happened here while we simulated practicing transubstantiation. Thank you. Please donate generously to Woodland Pattern, um, and I hope to see you all soon. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm going to be doing a poem called your initials in burnt glass and I suppose it would help to know that it's also an elegy you walk through the doorway of yourself hold your head and whisper don't worry and when the damage falls from your mouth reach to collect it in a cupped hand offering you its emptiness to fill Streetlights above dimming, politely looking away, as I often did when you called from clinically white rooms to say, the pills are a mute button, but now there's so much space in this room, only to be greeted by me feigning preoccupation as if holy. But let's be honest, more often than not, it was my voicemail that spoke back. 
I'm sorry I'm not here, I think it says. Hi, my name is Angela Morris Hills. I'm excited to be reading at the Woodland Pattern Poetry Marathon again this year. It's always a highlight of my year, so I'm happy to be doing it again. Um, I'll be reading three poems from my book, Louder Birds. Uh, I'll just get started. Nothing to undo that can't be done again. On the first day, we ripped carpet from the room's bones, rolled it like clay, stacked ourselves into man and ate ex-Benedict in the breakfast nook. Light fell like a body through the ceiling onto our plates and we ate. Our neighbors were sleeping in our walls. We could hear them across fields. We tore the paper down, found we were equal parts inside and out, as though we were the windows our neighbors looked into at night as though our brights were on and no one would flash to warn us. On the third day, we laid our hammers on maps of places we'd been, tacked photos onto our cupboards. We'd forgotten plates and forks, took seriously what fruit flies confirmed about memory and sleep. We couldn't trust the water slapping the shore downhill from a sea of corn. The oak fence was barbed in the backyard. When it fell, nobody called to tell us. Eagle, coyote, turkey. On the eighth day, the farmer shot them all and loosened the sheep's noose. His collie chased everything to pasture. Maps of places drawn to scale. 10 minutes from a two week vacation, a van flips on an exit ramp. In a small town, it's the van is bigger. On the highway, it's just a van heading toward a hotel. This is global positioning. A man is ejected and the van lands on top of him. In a small town, a priest knows the man's name, but death does not concern itself with formalities. It also does not take the man whole, only his legs and anything else it can grab below the waist. At a Chinese buffet, death is stuffing her cheeks with crab rangoons, while a family stands behind her with empty plates. Nobody stuck to the vinyl booth finds you will suffer inside their cookie, but it's implied in the parking lot. A child breaks free from her mother's arms and runs headfirst into traffic. In the city, there's always, there are always detours, but in a small town, there's one name for each baby born and eventually it's on the lips of everyone in the street. But I to you of a white goat, a white squirrel, a birch tree, you of lips of snow adrift in streetlights, all the pasts that recreate a lifetime but you, whispered, stark, the maple limbs quivered as if to say two of white. It's spectral, the way your finger hushes my lips. And to you of me, a dull axe, all the lifetimes that recreate a past, the tall grasses and ditches, wheels collected to collapse, being unbodied, come settle between your high and low, your lap, a manic love to fold my wasted bones upon. Find nothing. There are whistles so pitched to be white. An open mouth in winter, a goat is 
as I to you the air. Thanks. We are looking at uh, a piece from a, the current project, American Pastime, one that was featured in the New York Rare moments when the refrigerator isn't running, we are susceptible to quiet. Next, you'll say symphonies of literous color to consume. Welcome to Litter Inc. Hunger and Thirst. I see blue cascade, waterfall, Mediterranean, cerulean, baby sky. Discarded Cheeto's bag is a mythic battle of light and dark forces. Welcome to Litter Inc. Hunger and Thirst. We take a sip, check how it sounds. Ever present fluttering in imagination. Hope perfect, perfectly devoid of purpose, propped against the curb, nestled into grass. Washed in rainwater, blowing free across soccer fields ad infinitum. I see quantity, scale, quality, a sense of hope and prodding inspiration. We become friends, invent ourselves to rationalize being, a priori aside, we shift toward one another. By this, I mean this. The only thing that is different from one time to another is what is seen, and what is seen depends on how everybody is doing everything.
She was imitating the great Gatsby, the part where a cloth is billowing on Daisy's arms by counting the words in each sentence or naming the parts of speech. And what she remembers is not what she wrote, but the sensation of the text billowing and floating inside her, a sound in the knees, a dust mote settling on the blanket, closing the right eye, watching with the left eye, the left eye marking the pen in its movements even as the right eye is open, the neighbor's flickering light and the car going past and the groaning airplane sound for a while. Scott studied how I stood and sat, listened to how I described the symptoms and asked if I'd had abdominal surgery. Yes, 45 years ago. The scar tissues, he said, had bonded to the layers of muscle and the small pole ever since had contorted the body. We lay on our backs, and as I struggle to say what happened, a large hawk or crow crashes into the boxwood and a cloud of sparrows exits. A single sparrow, a sharp-shinned hawk, flops out and staggers a few steps toward the house before flying off. Scott explained how we tuck the tailbone after trauma, that I'd never undone this, and suggested I release the six parts by imagining the tail we no longer have dropping to the floor. How did that feel? It felt as if it were opening something in me that was closed and had been closed since I was four, yet I couldn't say whether anything had moved. I had tears in my eyes when I left and since then frequently have had the feeling of being released from a torment I hadn't known was twisting me since I stood at the center of the sense that the oaks were spinning the first day I could walk again. The almost flat lawn had a steep slope, the fall leaves spiraling and making the sun flash in and out of sight, a feeling of being submerged, of having been written before by those older words, granted a new idea that being still him, the possibility remains of releasing what had been bound. I have since been remembering my searches for the scar by sight in the decade after surgery when it was plainly visible, and then by touch through the years the thickening hairs grew over it, curious which side it was on and if I could know. The orientation of right and left, so long seemingly known in the extremities, might never have reached the interior, a sensation I had again revealing it to Scott, pointing to the right side of my shorts, checking for the scar in my mind's eye while it switched from side to side before sinking into place, as in recent years I had not placed it on my body. As I stood talking to him, I felt I was looking in the mirror. Though I was not, leaving me unsure if a reversal or repetition would allow me to share it with another person, the tears coming in part at the thought that my body had been left to suffer for decades from this binding, but also by the disorientation that divided or perhaps doubled me. What needs to be accepted right now is the question someone was saying. The train horn blew, an airplane appeared over the bridge, three pheasants burst out of the primrose. It's nice to see these things again and again. Sometimes it's as, as if the play has gone to rest up in the flies. The actors have torn strips off it, the ends of which, for the sake of the drama, they hold or wind round their bodies, and only here or there a strip badly torn off drags an actor aloft. The earth rotating over my left shoulder turned the room more directly toward the sun, but at the same time the sun was also turning in galactic orbit, the motion hardly figuring into the coming and going of the day, the scar projected onto the body, flat and distorted to a degree one could navigate the sunlight in the yellow folded wings of the grasshopper where they join the thorax, black printed on the yellow. This is Lauren Russell. Thank you, Woodland Pattern. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be part of this marathon. Hidden Curriculum. A school of culture with no shadow is like St. George without a dragon. In the mosaic of my life, today is a lagoon fired in miniature. Tomorrow, I'm wishing well fractured in the heart's kiln. I buy a book about Pompeii 
where ruins are imagined back to life through transparent overlays. Is the inside of an eye an oracle? Is the inside of a mind an orifice? Is the inside of a lung an aria? A school of culture with no dragon is a natural born shadow. Two of us lie on a dock and murmur over a grandfather turtle's mossy back. In one of our mouths, a slinky blue secret curls onto the tip of a red slip shiver and swells into a gasp. Is the inside of a wish an ossuary? Is the inside of desire volcanic ash? Sunlight gashes a window in the Stabian baths. One of us waits. Inside every turtle is a dragon or its slayer. In the house of the tragic poet, solitude pulls her hair into drapes. No one knows it. And this poem begins with an epigraph from Hannah Emerson's Becoming Mud, which appears in the book Kissing of Kissing. Please love poets, we are the first autistics. Love this secret, no one knows it. That's Hannah Emerson. This is after Becoming Mud. No one knows it. Love this secret. The beginning of window is mud. The beginning of awe is tangent. Mud awes the counter top, lined with sprigs of dailiness. As fork kisses tongue, as gulp nurses secret, the arc muddy as the ocean licking it still. We were mud before dust. We were sunlight before sentence sensed along the ridge. We are fracture to egg. We are tin to periwinkle. All our secrets gather in maps of bird songs loved muddying trill. Thank you.
Hello, Woodland Pattern. I'm David Wilk, visiting virtually from Connecticut. It's once again a huge honor for me and a great joy to be here and to share some of my poems. This one is called The Pure Products of America. Food pyramids, vitamins, talcum powder, radon, arsenic, sugar, carbon monoxide, asbestos, lead paint, lead pipes, exhaust pipes, dirty water, heavy metals, Bilko doors, Sergeant Bilko, deodorant rash, double dash, free cash, welcome aboard, see the USA in your Chevrolet, the girl next door, I'm going to Graceland, it's Miller time, get out on the highway, blue highways, blue doors, blue Monday, stormy Monday, easy money, take it easy, La Bamba, the Samba, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, the Smith brothers, the Smiths, your hit parade, heart throbs, diabetes, moon pie, copper tone girl, today's menu, today's special, the today show, the tonight show, the morning show, your show of shows, the show me state, it's showtime. If the shoe fits, take the A train, take it and run, Tomorrowland, Disneyland, Jazzland, Southland, the fix is in, a stitch in time, serial killers, school shootings, drive-by shootings, campus shootings, shoot 'em ups accidental shootings, self-inflicted wounds, break jobs, hand jobs, hobnobs, breakfasts of champions, break for no one, duck and cover, cover me, I'm going in, be ready for tomorrow, and always, always be prepared. These are a bunch of sleep and uh, dream poems that uh, appeared sometime out of nowhere. When sleep elopes with dawn. When sleep elopes with dawn, stories tell themselves to crowds of unlistening hooligans gathered outside my door, banging to get in to join me here. They wanna take me with them. Their sky is full of noise. I wanna to fly to nowhere in particular, and then I do. Before anyone notices my arrival, someone calls for me to come home. My mother's back from the dead with a message I will not understand. She reaches for her stars, pointing to a future I can only hope for. And now, where she stood, a garden erupts. Flowers and fruits I will one day plant. So much for dreams and the worlds they beckon. In lost sleep sideways glancing, I can't hear or see, but in this poem, their stories will be told. Dreaming, not asleep. Morning dream, I feel I am asleep while talking to my mother. She seems not to notice me. Feathers in her hair, her ghostly luminescent fingers in the air, why am I so tired when she summons me, who has been gone so long? I should be wide awake. Now, as I remember her, I know my dreams are not visions, nor expressions of mysteries or unresolved emotions, just fragments of memories whose meanings have been lost. Why did my mother not speak? Why, oh why, am I still asleep? Dream or out. I dream anxiety, feathers, fragrance, falling sky. I dream beauty, light wind, turquoise stones, harmonized footsteps across desert shadowlands. I dream awake in the middle of the day, shaking hands by magic video transmissions skyward. I dream hungry elephants struggling to sing. What do they bring me? What do they say? I dream segmented star-shaped crystals broken by massive heat, demons struggling to be seen. I dream a serpent heart. I dream the last remaining wood thrush, every song of summer stark and dry, disappearing in full moon sky, just as night falls down upon us all. This one's a little longer. Bear with me, I hope it works. A fragment, a star, I love you. We're just fragments of a star, your dogs in heat, but it's not real. That terrific thing you wish for is the basis of nothing. So what or what else you said? I love you, I love you more. We hear static on the radio. 
Was it really Jesus who walked on water from terra firma to outer space? We've learned almost everything we thought we needed to know, except what we've now forgotten. We were so clever, so focused on desire, this destination, this fragment, this star. Now we are lost, and that's not even your dog. What is this place? It's such an erratic passage that got us here. No way, you said. There's no way out. Wake up now. I see you. I am behind you. I imagine your lovely eyes, fruit for breakfast, the day unfolding, the smell of flowers and eggs, all this, all of it. You cancel my indifference. There is too much to live for. Your incandescent light, your breath, your eyes, your smell, desire measures our hearts on fire. You are so warm. I love the way you say I love you. In the street outside, a child runs away. Her sky, this sky, elemental blue, so pure. A dog, a star, a riddle. Tell me why, or now be still. Someone is crying, my heart beats a drum. So it's settled. We come apart, we fall together. We love you, we love you more. But who is keeping score? Imaginary life. In my imaginary life as a poet, I came from a far distant star, speaking in unidentifiable prosody, star words dripping from my lips. I made a long journey through sleep-tossed sentences, muscle memory embedded in my stories, a hawk on my shoulder, crows circling as I swam through deep sea space. Whales tugged at my feet. I could hardly breathe or see. I relied on instinct and whispered instructions from I know not where. How I arrived in this place remains a mystery. Language is my only hope. I speak in runes and riddles and bits of songs. I am here to discover this place and carry home all I have learned. Do not listen to a word I say. I do not know what I mean. This is the last one for the Susquehanna. She is a bird or a river or a lazy afternoon in sunlight sky. She is clamoring to be discovered. This is, the moon, this is moonlight, the first light, the light of stars, the songs of desire and delirium touching flesh. She is a sphere, a photograph, a heartbeat in silver. She is bearing fruit, running away, running toward running. Home is where she spins across galaxies and stars, becoming visible. Home, her gaze of heart-filled Atlantic weather sheathing the earth. She is a bear, a lamb, a fox, a tree frog, a lizard, a hummingbird in flight. She is always here, always singing, always here. Where rocky land emerges from eons of chthonic sleep, fog rolls across earthbound hills, floating silence and song. She is a bird, a river, a sunset, dragonfly skipping a stream to, to dream. She waiting, always waiting to be discovered as a goddess will. Always, 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 all in all in all. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good night. Bye, Woodland Pattern. Hi, <laughs> Maureen Owen here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be reading today for Woodland Pattern Bookstore, which is one of the greatest bookstores ever to exist in the world. Um, and I would like to dedicate my reading today also to uh, Bernadette Mayer, a fabulous poet and writer who passed away recently and a very dear friend, always. Um, so the first two pieces I'm going to read are um, from um, Poets on the Road, which is a blog that Barbara Henning and I kept well, we traveled about giving some poetry readings uh, across the United States, quite a event. <laughs> um, and that um, this blog will actually be published in print um, this coming year, 2023, by City Point Press. 
So <clears throat> here's the first little piece. Too much wine, no doubt, and too much new and varied diet of the trip. Rachel brought me tea and Jamie's grandmother's soft fog-colored blanket. She was feeding Jeff the fish and told me the story. She said she hadn't intended to get a fish, but some students had brought in goldfish for an assignment, and one of them mentioned his fish was up for adoption. Rachel had had a good friend who died in high school, and his name was Jeff. When she asked the fish's name, the student said, Jeff, did you name him after someone you know, she asked. And he said he didn't know anyone named Jeff. And the second piece um, is titled January 26, 2019. Jamie and I take Luna for her morning walk around a few blocks and along the bayou. Birds are singing like spring. The bayou simmers blue in the crispy sun. Jamie has cousins and relatives aplenty here. As we walk, three boys go by on their bikes. We exchange hellos and Jamie says, that's my cousin. Growing up on the racetrack and moving from place to place, I marvel at what a sense of rootedness this must bring. Jamie, Rachel, and I go to Pensacola Beach. We head out under the famous trestle bridge known as Graffiti Bridge that Rachel took photos of daily for a year, recording the ever-changing graffiti art that folks add to and paint over constantly, creating a phenomenal book. Across Pensacola Bay, the Gulf of Mexico was just a skip and a jump away. As I walked up over the dunes to the water, I was struck by a view of the sea I'd never experienced before. Because of the way the dune dipped, the sea appeared to stand up as though a huge wave was suspended in air or held against glass. But the tide washed in lightly over a thigh deep trough where a man was gathering shelves. The sea was the color of illuminated aquamarine. The sand was pure white and soft as silk. It was an optical illusion of sorts that was overwhelmingly beautiful, and at the same time it felt mysteriously dangerous as the water stood up so high above us. Neither Jamie or Rachel seemed to see anything odd about the view, and I wondered if I'd entered some kind of altered reality after days of driving. It's a scene I'll never forget. We said hello to the man gathering shelves. He asked our names and said his name was broken. He explained that he gathered the shelves in the trough as they were not crushed apart as the ones on the beach were. He showed us what he had so far and his shells were totally whole and perfect like the scattered, unlike, the scattered, chipped ones on the beach. Not broken, I thought, reflecting on his name. As we parted, Jamie said casually how good it was to meet him. Suddenly worried, he asked, What did you say? Jamie repeated and broke and thanked him. I really appreciate that, he said. And then um, a couple of more. Poems, uh, newer works, not, not in the blog. A lizarin, a red pigment, crimson dye, bluish more towards purple than orange, or talking sky with socks. None the bolted arugula, scraps of motors, fireworks, damp undercover umbrage soaking in flora. To have watered the watercolor till washed it has fallen on the petals like a drawing colored so faintly traces are untraceable in the dense field of paper. When giraffes argue, they swing their heads, a sling on long necks, whomping each other on the side. Colloquially, they can be a journey of giraffes. A tower of giraffes seems unstable. Though a trilogy of hearts beat, theirs is no patience for being petted, 
despite a cuddly appearance. Sewing textiles, seeking pattern on my own. I cut up all my clothes to make them better. Now they just have holes, organdy in moonlight, spangled spots in place of fingerprints. Timid above us, heads in the clouds, over dry savanna plains, routinely struck by lightning, they don't drink much. And this last little piece, a uh, short poem titled A Twisted Cord Embroidery. There's a jacket you can buy in any store that sells Dior for $10,500. I'm not making that up. Happy New Year. I'm going to read a few poems for the Woodland Pattern Annual Poetry Fundraising Marathon, which is sponsored by um, City Point Press. Um, City Point Press has been very nice to publish some of my publications. Um, the most recent is How I Found Love Behind the Catch's Mask. And so I'll read about maybe five or six poems from that collection as part of this um, tribute to the Woodland Pattern Annual Poetry Fundraising Marathon. This is the title poem, how I found love behind the catcher's mask. All my life, I've caught hell. I never wanted to be a catcher. When meeting a woman, I never know what signs to put down. I never have enough protection. Once a girlfriend told me she was pregnant. She lied, but I didn't know it. A man can only see so much. I live a life of blueness. Behind my mask, a Buddha smile of suffering. Before dying, it's important to play catch with yourself. You don't have to wait for a woman to throw love at you. And so that's the title poem of this collection. This poem is called Losing the Lead and One's Children. Somewhere between first and second, the first bad argument begins like a failed pickoff throw. The marriage fails, and then the children have to dust their clothes off. The dirt and mud of accusations cover them like a tarp before a rain delay. The inning began as a honeymoon, a hit here and there, a vacation and job promotion, a new home before new troubles began. Another woman starts to steal the signs. You start to miss your children's games, birthdays, and bedtime stories. You're losing them to the monster inside yourself. The hungry thing you can't explain. The wild thing. The lust and desire. When your children cry all night, you know you're losing the lead. Things are out of control and there's nowhere to go. You're out at home watching it all disappear. As you can see, um, these poems um, about baseball are not just about the game of baseball, but they're also about human relationships, about marriages. Um, this is a poem entitled Ken Griffey Sr., the great baseball player uh, whose son is Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Sr. Even before my son turned his cap backwards, I wanted to keep him close, keep an eye on him. I didn't want to worry beyond the outfield like other fathers. I love watching my son play the way he watched me play or when we played together. Before the love for the game, there was family. And how we loved each other was how we hit when other men were on base. There were times when his injuries made me close my eyes. But my eyes could never close after seeing the beauty of his swing or the catches made near the wall. Baseball was good to us. History will remember us because we made history. My son's Hall of Fame smile, another RBI for the record books. And this is called Baseball Meditation and has an epigraph 
from Amiri Baraka. One man's fast is another man's slow. Because the game is slow, you have more than enough time to think about all the black boys who never made it to first or the bad boy caught trying to steal second. The slowness of the game makes you think of slavery and how slavery was too long and too slow for history to forget. Inside the park. For a second, at second, you glance out at the outfield. The ball is rolling, still rolling. You push your head down and find another way to pump your legs. During the Great Migration, Black people headed north from, fear, from the field to the factory. When your spikes touch third, you're a good paycheck from home. You're inside the park, sliding into America, not knowing if you're out or safe. And I think I'll close um, with this poem about baseball. And it's just a list poem of the things that we leave behind. Bat, ball, glove, cap, helmet, rosin bag, batting gloves, pine tar, cleats, wristbands, sunglasses, jersey, socks, pants, and the things we take, bruises, scars, the love of the game. And those are a few poems from How I Found Love Behind the Catcher's Mask, published by City Point Press. My name is E.F. Bert Miller. I'm going to read from my recent novel, Dreamland Court, published by City Point Press, David Wilk publisher, the courageous David Wilk. Johnny Dalton, age 34, is just out of prison. He returns home to find Jackie, the mother of his two young kids, involved with another man. Determined to win her back no matter what it takes, his opening moves to accomplish this consist of getting himself ripped off in a drug deal gone wrong, shooting himself in the thigh in a botched liquor store holdup, getting arrested at a drunken teenage party and then sent back to prison. The book has no narrative description. It consists of people telling their immediate concerns in a series of monologues. I'll only read a few. First, I'll give you the name of who's speaking. Johnny, our hero. Johnny, I just gotten off the hound there, LA's main terminal, right? And I'm walking out the big glass doors and there's this cop I know. Dalton, he says, now what the hell are you doing? Doing, I say, what do you mean? I'm just getting off the bus. No, Dalton, he says, not the bus. See that car over there? What car I go? And he points to some car parked across the street. That car, he says, that blue one there. Now that car is hot and I'm gonna have to run you in. Hell, Brownie, I say, I'm just getting out of the can. So why would I do a jackass thing like that? Well, I'm a little slow, so you're real fucking slow because he's already been yakking into his collar mic calling a black and a white. And I'm standing there twisting around with my thumb up my ass, watching it roll up, rollers flashing, sirens chirping, doors opening, the whole fucking bit, right? But I finally get it together. I mean, you got to, right? So, hey, Brownie, I go. How would it be if I just turned around and got back on that Oxnard Ventura right now? Why, sure, Dalton, he goes. You do that, that'd be just the ticket. Jackie. This is Johnny's wife. What would you do? Say your old man was gone and you found yourself with someone new. And say, without you meaning to, something good happened, something really, really good, and you really couldn't break it off, even though your old man was still your old man. What about that? Here's Jackie's new man, Carson. Carson. No, hell no, John. First time I ever saw Jack was way before I even knew you, man. She was getting out of Ed's Corvette, all right, at the 7-Eleven, okay? The one out by the Bandar had all them thin silver hooplets bangling on her wrist with that cool, druggy look, running her fingers through her hair, tossing it over her shoulders, looking right at me, 
floating her eyes across mine, and then gone, like taking me right with her, and knowing it too. Knew exactly what she was doing. You've seen that shit before. And it isn't like a dude's got any choice. And it's not just her. Bitches can do that one all the time. Was I a punk or not? So what was I supposed to do? It was never about you. It had nothing to do with you. No way. If it was with anybody, it was Eddie. Whose goddamn vet was she getting out of anyways? You ain't never had no vet. All you ever had is that crappy old blue pickup piece of shit you wrecked. Besides, whose piece of junk is that you're driving now anyways? Jack's, right? And she gave it to you? Sure, like in stealing her keys, right? Talking, this is Jackie. I have never met one person whose sex life is an apple pie order. Some say theirs is, but they are not to be trusted. If one person could be found with a harmonious sex life, I felt if I could find that person, I could begin to find out what is really going on. My goal has always been to be completely human to everything humans do. Johnny, you can't believe what other people say. They don't take responsibility for what they say. They even talk about their own feelings like they're visitors from another planet. You notice that? You know, like, this feeling came on me, that feeling came on me, and the next thing I knew I had, it just had down and was banging it on the concrete, or some kind of shit like that. Jackie. My heart was absolutely pounding. I ran into the bathroom and just stood in there. I didn't even think to call the cops. It was really nutso. I don't know what my head does when I get like that. I just get crazy. I was spitting on my hands and rubbing my the spit on my arm so if John grabbed me I'd be able to slip away. Isn't that nuts? Johnny, I'll tell you. You know what she said to me? I don't like you as much as you like me. That's what she said. And that there were psychological problems. Psychological problems? Fuck that, I said. There are no psychological problems. There's just other dudes. That's what it is. You tell me you love and care, I said, and then put a but on the end. I love you, but, I said. You don't know how to communicate, she said. Well, fuck that, too. I said, I know how to communicate. I communicate just like the East L.A. The way I communicate is out the end of a 38. You keep on fucking around with me, and I'll fucking any do it, too. Well, that went in. You could see it. It really did. She just took it in and then got real upset and real quiet and real silent, and then I looked at her and saw she was liking me again. And I just got caught out, man. I mean, I did. I just started puking my cookies up, man, kissing her, hugging her, telling her I loved her till death do us part. I was truly hers forever, all that good shit. Because the next thing was, we can't, right? There's this bladder infection, see, so no, we can't. But later, maybe later in the week, that as a matter of fact, she felt so bad she wasn't into seeing anyone. So I said, what the fuck does that mean? It means I'm sick is all she said. And then she said something that sort of hit home. You just push and push all the time, she said, and make me say things you don't want to hear. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why that hit, but it did. So I said, you mean I can't stay here? Not even tonight? Thank you. Those are the few. This is the novel. awkwardly placed here. Hi, I'm Barbara Henning here. Uh, thanks to David Wilk from City Point Press uh, for inviting me and for publishing a forthcoming book by Maureen Owen and me. Um, the blog from our poetry road trip in 2018. I'm going to read four poems that are going to be part of that book um, and are also um, included in my last poetry book, Digigram, by um, United Artists Press. Um, the first poem is entitled, On the Cue. On the cue to Manhattan, through the slit between my eyelids, an almost empty car, two women dozing, one leans forward, hair cropped, ear level, mid-sixties, freckles, arms crossed, head bobbing, 
as the train jerks the little brown bag on her lap, the other woman, one leg crossed over the other, shoulder length, glistening black hair, leaning to the side, head against rail, dozing, trading relatively quiet today, investors returning from Thanksgiving vacation, the car quiet, climbs over the Manhattan Bridge, behind the ropes and rails, the Brooklyn Bridge, dark scattered clouds, the western sun a golden hue, a six foot three inch Justinian cross over the World Trade Center, young adults brought here, as children soon sent to places they never knew. Underground we go, the conductor says. This is Canal Street, Chinatown. The older woman stands up, head still bowed, doors open, and then she's gone. The next poem is called String Ball, and I dedicate it to Naveen Mishan and Charles Blow, whose words I use in the poem. The body's organized as a square on a square, so says Yogi Naveen. I walk around Tompkins Square, all four corners. Surely this is the center of the universe. The goal in life should be joy. In La Rune Gar, the Chinese are tearing apart Tibetan monastic dwellings. Plan your life like a chess game. Move analytically with intent. It's very practical the way to attain joy. Even for civilians, trapped in Aleppo with artillery sh shelling overhead. Defeat in life is bitterness. Buck up, writes Charles Blow. It's over. The bullies in the White House, for the time being, alt-right is not a computer command. They're a batch of fanatical racists. If you're happy, you'll help everyone. If you're miserable, you won't help anyone. In Shuafat, a refugee camp in Jerusalem, Baha helps the orphans work, find direction, survive, then a drive-by. Ten bullets, one of the children will surely take his place. You can follow fake news sites from one to another, unravel the molecular structure of ribosomes, a tangled mess of rubber bands and coiled wires, a new pattern of income equality. Life expectancy in the U.S. declined slightly. Be careful. It's like a string ball. If we keep going around in the same direction, we will surely unravel. That was, of course, these were written in 2016 and 17. Me too. Rheumatic fever turns the skin yellow. A heart scarred. Soon my mother says, you will take my place. I wear her old stockings, dye my hair henna like hers smoke cigarettes, wear red lipstick, her fringed leather jacket at 18. At the sewing machine, my foot is hers, pressing the pedal. There's a murmur in your heart, the doctor says, but soon it will heal. In the afternoon, I birth a child, walk down the hallway in her turquoise bathrobe. At the zoo, an old female orangutan locks eyes with a young woman breastfeeding a baby. Yes, she nods, me too. At 37, my two children sound asleep, and all of a sudden I wake up, surprised to be alive. What about the others, I think? The motherless migrants, the refugees, the cumulative wound, rooms that murmur and whisper, remember me, take care of them, take care of you. And the last one I'm going to read is called With a Bang. With a bang, the hairy flower wild petunia flings its tiny seeds, sudden and far. How and why, the scientist kneels down, clamps a metal band on the pigeon's leg. Her initials and ID number, my broken toe, x-rayed, recorded at the Bleecker Street Station. An old man with head bowed, kneeling on cardboard. An overcrowded shopping cart, a sign, repent, the end is near. The Indian guru whispers, the only sin to harm oneself, to harm another is to harm oneself, to repent too much is to harm oneself. On the platform, the next generation leans over a keyboard, riffs, breaks, runs, his body hunched, fingers flying 30 miles an hour, all at once released, the seed spin outward, the bird flutters into the air. 
Thank you. Hello from San Francisco. This is Garrett Caples, poet and editor with a selection of City Likes Poets for Woodland Patterns Poetry Marathon. Hope everyone watching will support Woodland Pattern because it's one of the greatest poetry spots in the entire country. The following is just a small, unsystematic sampling of some of the poets I've had a chance to work with as an editor at City Lights. We have, uh, beginning with Will Alexander, broadcasting from Lawrence Ferlinghetti's desk at City Lights. Will was first published by us in the Spotlight series with, poet, with Compression and Purity, and we've just published his latest book, Divine Blue Light, for John Coltrane in the Pocket Poet series. He reads here from the title poem with the new collection. Next, we've got Man About Town, Evan Kennedy, taking us to Dolores Park, overlooking San Francisco skyline, for his poem, Last Utopia. This comes from Evan's Ovid-inspired volume in the Spotlight series, Metamorphoses, which is due to appear in April. Our third po poet is Los Angeles-born and now Oakland-based Mimi Tempest, who also comes to you from Ferlinghetti's office. City Lights has recently acquired what will become Mimi's second book, The Delicacy of Embracing Spirals, which we'll release in October. Mimi reads from the title poem of the collection, and it'll give you a glimpse of what made us want to publish her. From a secret location in the Fillmore District, the Cajun conjurer Micah Ballard is another veteran of the Spotlight series, author of volume Waifs and Strays. He's published several books with various presses since, and he's here to read a few short poems from his latest collection, Muddy Waters, published by San Francisco Micropress, State Champs. Finally, we wrap things up with one of the giants of contemporary poetry, the inimitable Clark Coolidge. This is a three-poem stretch from a recent reading he gave at the Mission District Bookstore, Medicine for Nightmares, from his lithic press collection, The Land of All Time. I include Clark because in the fall, City Lights will publish a new edition of his book-length classic, The Crystal Text, which is frequently cited as his masterpiece. So these are just some of the poets we've got at City Lights, the nearest ones to hand I could film on short notice. We also have published recently books by poets like Tongo Eisenmartin, Pamela Sneed, Stephen Raines, D.S. Marriott, Sophia Dolan, Uche Nduka, Bob Kaufman, Diane DePrima, Michael McClure, and the Gaza Strip-based Palestinian poet Musab Abu Toa. Next year we'll see the publication of Milwaukee's own Roberto Harrison in the Spotlight series. So enjoy the marathon and give these folks some money because they uh, definitely earned it. Divine blue light, sudden, ungraspable nomadics for John Coltrane. Not as phantom blinding, but the soils of Mount Meru, as quantum, as perpetual, as interdimensional kindling. Its hemispheres colliding as bricolage, as osmosis, as sonic notation, alive as sonic commentary phantoms, understood into themselves as stratospheric particulates, not merely as tense foundational structures, as a pronoun to be levied as simple sonic ramification. You understood this to be in the infinity of your heart, to be microscopic musical grammar, not unlike phosphates, as a syntax of symmetry resounding as an obverse mirroring of chords, analogous to 16th notes, rising and scattering of their own accord, much like the residue from diamonds that bake, not simply shrill supplication as noise, but as spectral realms of themselves being sonic blinding bodies that rise and loop and gather themselves on the other side of themselves, not as artifact or translated merger, but as explanation, exploration, but as exploration that summons, so that the sonic never wizens by pursuing entangled osmosis as complex utopian turquoise. <clears throat> and it was on this plane that you and Dolphy squared private comment 
into thrilling electrical prophecy that both forged and scrambled light so that amperage split apart and scattered across soil as interregnum. Being blizzards of grammar not merely emitted from bodies, but sound as hail from unknown wizardry that sired sonic thoughts and streams. Understanding such flow as transmuted acre. Can such emit itself from sounding boards of dust, never attempting to lean on criminal piety? all the while ignited by sonic invisibility as subdivided notation, as darkened gradient, as chain reaction. Coltrane, this evokes its merit as spontaneous rotation. And from your collective eye, a spontaneous emission of notes as you both assemble the once constructed Delilah. Its fragile figurines ignited as from curious poles on Saturn being ionized rotations spun from Rashid Ali, beckoning motifs from light, from minuses of hail that emit themselves anecdotal grammar. I am thinking of your sound alive as chronic pre-character as limited, limitless pre-clusters and figments as sonic and parallel to themselves as functioning domain as rhythm being astral space side as simultaneous visions of itself I think of the songbook that was Disney its apparitional proportion via chronic disappearance that reappears and spins its own subversion of itself. Not merely terrestrial subset of itself, of its anguish and its motives, aligned to rhetoric that blindsided and lifts as former body by vibration, other than the anguish motives that attempt to leap from protracted sterility. Last Utopian, Moon at Day observes the migration of all that precedes and creates you. Castor and Pollux, Nikolai Gogol, David Bowie raised by your apotheosis race orbitless, shaping from out there an exosphere, an ear canal, tracing your global travels, winters and springs. Earth is not finished, it's your friends who are finished when they give up on Earth and you as lost. You wish to populate the world with serene figures, near-life experiences, but you are tired of being last utopian, desolated, body ruined, no place or idea of origin, slick trail of selves left behind among others cold, noisy, thirsty. Trust thin antenna, hairs along ears curve, entrance of cave or hive, while you, last utopian, are at the mercy of surveillance and absence. It's unknown what takes the place of loss, but it will take place, so concentrate. Adjust to the constraint of being unable to read future poets now. It's just not possible to read them backwards, so they greet you where you are today. In the desert, red sun, your last light, your relentless seducer sets on western streets boulders. SPF 60 and you will still peel under recollected San Francisco sun. When the security guard in the Valley of Kings invites you to photograph Osiris's portrait and climb the sarcophagus, do not photograph Osiris and do not climb the sarcophagus. Just don't, don't trust him. Apollo the sun burns and peels you because he, unlike some you desire, is aching for your worship. 
He approaches you in Udaipur, New York, Prague, Rome, smiling like open door, saying no more bed bugs, chlamydia, friends air mattresses, jet lag, brain dead office, bike wreck, concussion. He brings you humility. You're little more than the eel wriggling to escape the sizzling walk in a viral cooking video ocean side, lid rattling over you with scallions and veggies, black apron chef fumbling comically for clicks in the merciless algorithm. Enter life elsewhere before life enters yours without your permission. Simple equations, atom clusters, friendships. Ask any atom why it does what it does and go ask a unicorn, selkie, chupacabra, nymph, minotaur. Sense all identity reduced to fragments. It's like a character from Ovid whose frayed, bleeding roots land abroad. But hold on, you are less utopian. Your investigations establish a self while affirming life, like your Wittgenstein sent as ambassador from the 21st century to the feet of Shankara in the classroom of ego death. The language of spirit is expressed in prepositions you say. Spirit is above, below, next to, and one hopes within. In defense of the self, you suggest that joy underlies every living thing. Once conditions for survival are assured. Watch the viral video of dolphin greeting humans, or the tranquility and delight of mystics, or the joy of children and dogs. All these are faith's basis with William Blake and Anthony, that curly-haired boy of unshakably good cheer met in a Baltimore gay bar. His mom said he was happy from the day he was born. You had been a walking negation that melted before his smile. Remember you've been kissed soft and wet on the lips by Iggy Pop. A sense of self initiates joy of encounter, curiosity, interaction. You hate and love that matter is essential to be greeted by others astonished, a consolation. It's so California, but mm, let's write it. The sense of self must not be extinguished. It should be named your name, which is the transient name of anyone, even those you loathe and risk becoming. You're laid on your back by mushrooms up in Joshua Tree boulders, February 2021. Delight in identifying with a repertoire of expressions in Kafka and Chopin. Your smile of recognition spans centuries, continents. It's a language like those not making art, but instead living life. I mean animals. Two ravens circle overhead, eyeing you for dinner. They think you're dead when you're emerging from a trance that was without feeling, without content. You met attributeless being, the animating force not in the eyes, but that by which the eye sees. As Judy Garland sang, that's entertainment. You're going slack and gray, face it, at risk of losing these sensations to which sex can rarely compare, though at times it exceeds imagination, and to which Edward Gibbon can rarely compare, though he indicates your decline, which is the fall of America taking place in you. It was enough when you purchased in that swarmed Kolkata market the gray-blue shirt that reads Last Utopian with a comma at the end. And that comma indicates the addressee you are becoming, handing over your rupees. It's Christmas Eve alone, among frantic yet cheerful bottlenecked crowds. They're wearing Santa hats, Easter bunny ears, devil horns. It's like every American holiday is happening at once. The delicacy of embracing spirals, duplicates a foreign tendency to graph the landscape. It dizzies itself to become peer pressured, grows through movement as time, the foot following the other, makes sound steps like wind howling, all I ever have be the roundabout draining through the concept of a mind. Her brain bears logic when magic decides to leave the room, I'm barely in my body. I forget to conjure here. I hone frequencies out of possibilities, masquerading as Sundays. I take up space. I take up moons. I swallow ecstasies. I grin big, forget a face, 
is what trains the world's eyes to fancy elegies, a meteor crash of a serious self. Like how drunk and high and heartbroken the streets gon' leave me every weekend. Laugh at the menstrual showcase of a conscious being, who you gon' be today? The tenacity fingering fiction of the human condition, whose face you gon' sing today? Linger to bellow without teeth. Align to a cosmic counseling, fly not to think, blend not to blur. The lines of irrefutable irony, the x-ray of a melancholic poet, drug addled, drunken demon, dreary drowning, desperate without cause. Who you gonna be today? Greet them at the astral. Tell them it was all a lie. Tell them this form is a second. Tell them to dread the spiraling, to enhance the spiraling, to force the spiraling, to manifest the spiraling, to embrace the spiraling, to distract the spiraling, to ride the spiraling to stop the spiraling, to obliviate into madness and laugh at the fickle trickster who knows when to disappear into it all. I forget to laugh during the descent, the same self, the same question, take it all too seriously, the iridescent subject, the channeler, the menace, the griot, the society and the society barking back at itself, brisk a dozen talks only to kill the self, I was never here. I am never here, the here is never here, the moment counts down to consent. Singularity in the electrodes of a heart monitor, charred teeth, charred soul, frozen nodes of fate awaiting the weight of its own feather and heart. Who you go be today at the center of infinite, the body proclaimed a black girl child. Each phase of puberty pronounced a testimony of humanity, yet the audience wasn't sold on the performance. Perchance, power be in the voice of the child, a pistol trigger warning the child wills an entity of fury through gritted teeth. The eye, it be collapsing. A primordial judgment to step foot on porous ground, philosophical unto extortion, burning passion unto exploitation, violent for preservation. Be the rage, don't perform it. Wear the rage, don't let it get stuck. Break the rage, don't fold it. Fiend the rage, don't fantasize. Surrender the rage, don't personalize. Drift the rage, don't escape. Stir the rage, don't let it build. Feminize the rage, don't father it. Transcend the rage, don't let it become you. Skull fallacies only to tell the truth. Be human always, but godless to your enemies. Be an enemy and reveal your palms to none. Appeal to no one and let your greatness parade for the masses. All the forces testifying for me to spit on. Louds forget that my gums have been numb for a pair of eight weeks. I witness my foes a road to bloodlust. Every tasteless and varied attempt to harm my spirit will make a star out of me. I never needed nor wanted an end in the first place. No Machiavellian setup can humble the God behind my tongue. Who you gonna be tomorrow? Reveal too much. Say nothing at all. Fish for compliments in a sea of sharks. Dress finely only to let the wolves rip you to shreds. Prance in their clothing every Sunday. Become a dusted metaphor or two. Pretend to be a writer. Fancy yourself a rock star. Scoff at the ridiculousness of a principled poet. Hear the spoken word slam, yet barely speak at all. Disappear into the key of destroy flat. Gaslight the imagination. Gaslight your mama. Gaslight. Your friends gaslight the city, gaslight the you that plays Hayoka on stage, gaslight the audience, gaslight the one man without a soul who claims to be your gaslight the audience again, gaslight the city again, pretend to have a name again, pretend to have a name again, pretend to have a name again, 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 pretend to have a name again, 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 transcend the spiral, die fiercely only to be born again. In the margins of this third eye, a monarch butterfly exercises the feeling of you to be blossomed out of chaos. Honor the softness that craves to emanate from you. I care enough to observe the spectacle of myself. Charred innocence lingers its eyes into slumber. Camouflage youth impertinent to maturation fly north to eucalyptus. Forget the previous iteration of a soul's territory. Aim to testify upwards at the sky. Build this life as a temporary home. Chime exhales. Brew a prolonged death. Cry for no more here and what was and what is and what migrates an endless topography of a heartbeat. The truest shape of me conquers into regeneration. There are no values stationary in this grace. Just an ounce of face daring to smile itself into oblivion. In order to heal, Accept the close proximity to annihilation. Your nearest deathbed is a mirror. It looks a lot like my eyes. Depart from ego. 
design a framework composed of lotus bloom and let your cynicism dissipate magic. I'm Micah Ballard. This is from a new book called Muddy Waters. Cajun One adds, I was raised supernatural, cruising every body into an impossibility to triangulate the gaze. I stay inside the carnage, a smog rainbow already prone to cement coffins and cheekbones. I dedicate their priestly craniums by depopulating popular opposites my coastal parlance zombify on the lookout and her mental repast of nightclub concerns. The second coming campaign shapes the evil into sure oblivion, forever offering, how does one get out of the guest list? I already received a Rome prize for the most out of print books. I am loyal and punctual to the sound, kind of oblivious, but do keep score. ultra dab. Sensitivity is my virtue, so I morph into all things, wobbling around in my wonderful burnt skin, talking him into windows to bathe with the cadence of unflattering daylight. In this congregation of zombies with bare midriffs seeking acquisition, I apply some blush and mascara and give us some life. Prone to vest up, I evoke another vortex and hug the air instead, then jump back into this wireless abyss of popular opposites, which you're totally not, but you're not, not. That's the sound of the Fulton Five going by in San Francisco on the cows, which is not strong. Balmy vapors. Unseen beasts, gleefully tawdry and average leech, vaguely stunned, smearing the walls of life study classes. I hold a new torch and record the sounds of darting eyes. Eventually cloaked as a perfect surrogate for my second coming campaign, I never ghost, just track their smudges. Like me, some of them vanish into isolation because the franchise comes first and spaces grow between atmospheres. I don't even know what that means anymore, but I hear it as it hears me, like physiogonic for forfeiture <laughs> or a need to reclaim and activate pleasure as a way to annul significance. In the jungle mansion, you just try to leak through doors, say hello, call it temporary, and again, try to leak the gaze. Uh, extra ushers with more buses. In this new book of telekinetic survival clips, I am glorified by outsiders from an inhabiting embodiment. Whoever passes first, don't apply too much rouge like they did to Mama. The hotel bed hurts, but I love a newfound understanding. I only got stabbed a little, some sticks and pokes with a weak big pen. I offered free ones from my homemade tattoo gun. Mixing my blood with theirs, you know, reciprocal manners to hone in and break down. If I have to, I'll make an excellent cadaver and an adequate victim. A repeat offender of imagination who vanishes into isolation into another beyond and deflate the gimmicks for algorithmic salvation. Secret Cargo. Pretty erratic, talking senselessly to myself. Is that you? I can't tell anymore. When I lay down, I dream of writing emails or having phone calls. I say all these things to convince you of something that I don't care about. And that hurts, and I'm sorry, but it's my job to convince the both of us that the world is okay, and it's not, and we know this, but you're trying to find a way out like me, yet I get to sell it to you to make a living like you want to, too. at the Haywire Brink Hotel for, for Lamentia. The poet comes on in the face of a felt rock, holds gas to an explanation. His texts form a litmus history, hits the mills for his syzygy. The falls have to get stared at, replaces the word nice with a loop, 
explains marriage with a tentacle, asks how long this has been going on, wanted to be a lawyer, a horseman, an enchantress, but now he can't, pumps many operas of cream to death of bastards, holds a bright, broken chocolate on the tip of his tongue, has never been to Shell Beach, asks, have you been found? Writes with a special eraser, asks for Castro the Barrelhead, grew up on insane linkies, it's jealous out there. His first book was called Open Up, it was conceived in a Studebaker up on blocks, drew the Lovecraft circle, heard a car, and heard a cat say, wow. <laughs> Could have been played by Joe Turkle, was heard to say, it's time, then all the light bulbs had to be changed. World of little glare. An accident, he smashed the fish, then shelved the beach, dropped a weak telephone, avoided spats, the dark were coming, an autumnal payback, bets only through time, rearranged architecture, outgrowths unrecognizable. Hey, your husband's daughter is his doctor. You must know this. He was carrying a case the last you knew. He may be too real, even silent for himself, or your grasp of hazard. The store window dummies speak to him now. They have given him the accordion chair. A face on the cattle head, a corridor instead, glad to see a man without glasses, the ways in which this world passes. I had a seat up there. First, you'll enjoy 3,000 pounds of jelly. Then this woman with a green face and a pair of razor blades, as they say, the motor, the moving finger writes, nine. Under no circumstances put that phone down. A Yokohama butterfly you know or you don't. A bath salt hotel, your room just went up. Inspector Best Service winds up just below, smolders and the light, the light sayings, dusty borderlands, large snake, a tooting horn at last, clippings in a beach packet, temperamental though. Scenes in which you don't get to see his face. Just who is this punk Lancer? A disturbing militant, cardboard witness, leading edge of the future. Here's my hand on it. A backhand, actually. My name is Claire Marie Stanchek, and together with Jane Gregory and Lynn Hegeniev, I am a co-editor of Neon Editions. Neon is a chapbook press with a special interest in uncategorizable forms. Neon is the name, as Wikipedia will tell you, of a letter of the Celtic alphabet. It is also the name of a Celtic zodiac sign and refers to the ash tree. In Celtic belief, the ash tree was thought to be sacred having the power to enchant. Its branches were used as wands and as broomsticks, instruments it would seem for magic wielded by women. In Celtic mythology, the ash tree is regarded as the world tree, reaching with its vast height into the heavens while spreading its roots deep into the ground. It thus forms a bridge between worlds. I'm eager to introduce the five Neon Editions poets you'll hear in a moment and I'll introduce them alphabetically by last name. Roberto Harrison, Matthew Rana, Ed Roberson, Ali Warren, and Mia Yu. Roberto Harrison's books include Os, Counter Daemons, Bicycle, Culebra, Bridge of the World, Yaviza, as well as many chapbooks. With Andrew Levy, Roberto edited the poetry journal Crayon, from 1997 to 2008. 
and he is also the editor of Bronze Skull Press, which has published over 20 chapbooks, including the work of many Midwestern poets. Most recently, Roberto served as co-editor for the Resist Much Obey Little anthology. He was the Milwaukee Poet Laureate for 2017 to 2019, and is also a visual artist. He lives in Milwaukee with his wife, the poet Brenda Cardenas. Matthew Rana is an artist, poet, and critic living in Stockholm. His writing has appeared in Art Agenda, Camera Austria, OEI, and Jacket 2, among others, and he is a regular contributor to Kunstkritik and Fries. He is currently a PhD candidate at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis, University of Amsterdam. Ed Roberson is the author of 12 previous books of poetry and the recipient of many honors, including the Jackson Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. A Chicagoan since 2004, Roberson has taught at Columbia College, the University of Chicago, and Northwestern University. He previously served as a special programs administrator at Rutgers University. Ali Warren is the author of Another Round, Selected Poems, Little Hill, I Love It Though, Here Come the Warm Jets, and over 10 chapbooks. Winner of the Poetry Center Book Award and twice a finalist for the California Book Award, her writing has appeared in Harper's, Poetry, The Brooklyn Rail, and Bomb. Ali has lived and worked in the Bay Area since 2005. Mia Yu was born in Seoul, Korea, grew up in Northern California, and currently lives in Utrecht, the Netherlands. She is the author of the poetry collection, I Too Dislike It, and the chapbook, Objective Practice. She teaches Anglophone literature at Utrecht University and in the critical studies program of the Sandberg Institute. Please welcome with me these five incredible poets. Hello, I'll be reading from Sundial, which was published by Nyon Editions in 2021. Raise the blinds as soon as you wake, greet the sun, say hello to the plants. You haven't been drunk in many weeks, which is not to say you haven't been drinking. At night, the day is afoot, animating an ongoing orb, coming and receding in as many directions as a tumbleweed in the Santa Anas. The car just sits there, and in it, a collection of those unable to propel themselves against the current in water or air, and so too with the lights in the landlord's house. You nudge and arrange the missives and lures. Simmering corn porridge, medieval sage ale. If it's April in your life and the prophet is the poem a predictive star, you long to abide clockless time by fields of shimmering shadow and shade to bring a feeling to the fore without using words to do it. Now try it with thought. Marvin Gaye says, let your love come out. Then he says, let your love come down. Robert Gluck says, wisdom is just subtraction. You miss elsewhere the ache of watching anyone depart, just checking in, just making sure you made it home safe. Your friends are your memory. Your friends remember your life for you, how it was on a rock of fervent sun with your leg in a pot of coldest mountain soup or your paws swaying down to my sweet lord. Today is a killer on the flip. Your friends say to you what you said and did and how you felt and how you said you felt and that's what saying and feeling is. After which you need a spritz for 500. Alex, what is the news? A chorus chanting, we want work. What the chorus wants is other people serving norm, oily and gasping weaponizing wings, hanging a chain on a chimp. To scrub away the day, splurge and scald in the shower, make up your mouth a basin and spit, an exercise of incorporation and rejection and no dissertation to ruin the feeling. And you don't have to be about worry about getting wet because that is the purpose of this room. The point of this dish is salt and time. The recipe for telling time is conviction. 
bottle cheer is neglecting fruit till it gets funky in time, which casts a shadow on the dial. What a seed wants is light, and what you want is water. It is easy to look at your love, always making an endless list. Curry fixed in a brick, bed of Oha Santa, many moons but the self-same moon. When you talk, what you talk about is work, wine, air, plants, yeast, debt, food, jobs. Those who don't talk about money usually have it. When the government runs out, they just print more. Not Harriet Tubman's face or those abominable fathers. The only thing that should appear on money is flames. To build a fire, notice your unobstructed view of the sun. Carry kindling in your pocket along with your heart. If you wake up, you are alive, and the outside is the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is the world. In patience, there is ripeness. You can smash a thing to bring it to bloom, though fruit of its own making may be sweeter. There are words you will likely have to say to keep a job, to pay rent, in order to live. Put your body under dogwood and no poppy by the orange smear, swaying in a way that thankfully can't be human. Turn your face from no plant, butter the bread, lift the tunic, rip off the big box. Your job is just a job. Walk into the green, pat around the new growth, steal a day back. February 24th, 2022. I find myself here through disaster and forgetfulness, and I have not known the center of the fire. If the same could be said for the others, then I will not sleep in the country as a promise of night. But my skull is made as a flower, and my body has sprouted to sleep in the earth where the others are. And my form is gone for the ocean, to fade it along with the blood. We make night and the weather is answer, and rise through the salt and the smoke of the moon through a song. A kingfisher path for an origin state. Many rivers have knotted themselves for the kingfisher of my nighttime wash in the distance to have a stand again among the pines that fall and do not know the water. Every time I see that there is a call to make the light stand in color and to put off the rooster that crows there in a distant galaxy known by the others as a kingfisher without the bigger people of America. In this, my red and black starlight that sees a kingfisher and does not know it, in this that I unravel for a table that stands between us, I swim back to the skeletal shore. Through these lines I must see that the bigger people of America have lost themselves in the asterisk, in the center of darkness that I unravel to call my own. In the Kingfisher story, there's nothing of the lake, of the atmospheres, that we must dissolve to remain otherwise, in our meaning in the last, not made for tomorrow. All of us now look to the red and the black, before the suffering of the night makes us flesh again by the roadside, to live in the net of exception. All of our minds are ripped, to exclaim that the kingfisher gives the eagle, the osprey, and the loon, because I am the loon again, to make circles and spheres remain in the morning, as a desperation of all the televisions rots. My numbers have not known it. I am not seen by the shore that I calculate as ours for the robots. Behind the kingfisher stories, that call us to begin again outside tomorrow. I do not see the kingfisher. I do not know it, except long ago as I lost the shore of your mind to the water. 
My door retains itself to keep mourning within the night. I dissolve the numbers again, as I do not lure the fish for the kingfisher. The kingfisher is a bird that I knew was here. It is the omen that I carry through war in the service of my reception to the morning, as we all must delete the faces that do not receive when something comes to start. My radio needs the heart of the kingfisher too, as we all follow the semblance of night with a semblance of morning, delayed without the earth. We walk and we inject the water with animal intimacies as we speak to make lines become our entrance to the exit of life. Something moves there as we are to receive it. But I do not know the kingfisher. I do not know that there are others who have moved inside us to wash out the oceans to the sea as we must make ourselves a body of destination. Our bodies become like origins and are not in the service of parchment, parched and dying, of thirst to the problems that serve as the keys to the mountain, with the death of the kingfisher there in the egg of its origin, headed for the fountain of light. My escapes have become like the service of every answer, of the separation that dissolves to make us come together in squares of electrocutions, headed to discover the other world far inside the earth, A for the start and Y for the middle, Abia to mean and Yala to hold in the darkness. I'm Ed Roberson. Uh, I'll be I'm reading at Woodland Patterns. Um, I'll be reading from um, m m from Neon uh, Edition, my, uh, my new book, Aquarium Works. Aquarium Works. When the shipment from the Amazon arrived out of quarantine, we ran up to watch it from the roof crest the hill from the airport and lined up to help unload it to the tanks. The piranha dove to the bottom of the plastic bag and bit the shit out of Bob's hand. Everyone remembers George's eyes when the shippers handed him a Cayman alligator to carry. The new world sound of Herbie feeding his rattlesnakes sent me down the hall but drew George like a smell of bacon. And here he was, a tape mouth longer than his arm of a crocodile or alligator, whatever, in his arms. When the Herpenick Society met at our site, we got a commendation for the best piranha exhibit. All three species, more than 50, without eating each other in 24 hours in one tank. I fed those little fuckers for weeks up to the meeting. When their breeding colors lit up, I got worried, but they were too satisfied to even feel challenged and put off eating each other to narrow the vying fullness for a mate and ate into the abstract rhomboids and blacks and reds prizes for themselves. How breeding shape can be the colors of just beautifully healthy. On my sneak time, I'd head up to the cat house, the lions and tigers, and have coffee with the keeper there. It was nothing but a diversion. My fishy salt water for his walk up the hill at night to land in the above water sounds we can make in the open there. Caged in a city zoo at a night shift table, just us two, a quiet lapse in our work among the growls and bubbles of the usual until I noticed the leopard 
walking the wall sideways after getting up the speed to shift the world on its side and free himself from ourself of the universe's dimension and coffee our shock spit. Like seeing you standing up to your ankles in Monet's water lilies perpendicular to the wall would be seeing that leopard walking towards me along the wall of his cage to exercise his ability as his freedom, his being outside what we thought we were seeing as possible, seeing the rest from a stilled seat in that cornered rounding, the so much larger pounding ground covered up to me, facing me this charger. The visitors don't even notice the octopus balled up where the skylight aims the sun some days. Other days, spread, plastered, its whole wall of tanks 20 feet, its strange belief. I found it found to squeeze through the plumbing out of its tank, crawling atop the next, having dipped in to visit for a breakfast of vexed occupants. I couldn't see why they were missing. Then there were its angry days, wild dances of contraction and throwing its explosions through the water. Its learned boards expanse from downstage. It would rush the glass and open screams from the outside viewers. I often wondered if it made them its talk with and the response to the unknown. In every guise, a destitution, ardor of all conditions, ardor of time. House without doors, a narrow architectural complaint. Ruination, ardor thought not lived. A wanderer, the body's ardor. The ocean's ardor, a pearl. Imperfect madness, the aleph of metal polish. A poltroon is bereft, my clothes are bone dry, the sky evokes Daoud's style. Madness embraces the departed, its people, a collar tightened. Rent since I left with his lips, his tongue tattooed lem and aleph on my tongue. Thus began my lesson in ardor. Thus began my profession of faith. Our dewy ardor. For a long time, we drank on credit. Don't ask about the extent of the madness Daoud, the holy tavern, where even azure is wasted. Beneath the eyebrow, there ought to have been an eye at the foot of the wine cask, there ought to have been 
order. The tavern is full to the extent that the bar is stocked. The hangover isn't worth the price, Daoud. Our days are nearly spent. Caught in ardor's snare, thought brings no reprieve. I... Bathed in the impersonal. We lived alone. I licked a texture and it moved. How the wilderness grieves Daoud, the tavern grieves this house. Stuck in traffic. The Aleph delineates our lane. Ardor emerges in flashes when measured. A montage of years is a montage of grief. Do not be deceived, Daoud. Lightning throws the sun, the sun throws lightning, worlds unthought. The name Rausch is likely linked to the word raus, which in Dutch refers to noise, a disturbing sound that doesn't stop, a collective term for disruptions in human communications, an arbitrary variation in a signal. It's what we see as a snowstorm on our television screens, a random dot pixel pattern of static, where snow and static become synonym, where seeing and hearing become homonym. It can be defined as white, pink, violet, surface, internal, external, thermic. It lies somewhere between a rustle and a rush, like the petals of a rose tangling into wind chimes just as a cloud arises. What appears as a disturbance, disruption, or random variation can become a mutation, can become characteristic, can become language, especially if it doesn't stop, if it forms a collective. An example of rouse in communication is when a speaker uses more modes of expression than strictly necessary. Another example is redundancy, a speaker repeating himself while speaking. Such circularity arouses, gives pleasure, reassures us of the variability of the invariable. After all, definition is a still life, a well-crafted ruse. So what can translation be but noise that comes to rest into song? Still, that song curls against the form of a question, asking again and again when there is a rest, what is a rouse is a ruse is a rush is a The painter fell in love with things as well as people. She would fall in love with the moss she scraped off the bottom of the forest floor, the butterfly wing she stamped against the monochromatic paint in order to enliven it with texture, the glass jar that once held a salamander in her firstborn's placenta, into which she now weaves poppies, cornflowers, honeysuckle, and thistles. What were people but a composition of things, their lives just prolonged moments of such things held together, preparing themselves for the next stage of dispersal, rearrangement. But this didn't mean she wasn't sentimental. She loved her husband, her 10 children, the bees she scooped up between paper and cup in order to release it through her window, the embalmed fetus for which she plaited a crown of forget-me-nots and wrapped a bouquet of cherry blossoms and pansies with a silk ribbon to place in its small curved hands. She loved her long life, the two decades she outlived Rembrandt, the four she outlived Vermeer. And why not? 
If one insists on admiring the riotous red veins of carnations, the fine lace edges gathered blue as cornflower, the iridescent open parenthesis of the dragonfly, one must love the moss, thistle, shifting shadows in the background, offering to hold it all together. The painter even loved what the poet wrote. Every man and woman is free to accept or deny life, to accept or reject this questionable gift, this thistle, these shadows, this vein, this rustle, this ruse, this rush. It's not that the little tokens of life, a pearl, a button, red cloth, nail polish, and offering hand become ornaments for death, but rather that death and life are simply variations on the same arrangement. Here is a tulip smashing into a peony, an iris and two carnations swept out of the way. Here's an oyster shell resting next to the vase, its muted luster akin to petals wilting or fallen into compositional shadows. Here is red and pink and orange, but behind it, beneath it, is gray, gray, gray. Which part was the part of living? Which was the part of dying? An architect in Vienna whose name you understand as empty or false once wrote, weep not for this is what constitutes the greatness of our age. We have of overcome ornament. We have fought our way through to ornamentlessness. Behold, the time is at hand. Time is at hand like a velvet pouch that opens to show the valves of a heart with the thumb and forefinger maneuvered and injected with wax and resin to clutch at the corners. Is an ornament still and after all a comfort? And as it is, I can place an empty shell on the table. I can fill this gray background with the delicate gray shadows of drooping leaves and insect wings. I can turn red blood into clear water. I can make myself hear the static behind the song and I can say you are there, there, there. Hi, I'm Carrie Olivia Adams, the poetry editor for Black Ocean. As a small publisher, Black Ocean relies directly on the support of independent booksellers like Woodland Pattern, who share our dedication to bringing poetry to a diverse and engaged readership. We are so grateful for the work they do and are excited to help promote and contribute to it. And we are really thrilled to share with you the work of three Black Ocean poets with new books. Hussein Ahmed, who has just published his debut collection, Soliloquy with Ghost in Nile, Hussein is a Nigerian poet, translator, and environmentalist. He received a 2021 Barry and Susan Hanna Award from the University of Mississippi, where he is currently an MFA candidate in poetry. We also have Sadie Dupuy, whose new book Cry Perfume came out earlier this fall. In addition to being a poet, Sadie is the guitarist, songwriter, and singer of rock band Speedy Ortiz, as well as the producer and multi-instrumentalist behind pop project Sad 13. We also have Brian Foley, whose second book with Black Ocean is There Must Be a Reason People Come Here. Brian is also the author of The Constitution from Black Ocean, and he has recently relocated to Chicago from Colorado. Enjoy. Thank you. Hey, I'm Sadie Dupuy. I'm going to read a couple poems from my book Cry Perfume, which came out uh, October of last year with Black Ocean as part of their curated block for Woodland Patterns 2023 Poetry Marathon. So thank you for supporting them and all the important things they do for poets and writers and hope you enjoy some of these poems. Crystal Thinking. Dream logic gets my sober companion drunk, vomiting silver in the private beehive of our wagon. I went to the cemetery and played you a too fast solo. Mud seeped in the ass of my off black jeans, immobile on the morbid floor. Warmed last night with a controlled bedroom burn just to plainly sing a song you danced to maybe 
time tape loops when I come here, abducts, even without Crystal or Craig, gathering shells and birthday candles, I line them flush to you, whispering love in skunk-hallowed territory. Poor me, but a possum only lives two years. Baby, hyperventilating to his soothing music and cracked window, trimming the crusts on my stories. This one's called Chateau Marmont, but for free. Diagnose me, interleaving the peppers in my teeth. I try to let lay my passive nature, but I need to get given the loot. Hold cursed coins in my hair, darn stockings from gold spiders in the bungalow, where I dreamed my masterpiece and lost it over a morning's gallon. Hammocks are for the purgatorial, swaying aspiration of suspense. Neither here nor there, but there. And for peanuts, closing my throat as I swallow the world. This one's called, There's No American Beach You Like. I'm a troubled genius and that is why I need the ice cream. Melting down in the bathroom after falling on accident into her nudes. Molten me slides down the drain and comes up another shower. The surprise attack you replay so often it splits the universe. Just a regular monster with many sick beats. I take braids from she who shouldn't. I build a nest of small fingernails. It is a prudish and puritanical nest. It's not the same as pure, but I am. Listen to my brilliant beat. Modeled by cavity. Marbled by overgrowth. Crusted in the bleached sugar I take to sleep. I'm gonna read one more. And it's going to be called, in fact, it is called, One Sight Posts to the Other. It's not cathartic crying on an exercise machine, just a bright migraine I self-induce. Bees in the gag now, snotting into escrow. Each day my face is unrecognizable to me making it hard to establish a cosmetic practice. Tried to get into myself so much I locked me out. Beautified, a draconian tag that needs to get low. I die by the record and undie. If the DJ plays my song, I crown them queen. If the DJ spots me in the crowd, they know before I do whether my mask is really this scary. Thank you so much. I'm Sadie Dupuis. I've been reading from Cry Perfume. Thank you for your donations to Woodland Pattern 2023 Marathon. Hi, my name is Hussein Ahmed, and I'm the author of Soliloquy with the Ghost in Nile from Black Ocean Press. And I'll be reading you some poems from my collection. Flight. The day an airplane crashed, the air became heavy with the aura of mouth, saw with grieving songs. I was taught to plead with the fire in my broken tongue, as would an owl tired of nocturne. Today, we celebrate everyone that died in flight. Everyone who had a name similar to ours. I felt all our dead reincarnated in me today. My body is now soundproof. I do not recognize the songs that slip out of my mouth. 
how the war made us a name. Before the war, we had names we inherited from the dead. They keep us warm until we start to lose those names to the wind. The long corridors in my throat are of tinted glass windows. All that happened belongs in the darkness of what may wash up the memories of all the dead. I wake up with scars on my arms and it surprises me that I still feel dead after gulping a cup of pap. I feel strange in my father's frock too, even though it keeps me warm. I need all the heat I can get today so the eggs in my body can hatch and be set free to make nests. Far from here, where they would not be hunted to deliver our obituaries and envelopes that are large enough to be registered, wherein our names are written for each condolence visit. The war made us names too much to keep up with. We learn to escape the burning before we learn that every name we inherit comes with allergies. I threw a harp inside the fireplace and he poured out the tune so once heard Baba played on it. It stopped when it got swallowed in the flames. All we inherited still burns. Aftermath. We dug the ground so many times burying a dead body or sowing a seed, both of which did not grow. Our graves are colored as the suit from a lantern gasping for fuel. My neighbor gave birth when silence was all that can be cherished like clean water gushing out of the rusty mouth of the chap. She was brave enough to have sealed the child's mouth when he was not suckling her nipple. Baba amends the house constitution. We must punctuate every 10 minutes with Ayatollah Kursi for protection. It must be in whispers. This is how you know the people are tired of digging. Our Baba sits around the bonfire of the peacekeepers. Their hands cup their cheeks. The sun creeps upon our dark faces. Again, we excuse the intrusion. Mama tells us to dance when we can. It could be the last time we hear her sing. Satellite phone call is a form of supplication. I make supplications to the birds whose feathers were blades lost in war. Birds whose bones could no longer be found in the museum because they flew over the face of the sky in a time of climate change. I come from a line of hunters who did not wait for darkness to come. Instead, they sing in the woods until a deer comes too close to the fire and becomes frozen in the rays. I make supplication to the owls that died in flight. Love letters clip between their beaks. It never gets old to open my mouth to show mama that I have her brown teeth. She carries all her grief with ease, like feathers on the bots of arrows traveling straight lines. I make supplication to the hands, decorated with henna, though it loses its hue to the water during ablution. I make supplication to the stitches on my mother's stomach. It was the first sign that I was born to make a map from the scars she inherited from spreading her wings in the wind. Hi, Woodland Pattern. Thanks for having me. My name is Brian Foley. I'm gonna be reading a poem from my newest book called uh, There Must Be a Reason People Come Here. And it's out on now on Black Ocean Press. And this, uh, this song <laughs> is called Integrity. Dead are our sentences mutuality if our organisms be ignored. 
I feel my nature trying to get me to grow out of invisible with these productions morning glorifies into a mystic quiet. Oh say, I open a newspaper and it takes me to the nearest nervous house of bells. Soon there will be a past, its blood locked in someone else's epic. You wear its uniform. I smuggle each day free from nothing but its doctors. Thank you very much. Hey, Woodland Pattern. Hi, this is Eileen Miles sitting in their apartment in New York with weird lights all over the place. Let me see if I can get to a better angle. Um, I'm, I'm the editor of an anthology called Pathetic Literature, and I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction, and then um, several of my authors are going to read, and we will be known as the pathetic, um, the pathetic area of the Woodland Pattern um, benefit. Love you guys. Love wo Woodland Pattern. Um, so I'm going to just hop around in the intro and read a few excerpts. In general, poems are pathetic and diaries are pathetic. Really, literature is pathetic. Ask anyone who doesn't care about literature. They would agree, if they bothered at all. Perhaps the only accomplishment here is I'm saying that as an insider. This book is kind of hollow. All these pieces of the rock... There's 106 authors in pathetic literature. All these pieces of the rock, meaning literature, long and short, are just what I like. The invention of pathetic literature surely is Say Shawnigan's The Pillow Book. More than a thousand years ago, she kept her diaries, her interminable and adorable lists, her sovereignty to herself. Now, I'm assuming that you guys all know who Say Shawnigan is, and The Pillow Book is a, is a kind of a diary from a thousand years ago that this courtesan on the imperial court um, kept. And it was her pleasure. It was a list of all her pleasures and her spying on people and gossiping. But then somebody read it. So she was kind of busted and it wasn't as much fun after that. Being discovered, she admits, kind of ruined things. In light of our different pace, I'd say we're ready for ruin. And now I'll skip Let's see. I've collected whoever is in here for their dedication to a moment that bends. Not in a gay way, but you know how when you're walking towards the horizon, it seemingly dips. And you feel something. That's pathetic. It's an empathetic thing. The light shifts, and biologically, we turn to. People get different. Take the word crepuscular. And I, and I like to laugh at this word because it's such a bad poetry word, right? I mean, I never saw this word except in a poem in some magazine that I looked at on the 60s or 70s. Um, take the word crepuscular, the blue moment. Some creatures only come out right then. A lot of the world is trained to think of that part of existence as vacation or what happens during drinks. But I'm saying, no, I think it feels like a life. As a citizen of the United States, I'm always surprised by where I live and how I live. Looking back on 2003, when George Bush was bombing the hell out of Iraq, and Joe Pru, who's in this anthology, Joe Pru shows us in his piece, an obituary, what that looked like on the ground. Like Joe actually was part of a, um, a peace group, um, I think led by, I think, Kathy Kelly from Chicago, who went to who went to Iraq, were in Baghdad before the bombing and took pictures of people and put those pictures all over cities in America so we could see who was getting hurt. Um, it's, it's clear from the destruction of the World Trade Center, it's clear that the, the destruction of the World Trade Center handed George an opportunity. I hop again. Cindy Sheehan's 25-year-old son, U.S. Army Specialist Casey Sheehan, was killed in action in Iraq, and so she met several months later with other military families and Bush, who then pretty much kept bombing and destroying Iraq in the name of freedom. So Cindy Sheehan wanted to talk to him again. She sat at the end of George Bush's street in Crawford, Texas, and waited. They called it Camp Casey. You guys probably remember this. 1,500 people joined her, 
Sheehan said, if he even starts to say freedom and democracy, I'm going to say bullshit. You tell me the truth. You tell me that my son died for oil. You tell me that my son died to make your friends rich. You tell me that. You don't tell me that my son died for freedom and democracy. She also vowed not to pay her federal income tax for 2004. I mentioned Cindy Sheehan because I recall a conservative commentator calling her that pathetic woman. Her sitting there, her famous act, meant that as a woman, Cindy Sheehan was taking more space than she deserved. <coughs> Excuse me. And that aspect of pathetic is what I am truly interested in here. The act of taking a little less or a little more. It's the essence of a political meaning. A pathetic man is chatty, effusive, sort of gayish in the high school sense of the word. But what does gay mean other than non-conforming? The space he is taking is a woman's. You can't take the wrong space, a woman's space, and be masculine. And I might stop right there. I think, um, yeah, I don't think there's any, like, nothing, and everything else is a little snippet. You should get, you should get this book, though. Look at this. Um, where is it? Can I? I'm very stupid. That's upside down. Here it is. Pathetic Literature. And the cover is by the artist Nicole Eisenman, who's awesome. Um, all your friends are in this book, so please get it. But most of all, today we are here to benefit um, Woodland Pattern, who I love. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. Hi, I'm Tom Cole, and this is a selection from my play, uh, The Tyranny of Structurelessness. Three, light change. I read this essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness by Joe Freeman about how when feminist consciousness raising groups tried a non-hierarchical approach to organizing, an unspoken tyranny arose that, that was much worse than if they had just had some structure. Two quotes from the essay. Contrary to what we would like to believe, there is no such thing as structureless groups. Two, people would try to use the structureless groups out of a blind belief that no other means could possibly be anything but oppressive. Light change. And as a child, I wanted to be a slave, to be tied up. I once handcuffed myself to a desk at school and said, Someone did this to me, and I, I wanted to be split up. Night has a hundred eyes, more like a million, I think. So a rough time spiraling out of control, back to shooting up meth and sex where men beat the shit out of me regularly, and I knew I had to get sober. Let's see, ecstasy, GHB, Special K, pot, Jack Daniels, Xanax, meth. I, I used to think I wasn't shooting up a lot, but then when I ran out, I'd go to the drawer and smoke the blood out of all the remaining needles, and there were a lot of needles. The first thing that happened was that someone organized an orgy in my apartment while I was coming in and out of consciousness, so I don't remember anything, but I was physically active during part of it, and someone attending the orgy brought luggage with him, turned out this luggage, all his belongings. So when the orgy was over, he was moved in. He told me he was from Iran, but then I met someone later who said, he's just a regular guy from Michigan. He carried a book in his bag, History of America, and I only ever saw him eat an avocado and M&Ms. The day he moved in, my birthday, nobody from my real life remembered, but he knew. And we sat on a bare mattress stained the orgy over. He took me in his arms and eating an M&M, his tooth fell out. Later, when I realized he was reaching the limit of squatters' rights, I told him if he wanted to stay with me, we both had to get sober. He pretended to love my dogs, like, don't kick me out. I can't live without your dogs. So I left out some drugs I knew he couldn't resist. And when he did them, I asked him to move, which was kind of a dick move on my part. But he wouldn't go, he wouldn't budge. He'd leave for orgies. He was also hooking. I don't know, but he left bags and bags of stuff multiplying. When asked to leave, he'd cry. 
And we all know a crying queen is a scheming queen. I still didn't know his name. And this part about the name seemed insane. Like that in this part of my life, I was dispatching with the triviality of names. He, he went to a sex party and while there I called, I'm getting in a car and bringing all your stuff. If you don't come meet me, I'm gonna leave your leather harnesses, webcams and lube on the street. We met at the Dunkin' Donuts on 8th Avenue and 24th Street. His home, away from home, Wi-Fi, bathroom to shoot up in. I showed him his stuff in the trunk, I gave him 200 bucks, and then paid the driver. He cried for the dogs, and then I never heard from him again. As soon as I was rid of him, I knew I loved him, wanted him back. We were meant to be together. God had brought us together. Suddenly it all switched and I was besotted, forlorn, wanted to switch places with him. Freaky Friday, leave my body, go into his, the pain of detox I'd experienced for him once and then again later for me, two detoxes. But in the end, I could only fix myself. Was sick a long time. Walking down 7th Avenue, Six months later, I ran into him, a pot belly, stumbling, carrying a folding table lamp for reading, limp, drooped over, a dying plant, and around the bottom of it, a brown plastic bag, yellow ties leaked off like liquid. He didn't recognize me. For completism, I wanted to walk up to him and ask him his name. I saw him take a picture of the sunset with a flash. And I remember the orgy where I wasn't the star, even though it was in my apartment. Just give him too much so he'll pass out in the corner. I imagine he lives somewhere in the Southwest where the crystal meth is cheap and the living's easy. A, a ranch, but he has internet. One of those video chat rooms where people shoot up in unison. A quantum physics event all over the world. Or he's probably dead. And these next two lines are crossed out, but I'm gonna read them anyway. I wonder if when people kill themselves, they don't leave as quickly. They circle around a bit. It's funny when you feel as if you don't want anything more in your life except to sleep or else to lie without moving. That's when you can hear time sliding past you like water running. Thank you. My name is Sparrow and I am pathetic. I'm going to read some poems and then I'm going to sing a song. This first poem is called My Tricycle. My Tricycle was red like most tricycles. This is a poem called Infrastructure. This poem is self-explanatory. This is a poem called, Ironically, it is quite difficult to spell dyslexia. This is a poem called, Zen Statement. This is a true story, Zen Statement. I received a royalty statement from my publisher Total 0, 0.00. This is called The Syncopated Rhythms of Minimalism. Even a seven word poem can be syncopated. This is a poem called Tuesday. I wrote you an email but it fell into your spam folder. So we didn't eat falafels. This is a poem called Advice to Poets. One, use few words. Two, end abruptly. This is a poem called Strange Fact. The accordion is the only kosher instrument. 
This is a poem called Wallace Stevens Revealed. Wallace Stevens' poems are full of lies. This is a poem called In Jakarta. It's dated 11 9 12. In Jakarta. I use 12 magazines as a pillow. This is a poem called Manifesto. People who hate poetry love my poems. And this is a song I wrote today. It's called Whispering Lawyer. My lawyer always whispers, I don't know why. You feel like she's telling you secrets on the sly. Whispering lawyer, whispering lawyer. I've got a whispering lawyer. She whispers during dinner. She whispers during lunch. She likes to use phrases like, I've got a hunch. Whispering lawyer, whispering lawyer. I've got a whispering lawyer. Whispering Lawyer. Thank you. <laughs>
The nipples of my breasts are sun-brown cockle burrs. Long forgotten Indian tribes fight battles on my chest, unaware of the sunken ships rotting in my stomach. My legs are charred remains of burnt cypress trees. My feet are covered with moss from bayous flowing across my floor. I can't go out anymore. I shall sit on my ceiling. Would you wear my eyes? Yesterday I Was by Alma Birch. Counting caterpillars with pun, we were reciting lines, boys don't cry. Are you a boy or a girl? Do caterpillars ever get asked such questions? Pun was interested in death and burial in New Orleans. I tried to explain it to her. Language can be so futile. The barrier of knowing and not knowing. Don't all butterflies look the same, yet male monarchs have spots? Do butterflies have second-line funerals? A parade of butterflies carrying their ancestors' spirit home as they travel from south to north. I wrote Eileen today. They are in Greece. I asked them if they have been to Lafcadia. I wondered if there is a marker on the spot that Sappho jumped from. I am sure you've heard about Steve Cannon by now. Thank you. This is Ray Armentrout reading for the Pathetic Literature Anthology, edited by Eileen Miles. This first poem I'm going to read was in the anthology. Intercepts. In the dark, it wired itself for light. Numb, it wired itself for touch and waited. Did it wait? Could it sense time pass? Only when her limbs moved did she become aware of the surrounding medium. But when did these become her limbs? Self-interested and intertwined like daughter with oak, daughter known as witch's hair, how is this her awareness? So that each was now infuriated by any interaction with the other that altered his or her trajectory, producing a pause or swerve. Was one term better than another? And when she tried handing him a sheet of white paper because he was standing near the recycle bin, he flinched. This next one is called Pinocchio. Pinocchio, strand, string, in this dream, the paths cross and cross again. They are spelling a real boy out of repetition. Each one is the one real boy. Each knows he must be wrong about this, but he can't feel how the fish and the fisherman, the pilot, the princess, the fireman, and the ones on fire. Notice. The way a gesture used to ward off trouble became cheerful waving. There was so much looming and vanishing to take note of always. We felt like play actors before we knew what we were about and after. Turns out the mummy's curse is real. You pump thick death out of the ground and burn it. It kills you. But in all the movies, curses are a cheap plot trick. The doofus who can't read the hieroglyph dies first, and no one misses him, them. We were born yesterday. We're sorry. 
And then here is a newer one called uh, The Picture. The woman on the sidewalk, not old but bent, stiffly forward, eyes down, holding two plastic bags up to her butt and waggling them while shuffling forward, is making herself a riddle for the drivers to solve, though most won't look. Do you want me to draw you a picture? Hot water bottle clasped to stomach. The word, darling. Some bird scattering low over brown reeds and stray channels in mind now and now again. Oh, 
Hi, Woodland Pattern and all the readers and writers out there. My name is Carol Pagel, and I'm a co-founder and an editor at Rescue Press, which is a small press that publishes about two to five books in all genres every year. Um, we're a Midwestern press. We're located in Chicago, Cleveland, and Iowa City. But actually, we were born just down the street from Woodland Pattern, about a half mile away. and in part were inspired to start the press because of the living um, rangy history of small press publications that are always on view on your bookshelves. Um, so thank you and we owe you a debt and we're happy to help support you annually. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems and then you'll hear from other Rescue Press authors and editors. Danny Kalachi, who's an editor, uh, Phil Sorensen, Mark Ray, and Adrian Rafel in some order. So here's a couple of poems from my new book. It's called Free Clean Fill Dirt, and it was just published a couple of months ago um, at the University of Akron Press. I'm going to read a couple of small pieces, and this is from a longer sequence that goes throughout the book, and they're called Ordinary Strata Poems. And this first one is called Ordinary Strata Lake Superior. Glaciers pressed the sandstone cliffs. They made all this. How the grand lake mouths the land. The lake spells no thing. A child will be earth before their diapers are. What did that man close the window about? A thousand plastic cars adrift. Ordinary Strata, Cleveland. How to signal distress. An 18th floor elevator opens to a waterfall. A village exists to defend where you panic. Cops under federal investigation. Two fresh and meaty king babies. The toast invented as a test for poison. A responsibility, clean water. Ordinary Strata, Lake Erie. In every living thing is stuff that now is lead. Plastics, opioids, pesticides, estrogen. News of a stabbing in the parking lot. Unconformity or trauma in the same line. Lives are made of a few things, retold. Dream of the taco boat. 52% of men think birth control doesn't benefit them. Ordinary Strata, Lamberton Road. Mushroom prints on the internet, ad for Congress in the party lawn, waking up early like you said you would, burnt sweet potatoes smell, new homebrew discussing its man again, guilt for ignoring the summons stews, Winter insist insisting woof woof come too. Thanks. Our dark academia. In my ears, the girls are just learning their witches, blowing out candles with their minds, fluttering lights, making cakey makeup melt off the jealous ones to moon-fed fleshy faces, pockmarked constellations. Our quartet, Brooke, Vivian, Louise, 
Sylvia, our dark academia, Artemis aesthetic, perfect skin. They're getting bitchier. They lean into it, burn the pillowcases with lacy cigarette butts. And when the prefect, this is British boarding fantasy, rotting vines, menstrual blood, challenges at lights out. They point as one to a sneak smoke by the matron doing laundry on a Sunday, which is the Lord's work. They all, of course, share a secret, which the rest of us would die to know, and so I sacrifice myself. Today, waiting, hands chapped, stomped feet at the reflecting pool, me tiptoeing to stare at their eyes in the water. I can hear them, but they can't me. I'm not real to them in the way that they're too real, in the way they step back and it's not a reflecting pool, but a deer. Round bloke eye rolling crazily out of its socket in the way of everything, but don't touch it. All of them long dead in that first pandemic winter. So I make them live it again and again, and I put on their blazers and smooth my face into theirs. This past will overtake us because it already is. Felix by proxy. We'd arranged to meet under the High Line, outside the Whitney. I was running down from this photo shoot in Chelsea, so I had my clothes stuffed into a hiking backpack, and I was naked, except for stilettos. Felix was coming from choir practice. He was tall, very thin, ginger nut hair, a two-vest situation, naked below the knees. Hi, I said, glistening from the running. You must be Jay's friend, shall we fuck? The ginger nut didn't say anything, eyes white. I stuck out my hand. He looked at my updo. Hi, he said, I'm in three choirs. Did Jay tell you? One's way in Harlem. That's the one I like best. The other two down here, one at this church in Tribeca. The other one sort of midtown. He had this soft, moony Irish brogue. Two women in actual pillbox hats, tweed suits wheezed past me on their way into the museum. A bus divulged tourists. Another wave of day campers, day glow t-shirts. Wonderful, I said, shall we fuck on the High Line? He looked at the Hudson River. I'm 17. Fuck, I sighed. Okay, I shifted my backpack. The straps were cutting into me. I walked Felix to the one train. We parted, he to Harlem for a rehearsal, I to my phone. At that point, Mar was just breaking up with Roman, the condom king. Could I have him? What happened with Jay's guy? Mar wrote back. Nope. I'm naked below 18th Street, I texted Roman, but he must have been underground. It didn't send, the line going from blue to green to red. Hi, I'm Mark Ray. Thanks to Woodland Pattern and Rescue Press for the opportunity to take part in the Poetry Marathon. I'm going to read a few poems uh, from my book, Gravity Well. The Size of Me. I was the size of a flower, many different sizes. The time of year factored, rainfall, cloud cover, I was one size when a bee entered. When a bee entered, I held a narrative in a moment. Moment, a link in a chain, chain dropped in a bucket of chains. At links touching many links. There was sunshine and a history of protein chains. To evolve was the general purpose. But to let sunlight grow me in soil was the purpose. Pollen attaches to a fuzzy body drawn to nectar. To retell the narrative changes the narrative is the story. To the advantage of tiny hook-like appendages, 
I have no smooth surface. Nightstand. Ground divorces from ground and red from the heart beneath the press that screws with love the apple toward cider. Fragments are left of spectrum when chlorophyll abandons the leaves. Old yellowing story. Selling dismisses picking. A classic of skyrocketed afternoon becomes lewd, interpreted. Her favorite song from childhood dragged through bong water by black light. Midnight, you held me once through the lace veil interrupted by actual touch. What made a recipe for vinegar of if, then, therefore, in, or negative in, some, or its homonym? Both cuffs are open beside the water. Ingratitude. I'm itchy now I disturbed a stillness. The stillness had been at once at a level and accumulating. A self-construction of unused pieces of time and subtle matter. Beneath it all was your book. Though the stillness had become a rain made of void and did hang of itself independently in the void, though the stillness was alone and entire, I had another desire to reread your book. I have become itchy, the result of the self defense of stillness, but I have now what I wanted then. I am not sorry. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, thanks so much to Woodland Pattern. Rescue Press wouldn't be what it is without this bookstore. Please continue to support them. Their support for poetry and for art matters. Uh, I'm just going to read one poem. Thanks again for joining us. The imminent decline of everything we've understood to be what governs our privileged daily lives. I don't think you will leave me for the neighbor because I actually think you will leave me for him. I think you will leave me for the neighbor because I would leave me for him. I am hard to live with and this pandemic has a medic made me in sudden need of. I sit around the house, it's bones a nest for me to wrestle in and complain about my skin and back and order unrequired items from the internet to conscribe my vanity toward the benefit of crisis. So when the neighbor stops by for a socially distant cocktail, his recent separation porched in his flowering eyes, his daughter's birthday parade recorded and available to view from the safety of our living room, like the television binges we return to at night instead of finally reading the news when he arrives and sits on our poorly tamed retaining wall. I see the dirt in his fingernails and his unset hair and watch you smile at his ability to weather it. His wife gone in a fit, his job cut like a bad student film. And yet, even in this dispassionate arena of unoriginal programming, he is here in our yard, offering us his extra toilet paper. This kindness is best described by your look later as the two of you text about joining a CSA. In a teleconference paid for by our employer's generous medical coverage, my therapist says that it would do me well to sell off my discomfort and confront my crashes in advance. 
the Wi-Fi cuts out, but for a moment it looks like she is putting on lip gloss so that we have something to get dressed for. You below me in the kitchen aren't thinking of the neighbor, or if you are, you are good at not making it the whale in our shared living space. But I am thinking of the neighbor. His red mailbox, his blue Jetta, his youthful catastrophic year in the infinite time he has ahead of him to make like it never happened. We feel terrible that the matzah we gave him wasn't approved to be used at the sacramental meal. It said so on the box, but he wasn't bothered. Don't you see why we should leave me? Thanks everyone. Thanks again, Woodland Pattern. Hello, I'm Philip Sorensen, and I'm going to read from my 2012 Rescue Press book of Embodies. Summer. Damnation of memory like royal portraiture or the beaked time travelers recovered from Montana. There's a shovel somewhere under the lilies we used for plugging burrows, but we'll need to wait until winter lingers about unbroadcast under the illusion of a daily solar victory against night, which, like the cold, never was an autumn cavalry, just restraint. Your animal-headed grandmother arrived, even she was standing in the garden digging, and the worm you found inside your underwear drawer and the other witches we invented too. Wind caught by the stresses of oratory, the branches sing with their nets and pits. We've been asleep for days on our chairs. The moon is as thin as an arm that's just been cut from a cast. Stubbornly, Crete weave as if eaten. We found snails crawling on the screen, a persistent ache covered in pulp. Expectation is asleep in the abyss, so we work with minor authorities. The taxing responsibilities of pay stub and sex, the occasional shell cracked open, or the door to the crawl space with flashlight and hammer, but nothing comes out of the holes under the walnut tree. One might find frogs or a waxy nude, an imitation inside our own bodies buried. Elegabalium 1. Blood comes from pipes. Bees sting cows, where corpulence built a honeycomb, a grim and gigantic woman, blamed for slaughter, was destroyed, and with each replacement a renewed disintegration as if the sun could lose its grotesque face. It was just a pile of stones or a tree's trunk and bird's eggs. I put fingers into strangers' mouths and stuck vocabulary onto non-vocabulary. Now she's legs and fingers, so why not try? These shoulders that keep the city aright in the sheep pen, changed, terrified, null, his mother sighed like a desert light in an old Polaroid. His body, the bridle in your hand, no organs, no black art, crawls across its sad infancy, cut me into certainty into a thousand machines. Oh, various, she says, youthfulness pooling like skin over bone and clouds in sky. Her fingers find everything, she sighs, and then sometimes interrupts a delirious whistle, lonely in his closet full of white leather shoes. Seagull, seagull, seagull. Interpolation. Trunks and shoes and tires and broken monitors and turquoise leaking from broken skin in flowing as in more geography than arrow, the disappearance we assume, which is fiction, or phrases, or error, is your body, and the terrible heartache you barely remember, which of course is to say, taught a logical. What does it allow us except to know that progress is just an aura, an excrement from things, and their passage we mistake for gesture, and so illusion and history, like a weird ghost, at your dinner party, after the guests have piled their coats in your bed, and you find a long blonde hair growing from your forearm, 
How could it have grown so long without your noticing? And yet, here it is, almost five inches and nearly transparent. And you pluck it and drop it into the toilet and flush. And now it's alone. And the ghost appears at the table and points and points. And there is no choice. You have no choice. It is the knife inside the knife, the belly inside the belly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susie F. Garcia, and I just want to say how proud Noemi is to be working in partnership with Woodland Pattern. We're big fans, and we can't wait to see this all put together. Thank you so much for including us in the 2023 Poetry Marathon. The dream was transmitted to me as an essay I could not read. Legibility is not my area of expertise. Having eaten all that I wanted, I lay my head in proximity to your areola. The intimacy I'm trying to name, which was once manifest in my composition notebook. The radius of an arena, station unkempt by the governor's annual pension. When you face the court, the dogwoods curtsy. Etiquette or ritual? I flip the coin, sliding it up my sleeve for a later retrieval. Once again, this hum keeps us company. The rhythm of unused shuttle cars late at night. I could not set the table. I was so full. Hospitable behavior. The touch of a eunuch's disdain reaches me across the court. I felt it register, then implode my third perineum. Readjusting my maladaptive tendencies isn't much of a bother these days. I wake up at sunrise. I manage my time. I nap often inefficiently. Sometimes the astute sense is so overbearing it's almost hysterical. The linen notes of pockets sewn under garments, the profundity of bunched up hems. At the departure gate, they were told to roll up their sleeves so as to avoid transporting incidental species. Upon arrival, they were told to remove their gold anklets. Do you remember how it ends? When the rain stops, I hold my breath. One, two, five. Counting is a tactic, not a sound. I peer through. The purple tannins curl against the curve of my tongue. How my disconnected mouth behaves, detached yet syntactic. Would I have preferred to love you wholly or purely? I returned every night. I filled my pockets with stone. I don't believe in admitting any more lies. A piece of poetry my father tells me feeds only the dreamer. So I'll eat the moon. Very little is shattered. The sound of waves during fixed hours. I wandered into the maze in search of its core. The core of a maze. Glassy. Fixtures in place. An awning pours only under the light. Night and day, we hang up our spurs. A failsafe. Take a gander. I took several moments for myself. In the mid-yawn morning, we held on with desperate limbs.
intimate space. After it's over, I hope we enjoy ourselves and others. Hi, my name is Sarah Jemski, and I am the executive director of Noemi Press. I'm thrilled to be here today supporting Woodland Patterns annual fundraiser. The first poem I'm going to read is called Sermon. Poets are gods, or godlike liars, or liars like God, and me and my poems platonically drink from the same flask as God, but only sometimes. I almost transgress. I'm all tongues can't commit to sinner or saint, which makes me a sinner. If I'm not holy, I'll play at taking up my father's mantle accidentally, preaching from a pulpit anointed in shame, consecrated in concern. I am named Sarah, not for the woman, but for her post-doubt devotion. I am a devotional unto myself, Finally sacrificing silence for righteous anger. Read this as table flipping. All of the money changers coins raining onto stones at my feet. All hail the princess of reverent blasphemy. Refusal to submit is my crown of thorns. I'm sorry, not sorry, to defile this sanctuary with my unclean methods and symbology, but I'm no false prophet, no angel of light masquerade here to bring about an end-time fantasy. I am a terrible atheist, but I am a great god. I get my nourishment where I can, feed the 5,000 with scrap metal melted down from crosses and altars and all the other idols you built in place of poetry, in place of me. I am the author of my own salvation. See me move the mountains. See me edit myself into holy books and proofread the world until you see that it is still bad. I am a god because this is how I keep myself. Give me formless and void, not all this wreckage to recreate. This next one's called Better Than I Deserve, um, and it's about Dave Ramsey, this um, sort of heinous radio personality. Money Church on the radio says God loves landlords, says the love of money is the root of all evil, not the money itself. Unless you love a dollar more than an investment property, you're holy. You've got clean hands. The borrower is slave to the lender, which is to say what about a tenant? Collar asks Money Pastor Dave how to get out of debt. He says, rice and beans, sell your Honda. Cut to commercial, we hear Dave in a Lambo. Vroom vroom, he's a car guy. Collar has $100,000 in student loan debt. Makes minimum wage. Get a better job, get another job. Your kids won't remember the time they lost. Buy my book, but you can have it for free. Collar lives on disability payments. Don't step foot inside a restaurant unless you're working there. It's God's will for you to prosper, like Dave prospers. He doesn't love money, because he has it. Caller always asks, how are you doing, Dave? Dave always answers, better than I deserve. And this last one uh, is called Testify to Love, which was the name of a contemporary Christian music song back in the day. The sin I'm living in is sacred. I've tried so hard to love sharpness enough to make pain tender, to pray the scarcity of rain makes the storm a blessing. A flood is not a river. Pleading cannot make it so. I know gentleness now. I watch you fill a jar with water 
and part the branches so each plant can drink. A soft flick of your wrist to shoo the cat away, a small sigh while pruning dead leaves. This moment, are we so far from heaven? Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Kaminsky, and I'm reading poems today for Noemi Press. I'm going to start off with a poem from my most recent book, Gentlewomen, and then I'll read two new ones. Instruction, how to hold the world. To encompass and hold and make calm. To allow and pass and all to pass through boundaries. The porous body of we and I and they and so. To contain, to let wander, to give and give and. To filter through flesh, through soil, through layers of lung and bedrock. To siphon off downstream, off diesel tank, off currency flow. To misplace capital. To change and let change. Tissue yielding to branch, bone to blossom, each cavern a hive, a swarming into body, into sound, into dark thump. To fortify, to merit want in waiting, to carry one heart and another and another, hidden from the world through multiple exposures, layered film frame on body, on open field, on landfill to give yourself until there is nothing left, to be broken into so many pieces, the only option to piece something new, to open to dust. There is nothing and everything and perhaps no you anymore. And these last two are from a new project. Um, they're both forthcoming in the new poetry issue of the Texas Review. One day I will go to the mountains and open the door in the sky, which is also the door in the mountain, the door in the bedroom, which is to say the door in my heart. I open it, see myself standing there. I say to myself, what have you been waiting for? I have been all these years nurturing forests and underbrush, columbines and pine, just waiting to envelop in all this green. And I in the gray waiting of hours, calling into hallways, mistaking echo for return. Such kinship I find now in myself, in this answering of spirit to leaf, to flaming flower an invocation that came before, but could not see. In this stillness, the sleeping cat on my chest, this lone sparrow song. Summons. I hold each life tender in hands and dreaming for radish sprouts, abundant sun to coax young stems into solidity. Strong legs hold leaf rosettes, translate light into growth, swell tap roots pink. I sing these prayers each morning, each afternoon, each night to chase specters lingering down institutional corridors to drive away the clawing in my gut. To sing is to summon, to dream a new world. Burying one's teeth, celebratory to say, you, yes, you. This one and this until all together a garden, a party bursting forth, vegetable, flower, sunlight, singing soil, singing iron rich, chlorophyll bound together. Thank you.
Thank you all for listening. Um, I am going to read two pieces from my book, um, Nature Fault but Never Apprehended on the Living Press. Thanks again for listening. This first piece is titled, Nights You Go Trembling. There are nights you go trembling in this condition, cracked and pried open like a holiday crab. Hoof marks of your great grandfather's carabao, visions below ground, Mulungai branches, ember. Your ripped up letters morphed moths. White tackle of gamlina wood Summon grief from sub caldera, endangered indigenous pine, Nara, Ankle, Supa, Almon, Yakal, Varaka elliptica. Children came into this world angry, leapt from shaggy rooftops, apprehended without documentation. It took years to get their names back, to have them spelled, praise aloud, spatter of lovely surnames, of sisters from the same barrio, from unwanted touch, past dilapidated halls and fields. Worship fueled by condemnation, no reparations made by empire or industry, incognito, playing out. In dream maps full of X's, sting at the script, simply that's the way things are. And the last um, piece I'll be reading is Escape from Monkey House. We transform ourselves into transparent mediums. Fluid synthesis from and within Anthropocene. We hold these dewy writing instruments close to our heart spaces, honor our tools as mechanisms of re-narration. Beyond domination, we hear pedagogies within the utterance of florals. Evergreens pronounce as trumpet sound, generative bird play in the center of madrones. As cultural poetics, as much as an affirmative will, bronze bodies arranged like rounded crowns rise with flaring buckeyes and horse chestnuts. Inside amber, an eagle owl shapes shifts into a square face mountain wolf. Mahogany legs, half chewed in battle by another wolf. Fold knees and ankles on unamended soil such as these terrestrial erotics become demonstration of our intimacy, of interdependence. Thank you so much for listening. And my name is Angela Pinaradondo, if I didn't say, say that earlier. And it's um, an honor to share my work with you and be a part of this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandra Simons, and I'm going to read my poem, I Gave Birth in Another Era, from my book, um, Triptychs, from Wave Books. Woke to the mean error of birds squawking inside the scorched gray-black polyphony of what happens when we lose the terminology to determine how bad things really are. Was there no way to puncture the agonizing film keeping us all corralled here? 
I looked through the window, bewildering axiom, condition, assumption. I looked at the dwarf orange tree, fruiting sour fruit incessantly. Suppose it is possible to be in three states of error at once and in each place to think three things, and in each thing to feel a different version of the salted wind as you are walking along the high sea cliff. Take, for example, apricots that have been genetically bred to amplify the length of time their fragrance stays in the crisp air of the cadaverous supermarket, just long enough to place them in your cart and think to yourself, the world is good. You may be very lonely at this point. The clerk scans the apricots and asks you a few questions to which the answers are always no. When will it be over? Asked the griever, who is a very small child in the room we have painted a Amalfi blue, but have not yet filled with sea-themed decor. How much of a garden's design is made more pleasing through negative space? Across from the entry for grief is grenade, which derives from the old French word for pomegranate. Why do I write poetry? Because I don't know what it means to live anymore other than these shapes left behind. Why do I write poetry? Because I want to drown.